Chair Mullen uh, and members of the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, I'm John Brumstead, CEO of the UVM Health Network. Uh, you probably know that because I've been here a couple of times before. Um, I do want to uh, start by thanking you for the opportunity to present our uh, 2022 budget. Uh, tough to imagine that it's a 2022 budget, uh, but it is. And I also want to take the opportunity to thank the staff, both at the Green Mountain Care Board uh, and our staff, for take, taking the time to respectfully have uh, back and forth up to this point to question each other, to begin to come to a mutual understanding of what's a very complex budget uh, produced during and covering a very, very complex time in our history. And our aim through the presentation uh, this morning and likely answering questions late this morning and this afternoon is to provide any further clarity that uh, you on the Green Mountain Care Board need to facilitate your uh, decisions. We'll take the next slide, Jim. So uh, here's the team that's available today. Uh, those folks have uh, sworn in. I will take a second to brag on the team because it's a spectacular team that uh, has helped guide the path through some incredibly difficult and tumultuous times to make sure that Vermonters and folks in northern New York uh, continue to get the services they need. Um, all of us on the team are well known uh, to the board, maybe with a couple of exceptions on the finance team, which has uh, had a makeover over the past year. Uh, Rick Vincent, um, uh, does have a track record, but has uh, moved up to being CFO of the entire network uh, after years of uh, uh, training uh, in our network. Judy Peakley has joined us over the past year and is the CFO of the Medical Center in Burlington. Kim Patnode at Center Vermont and Scott Como, uh, some of you may know Scott, uh, at uh, Porter Medical Center. I would like to call out that we do, I believe, have some of our um, trustees from around the network that are listening in today, and I want to thank them for their time. I believe we have Maureen McLaughlin, John Dwyer, Tom Little, many of you may know Tom, Ann Collins, uh, Pat Dunhauer, Ali Stickney, who actually is the incoming board in uh, January, will be the board chair of the UVM Health Network, uh, and Ali Richards. So next slide. Um, what we intend to, to cover today, uh, I'll run through this quickly and at a high level. Uh, our mission, uh, vision, and major initiatives that support that vision uh, and um, that our mission and vision have not changed. Um, quickly, who we are uh, and where we are in our uh, integration as an integrated health system ser serving the region. And I'll take those uh, two pieces over the next 15 uh, plus minutes. Um, uh, then um, uh, how we've weathered the challenges of 20 and 21, and they have been many, many of those. I'll ask Al to speak about those. Our continued uh, plan and march towards financial recovery and how we perform against uh, external benchmarks. Um, you know that I and our team always seek uh, external validation uh, to uh, uh, keep us on the straight and narrow, um, and we believe that uh, that's important in this context as well. We'll go through some of those. How our net patient revenue growth uh, compares to our population growth. Uh, in other words, how net patient revenue growth is a function of both expense growth, what we call expense inflation, and population growth. Both of those factor in. And particularly because of the population growth piece, we must be measured and judged and evaluated on a per capita basis. To do otherwise will continue the um, uh, potential and actually the likelihood for significant untoward consequences. Uh, we'll take the opportunities uh, through each of our presidents uh, to uh, talk about the challenges uh, at our Vermont affiliate organizations, and we'll summarize the budget. And again, the uh, uh, bottom five bullets will be covered by Al Gobey, who's our chief operating officer, chief financial officer, uh, Rick Vincent, uh, and uh, our presidents. And again, our CFOs at the entities will be available to uh, answer uh, questions. <laughs> Next slide, Jim, please. 
So um, uh, UVM Health Network, um, our entire reason for being uh, is to assure access to high quality healthcare services for our region, uh, Vermont and uh, six counties of Northern New York. And uh, we're here not just for today, but for the long term. So we have to be sustainable and we have to provide those services at reasonable uh, affordable costs. And obviously that uh, reason for existence rolls off the tongue, uh, you know, and we live every day how incredibly difficult uh, it is to realize that. Next slide, please. Every year uh, I present uh, our mission and our vision. Uh, these have been durable over time. They have not changed. And we're a mission driven organization from the top down. And this can be seen in the persistence the drive, the innovation that's been on display over the past months in meeting our mission as we've had obstacle after obstacle thrown uh, in our path. And I believe being mission driven is the necessary ingredient to being resilient. And if there's one word that characterizes our workforce, our organization over the past two years, uh, it's resilient. And so working together, uh, we improve people's lives. Always a very collaborative, respectful uh, model. Next slide. So who are we? Uh, the map hasn't uh, changed, uh, same geography. There are some uh, uh, updates uh, here. Um, relative to other organizations in our region, uh, I know, we know that it's really difficult for folks outside of the organization, uh, outside of our system, to get their heads wrapped around our scale. And it's really difficult to translate that scale then to the accountability that comes with that scale. And that accountability for delivering services uh, and the health of the region is borne by every single person in the organization, not just the leadership. So a couple of examples of that scale, if you go from Center Vermont Medical Center to the uh, east uh, and you drive to Malone, New York, Ellisite Medical Center to the northwest, on a day like today, nice dry roads uh, uh, poking along, you make it in uh, a little over three hours and there's a ferry ride in the middle. And when you do that drive, there's huge expanses of rural real estate, and that um, uh, impacts everything that we do, our decision-making, how we deliver care, uh, and what's expected of us, and we know that. A few of the factoids uh, that are here were the, uh, the same constellation of uh, providers. Um, uh, some of the statistics uh, in 2019, which was the last semi-normal year, uh, if there is such a thing, we had more than 41,000 inpatient discharges and 1.3 million outpatient encounters. And not that many fewer if you jump up above that to 2020, which was a very bizarre year, uh, almost the same amount. Um, also, we contract or employ, mostly employ, uh, more than 1,400 physicians. And almost 300 of those are primary care physicians. So big scale, we uh, absolutely understand that. And particularly when you start talking uh, dollars and cents, uh, there's many zeros uh, after the numbers. It's because of our size. But again, that translates into us knowing the accountabilities that uh, come with uh, that scope and scale. So next slide, Jen. So progress uh, to date, um, we actually began our journey 10 years ago, October of 2011, with the formation of then Fletcher Allen Partners, now uh, uh, blissfully a much better name, the UVM Health Network. And we started that journey with two core strategies, just two, uh, becoming a tightly integrated delivery system to ma maintain access to high quality health services for the region and shifting to payment and delivery arrangements that reward high value care. We've made uh, significant progress along this journey, uh, but 
it's clearly uh, far from over. Um, through the presentation, you'll get a lot more detail uh, on uh, what's on this slide, and we're certainly open to questions on what we've accomplished uh, and where we're going. But I'll just tick through some high level thoughts here. Uh, on network integration, uh, we've lived through, uh, as have all of us, um, uh, we specifically have lived through an organizational stress test over the past two years. And if we had not been a highly integrated collective of healthcare organizations, I am absolutely certain that we would have lost one of those organizations uh, the way of uh, uh, Springfield or EJ Noble in Northern New York if they had been standalone organizations. So we have seen the fruits of that uh, integration through uh, times that we certainly don't want to repeat. Expense management, we're seeing the benefits of economies of scale and implementing uh, systems and platforms uh, across our network. And this uh, is not just in supply chain. You'll note that the administrative uh, expense from our shared service as a proportion uh, of our revenue has gone from 13.7% in the 2021 budget to 13.4% in the 2022 budget. And certainly Rick Vincent can deconstruct that for you if you'd like. And care management, uh, we're uh, pushing hard on our provider side to make our care management consistent, well-functioning and um, well-resourced. Uh, good provider side care management is a prerequisite to um, uh, high quality care. It's also a prerequisite to us taking financial risk. We will not repeat the foibles of the 1990s when providers took on financial risk and did not have all of the levers to pull on the care management side. That was disastrous. Uh, and so uh, we're working hard to make sure that our care management processes are strong. The EHR installation and integration epic, um, hard to believe, but we're uh, in the uh, within a year of completing that. Vermont entities will be totally done uh, with the implementation phase in November of this year, and our New York entities will be completed in April of 22. Value-based payments, uh, you all are well aware of the progress that we've made and continue to make in the uh, uh, all-payer model space. Um, our latest payer partnership uh, with MVP to launch a Medicare Advantage plan um, is very consistent with our core strategies. It's a step along the pathway of realizing uh, those strategies. And this plan is very complementary with the all-payer model and is in no way in conflict with the all-payer model. As providers, we're taking accountability for a population to provide cost-effective, uh, high-quality care. Access to care and workforce. These are both huge issues, huge issues that we're all grappling with. And unfortunately, there are no silver bullets. Everybody wants to say, if we just did this, you know, everything would be okay. Um, there's nothing that simple. There's lots of very complex factors to deal with and to address. Just one example, access to mental health services, which have been uh, difficult uh, since uh, Irene, probably before Irene, but definitely since Irene. Now, every single point on the care continuum for mental health services is stressed beyond the breaking point. It really is a crisis uh, in any way you define it. And we on the healthcare delivery system side can't and we won't run away from that problem. We're gonna run towards it. That and the other uh, crises around uh, workforce um, and the uh, impacts uh, of COVID and uh, pent up demand uh, on access um, uh, uh, in addition to the mental health uh, really are uh, difficult uh, to deal with. 
Um, we need to have that discussion together. We can't do it alone to address these issues. We have to have uh, our budgets uh, and the resources to address these issues. And we need uh, timely, I would say, as rapid as possible approval of the certificates of need that we've put forward to have the facilities to attract the workforce uh, and to uh, uh, meet the demands of our growing population. And academic integration, we've made great strides with the Larner College of Medicine, the UVM College of Nursing and Health Sciences, SUNY Plattsburgh, and other um, um, uh, higher education uh, organizations uh, to help us on the workforce front uh, and to provide uh, access to clinical material for their learners. Next slide. Leading healthcare delivery and payment transition. Um, the past two years, as I've said repeatedly, um, have presented real challenges to achieving our goals. Uh, Al is going to speak with some specificity to um, uh, what we faced. Those challenges have also showed us that we're on the right track uh, in our move towards value-based care and really has uh, stiffened our spine. It's created renewed resolve. Uh, to continue down the path to really uh, realize the benefits of that uh, transformation. We're continuing to lead the region in healthcare delivery uh, of high quality and affordable care. A few of the things are listed here uh, on how uh, we are doing that and how we propose to do that going into the future. Just to pick a couple uh, to dive a little bit deeper on. Uh, investing in our staff uh, and facilities so we can recruit, retain, and support a first-rate workforce. Uh, I said that that ties directly into our uh, certificates of need, also to our budgets. Uh, we've put in things like Workday, uh, which um, uh, provide a lot of support for uh, our employees to be able to access um, uh, issues that they may have. We've worked hard to make wages and benefits um, uh, appropriate. We now are, like many organizations, moving into the non-traditional. How do we provide flexibility for our workforce to work from home, to have non-traditional uh, work hours and work week weeks? And we're thinking out of the box, as others are, on how we can differentiate ourselves to recruit uh, and retain, and in many cases, train our own uh, healthcare providers of the, the future, and you'll hear more about that uh, in the coming months. Investing in better access to mental health services, I've already uh, pushed on that one quite a bit. This is one of those issues that we can't succumb to just nibbling around the edges. We need to dive in and we need to finally push on this so that we can start approaching with a straight face that we're providing parity to those that have mental health needs. And that means uh, uh, an inpatient site capacity on our Central Vermont campus. It means an emergency uh, department redo at the UBM Medical Center. And it means doubling and tripling down on the workforce needs. So in our communications of late, uh, we've had a consistent theme. I'm sure you've noticed it. Uh, that you uh, and the external world judge us based on well-established external benchmarks. And Rick's going to show some of our recommendations. They were in the presentation. You've probably already looked at them. There certainly have been discussions between our staff and the Green Mountain Care Board staff, <clears throat> excuse me, on these recommendations. But I just want to run through some high-level measures to start with because we need to be cog cognizant and reminded of where we are with healthcare delivery uh, uh, in uh, our state, because that is a good news starting point. It doesn't mean that there isn't a lot to do, as I've said throughout the past few minutes, but we need to remember where we're starting from. So next slide, Jim. So this comes from the Dartmouth Atlas, uh, and you all know that the Dartmouth Atlas is a time-tested source of truth for healthcare utilization and cost. And the header says it all. Vermont is the lowest cost state in the nation for the Medi uh, Medicare program on a per capita basis. The lowest, not the fifth, 
not the 10th, not the middle. We are the lowest cost state in the nation for Medicare. And look at the uh, legend there. We're almost $3,000 less than the national average on a per capita basis. So anything that we're doing is improving on best in class status. So there's lots for all of us to be proud of on this slide. I am no way I'm saying that the UVM Health Network is the direct cause uh, of this. We certainly are a participant, but so are those that work in state government and that regulate uh, health care. Next slide. A little bit closer to home, uh, our home counties in Vermont of Chittenden, Washington and Addison. Lowest cost counties within Vermont. Um, it's not a mistake uh, or just happenstance that uh, our three organizations in Vermont have come together. Uh, we have a very similar approach to delivering uh, health care that's highly efficient. We're the lowest cost counties within Vermont and Addison County is also among the lowest five counties in the entire country. And again, the legend uh, shows uh, in this uh, relative to the Vermont average uh, what the per capita, again, per capita um, uh, cost is uh, in each of those counties. And I will point out when I've shared this before, folks say, well, that's because there's a bunch of young college students diluting the, the needs uh, in at least Addison County and probably Chittenden County. These are age adjusted. So this is about as close to um, uh, apples, apples. That's why uh, the Dartmouth Atlas uh, is uh, the source of truth. So these are age adjusted. Next slide. Um, you might say, uh, I've heard this too, if you're such low cost, you're probably uh, not producing on the quality side. This is a um, complex slide, um, uh, so I apologize for that. But this is the Commonwealth Fund that puts out a state by state report card, scorecard. Uh, I think on an annual basis, they might skip a year or two here or there. This is the 2020 report card uh, using 2018 data. Um, and um, this shows that overall Vermont ranked sixth out of 50 states and the District of Columbia on their composite ranking. To dive a little deeper, uh, affordability and access, I uh, just characterized this as a huge uh, complex issue that we're all dealing with. Access here, if you look at the measures that underlie this, uh, this roll up, it, they're really talking about access to health insurance uh, and ability to afford uh, health care in that access and affordability. Um, and since we uh, have had health policy that uh, makes uh, the vast majority of Vermonters have some form of coverage, that's how we end up fourth. So this doesn't take into account what I've acknowledged is a huge access issue. And then the, the next five that have to do with quality are composites of 60 measures that uh, are bunched here and you can see our ranking. And again, um, this uh, takes a village. I'm not saying that the UVM Health Network uh, is the cause of this, but again, we're certainly a participant. Uh, and if we weren't hitting on all cylinders, uh, Vermont uh, wouldn't rank this highly. And I would say that uh, my recollection is that we've been in the very top tier of this ranking uh, every single time I've seen it. And a couple of years ago, we shared this report widely with uh, every Vermont uh, legislator and many in state government. Next slide. Network focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is the last uh, thing that I'm going to speak to uh, in the, the presentation phase. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the healthcare advocate uh, for asking questions specific to uh, our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And uh, I'd refer uh, you all, uh, the board members, to the answers that we've provided to these questions because it gives you a little bit, uh, a lot more uh, granularity on uh, the resources that uh, we're providing. Um, I would say that like many organizations, and in my view, particularly organizations in Northern New England, um, we're late to the DEI game. Uh, in many ways, embarrassingly so. Um, and since the murder of George Floyd, we uh, are experiencing an organizational awakening. Uh, 
and this is across all of our subsidiary organizations uh, across the UBM health network. Um, and we've chosen to not just talk about the deep issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but actually to begin taking substantive actions to make progress along this journey. It actually <laughs> starts, I'm going off my script here, um, our network board over a year ago, um, uh, looking around the room and saying, we've got gender diversity, but we need other forms of diversity. Um, actually expanded our board and brought on four members that have added great diversity of experience, uh, of thought, uh, of um, uh, lifelong lived experiences. So it started right at the top with our board taking substantive actions. Some of the examples of things that we've done at the management level, we've established an anonymous hotline for our employees to be able to call uh, into uh, if they uh, believe that they've been subject to discrimination or exclusion in any way. We've completed a DEI workforce assessment <laughs> done by a national vendor, and we've shared the results of that back to each organization from the board down to the line staff. And we've asked each of our organizations to create action plans based on those data uh, and those action plans, many of which are being uh, acted on today. We've designated a DEI leader at each of our subsidiary organizations, and they have led the effort to set up multiple employee resource groups. Every single one of our organizations has at least one of those, and most of our organizations have several, and those continue to evolve. All of this has been based on not just top down, hey, that sounds like a good thing to do, We've had listening sessions. Um, the Academic Medical Center and Dr. Leffler have been real leaders in this. Open listening sessions where our employees have a safe place to go to talk about these issues. And they've been a great source of learning for what we can do on the management side to actually have an impact uh, and not just pay lip service. We have a three phase network plan uh, that's informed by those listening tours and by a DEI advisory committee that I meet with personally every two weeks to float ideas. They bring ideas um, and before we implement anything, I test it through that group to make sure that what we're doing will be impactful uh, and will resonate. We've had leadership training in implicit bias uh, and also in anti-racism and how to be an anti-racist organization. And I will tell you that the personal journey through those learnings is tumultuous and that self-reflection is really tough and we don't have that knocked in any uh, sense of the word, but we're continuing to work on that. And we're also recruiting a chief diversity and inclusion officer. We're in the final phase of that with four finalists identified and I will tell you that it has been amazing the national interest that we've generated by that search. And I believe we will have a leader that will come in and help us not only in the UVM Health Network, but in our broader community as well. So in the face of all of these obstacles and all of the difficulties in healthcare delivery, why would we focus uh, on this and put so much energy and resource into it? It's because it's the right thing to do. Uh, at the end of the day for a caring and compassionate organization to focus on creating a place of belonging for everybody. But if you look a little bit deeper, um, you know, we tout ourselves as a population health focused delivery system. Um, we need to recognize the disparity in health outcomes that come with disadvantage and we need to measure along the path and we're just scratching the surface of how we measure and track our, our progress. And also there's a great business case for focusing on diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, study after study shows that organizations that have a diversity of inputs, particularly at the leadership, make better decisions, uh, do better in uh, recruiting and retaining high quality uh, workers and do better uh, in meeting their missions and financially. 
So again, I thank the uh, interest of the healthcare advocate for this. You'll be hearing a lot about this from our, uh, uh, our network, uh, and it's very much uh, at the top of uh, our priority lists uh, at this point. So I'm going to be uh, available for questions. As I said before, we officially got uh, started and I'll uh, help to um, uh, farm the questions around. But now we're going to go into the bulk of the uh, presentation. I'm going to turn it over to our chief operating officer, uh, 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 Al Gobey, uh, to get us started on that. So to you, Al. Thanks, John. Good morning and happy Wednesday to everybody. Uh, Chair Mullen, can you hear me loud and clear? I can. Thank, Thank you. you all. Yep. Next slide, please. We wanted to start the operational and financial uh, briefing today with a conversation about some of the challenges that we're facing. We've written in the last two narratives about the good work that folks at the UVM Health Network have done, uh, basically combating the pandemic. The update I wanna give you this morning though, is where we're at as of today, because in our, in our narrative, we talked about the aftershock of COVID, and we probably shouldn't, shouldn't have called it aftershock, because uh, we're still in the middle of it, um, and I want to be very clear on what I mean by that. We are seeing incredible patient volumes right now in our EDs, in our med surge units, and in our ICUs. But they are patients that delayed care or have higher acuity than normal. It is not due to the Delta variant. We certainly have COVID positive patients in house in our facilities, but the volumes that we're seeing are really about the healthcare that was delayed um, when you saw our revenues go down. So that is presenting itself as the mental health challenge that John discussed, and it is presenting itself as the med surge and ICU challenges and ED challenges we're facing every day. Just a couple of examples, and the presidents will elaborate on this. Our med surge units at CVMC have a census today that is higher than almost anyone could ever remember it being. Um, and, and that is literally due to delayed care. And our ED at UVMMC had one of the 10 hardest days yesterday uh, that anyone could remember in terms of the number of patients and the acuity of those patients. And so again, not COVID positive patients in totality, certainly a few, but the main issue here is delayed care. And again, the presidents can answer questions on this or comment on it, but I wanted the members and staff of the Green Mountain Care Board to know and understand just what we're dealing with right now, today, this morning. Um, I'll also touch on uh, a few of the things on this, on this slide. Um, we've talked uh, in our budget hearing last year and throughout the year about the impact that revenue has had. Later in the presentation, I'll show some slides that go through the volume impacts of the second COVID surge and where we think we're at as of today and how that works into our budget. I want to be clear that COVID is an accelerator. So anything that was happening um, and sometimes bad, it made happen faster. And so we've had to work really hard at controlling our expenses and managing our expenses. Anyone who's tried to buy anything understands that the supply chain is completely disrupted globally, not specifically to healthcare, but inclusive of healthcare. And so in the early days of the pandemic, the question was, do you have enough masks? We worked with the state, we worked with Dartmouth, We've secured enough PPE and we feel confident in our supply, but there are supply chain disruptions that cause us to work hard every day to make sure we have the equipment that we need and the supplies that we need. And we can talk about that in detail or have a future conversation if you'd like to, to hear more about that. Testing, for example, 
we've seen testing scale back. Now we're going to be scaling up testing as our vaccine mandate takes effect with our employees while other employees do the same and as the Delta variant uh, causes increased demand. And so what we thought was slowing is now growing uh, in response to the needs of Vermonters. Um, the last under COVID-19 that I'll talk about at this point in the presentation is vaccinations. Vermont is probably the best place in the world right now in terms of the population percentage that is vaccinated. We are incredibly proud of our teammates that work to help make this a reality by both giving out vaccinations, but also a willingness to be vaccinated. And we'll continue to lead on that. Um, John's been very clear that we will uh, mandate vaccines for our employees in both states, on both sides of the lake, or we will have regular testing. So I can't, uh, can't talk about challenges of the past uh, 12 months without talking about the cyber attack. And I'll get into that a little further in the presentation. If you take one thing away from this presentation today, it's the next bullet, um, other than, of course, approving our budget. Um, and that is staffing shortages. This is an incredibly serious nationwide problem that we are in the middle of. We are spending an incredible amount of money on travelers and locum tenants in order to staff our facilities. We are also partnering with organizations such as Birchwood to pay for travelers to staff skilled nursing facilities in order to get patient flow out of our med surge units because we have long term stay patients that we need to find a bed for outside of the hospital and the flow of patients in the system, not just mental health, but also skilled nursing facilities has been impacted by the pandemic and remains so. But staffing shortages is the key problem, in, in my opinion, that we face on all levels, central sterile, cafeteria, doctors, nurses, med techs, across the board. Last, Fannie Allen, and I see Steve uh, in the frame here. This has been a really hard thing for the UVM Health Network and the University of Vermont Medical Center in terms of the way we want to provide access to our patients. Both rehab and our surgical center have been impacted by the closure, and we're working hard to try to address that, both through planning uh, our, our outpatient surgical center and with things that we can do in-house to make the situation better. But that has been a significant challenge. Next slide. This, this slide takes my breath away and put together with the next slide uh, that shows the federal and state money that we received. Um, you know, it, it, I can't say it any simpler than we are grateful. We're, we're grateful to the state, we're grateful to the federal government because if it wasn't for the money that we received, uh, close to $197 million, the $300 million in revenue that we did not uh, earn in the two years, in the two fiscal years, would obviously have driven these margins much lower. The 3.4% that you see for UVMMC on the green line is completely due to this federal and state intervention and would be um, headed towards $30 million in loss if we did not receive those funds. And so uh, it's a good story of support. Um, without uh, margin for capital, we simply cannot remain modern. And that is important for everyone to realize. It has uh, sweeping implications across each of our facilities if we were to have lost uh, the amount of money we would have lost. But also, the $197 million from the federal government did not close the $300 million gap entirely. We did a, a lot of work on expense control um, and also capital spending to keep our day's cash where it is and to also help offset some of the margin losses. Next slide. This is the chart that I just mentioned. 
I'm not going to go into it in detail. We we offer it as an exhibit of what we did receive over FY20 and FY21. Next slide. I've touched on many of the, the points on this slide, and we've certainly talked about them in our narrative uh, this year and last year. You know, when I think about this slide, I think about our people. I think about our leaders, and I think about what they've done for other human beings. I, I, can't, I can't say again um, any better how proud I am uh, of our teammates. Next slide. So on October 28th, uh, we were uh, attacked and we were the victims of a crime. And uh, just looking at this brings back the memories of that day and the, the subsequent weeks. Um, we, we're grateful again to the state of Vermont for partnering with us with the National Guard, grateful to the FBI, um, and, and grateful to our, um, our IT folks who worked tirelessly to get us back uh, in business. I, we, sh we could talk for literally hours about the response uh, that we put into this when we had to basically rebuild our infrastructure um, and uh, get to every endpoint, which is every laptop, if you think about it that way, in the, net in the network, 5,000 of them, and basically re-image re them. We have taken uh, decisive action since. Um, when you think about the virtual private network that we were hacked through, that is a direct consequence, believe it or not, of the pandemic. As people no longer went to the office, they didn't go through our normal uh, access channels and used alternative access channels that were not as secure. And so the decisive steps we've taken are to protect our network from uh, any off-site access by employees. And so um, we feel the steps we've taken have been prudent and are protecting us today. But this is an arms race. You know, we, we worry about PPE, we worry about vaccines, we worry about med surge patients. These folks wake up every single day trying to think about how to hack um, us. And so we have people that, are, that think about that as well, and we are trying to stay one step ahead. But we are not alone in this, as, as has been seen over the, the, the last uh, year. Um, and this is a worldwide problem. Next slide. This is the structure that we, uh, that we use to secure our network. And so we have built a shared service, meaning each affiliate doesn't do this on their own. We work together under one leader, Doug Gentile, to uh, have the three pillars of uh, engineering operations and risk and awareness um, all work together, but also um, to have the tough conversations about where we need to invest large dollars and where we need to frankly change our business practices to remain secure. Next slide. So from here, I'm now going to turn it over to Rick, and he's going to talk about how benchmarks are guiding our return to solid financial footing. Rick. Thank you, Al, and uh, good morning, everyone. So as you uh, as you heard in Dr. Brunstead's opening, you know, a theme you, I think you'll hear throughout this uh, this presentation is how we're trying to use benchmarks to uh, highlight um, both where we need to be financially um, and how well we're doing um, at taking care of patients from a per capita basis and how uh, efficient that uh, we're, we're being with our internal resources. Again, all looking um, and all being guided by uh, external benchmarks. In this next section, um, I'm going to highlight how we use uh, benchmarks to guide uh, our path back to uh, solid uh, financial footing. So the key financial metrics that we look at, and we've had a discussion with um, 
the Green Mountain Care Board staff um, that I think the, the staff are also starting to look at these uh, these metrics, which is uh, which is great to to see because these really are the key uh, levers that um, that guide us in terms of making sure that uh, we're getting back uh, to solid financial footing. The key with these metrics is they really need to be looked at um, together in concert. Um, you can't focus um, on just one of these metrics because if you do, both for us internally or uh, for you as regulators, um, uh, there, there could be something that you're missing in the in the story there. So just to give you a, an example, um, if for example our long-term debt um, was uh, was you know quite high and our day's cash uh, on hand was quite high you know that should tell you that you know we uh, we're, we're too leveraged we have too much debt and we've essentially you know financed our our cash through uh, through borrowing versus uh, having a good balance between borrowing and also generating uh, cash through our uh, our operating uh, EBITDA uh, margin so that's really the key here. Um, I think uh, I think the the board and the staff know what these represent. Um, uh, the operating margin is what we generate from our core uh, operations. Uh, we need to generate an operating margin from our core operations. We can't rely on non-operating revenue to to support um, our needs. The operating EBITDA margin is uh, is a key metric. Um, so this is our operating margin, but highlights how much cash that we're generating from uh, from core operations. So it takes out the non-cash items um, related to depreciation, uh, interest, and uh, amortization. The last one on here, average age of plant, um, is a key, uh, also a key metric. It highlights are we keeping pace with um, the investments that we need to make both in terms of facilities uh, and equipment um, so that these um, these capital assets do not become uh, become obsolete. Next slide, Jim. So today we're here, um, obviously focusing on our 22 budget for the health network. Um, but it's just important to to point out that internally uh, we take a longer term view of our finances. Uh, we have uh, what we call our financial framework, uh, where we look out for uh, five years. Um, we update that uh, that framework every January based on um, the prior year's activities and what we know uh, will be happening uh, in the years ahead. Some of the ways that we this this really guides you know our um, our finances and guides our path back to um, a solid footing. Um, one of the very tangible ways that our framework is used is it actually um, sets the operating and uh, operating EBITDA margin targets for us for the year. So that the operating margins that you're seeing in our budget this year actually come directly from the framework. Um, it's the number that we need to hit on that uh, that path. Um, it projects our day's cash on hand, so we know um, where we are at compared to the target that we need to be at um, and how much money we'll have um, in that particular year to spend on uh, capital. Um, it also tells us as we look out if we have debt capacity that we can borrow money to help support uh, capital spending. Um, but when you put all of this together, you know what the framework does for us is it ensures that we're on a path to continue to uh, provide the access uh, to care that uh, those in our region in Vermont uh, Vermont need. It's it's our scorecard, if you will, to ensure that we're we're on that path to meeting uh, to meeting that need. Uh, next slide. So this again, back to the um, that we use. So we do have uh, uh, mark sources that um, uh, that we use for these key metrics. Uh, they're also the same um, side of the.
the chart here, um, you can see that the, the benchmarks for these metrics are slightly different across the three agencies. Um, so we look at that range in terms of setting our internal uh, targets. So the operating EBITDA margin, for example, S&P is at the lowest at 7.3, um, with Moody's being at the, at the higher end uh, at 9%. So we use those to guide our internal uh, targets. Um, our internal targets, as you can see on the right hand of the chart, um, actually has a higher expectation for the UVM Medical Center. Um, that's because um, academic medical centers that are part of a system um, have higher uh, financial uh, metrics than their non-academic uh, uh, affiliate of the system. Those benchmark ranges that you see there uh, for Fitch, Moody's, and S&P is the combination of the entire system. Um, so it includes the, the academic uh, medical centers that are part of those systems. A way to, to clearly see this is uh, down on the bottom of the chart there, we've included a, a double AMC uh, uh, benchmark for, uh, which is uh, the double AMC cough benchmark is all academic medical centers across the country. Um, they don't have the same level of financial metrics that, um, that the rating agencies do. They focus primarily on uh, expense related metrics, which you'll You'll see a couple of examples of that uh, when Dr. Leffler gets to his uh, presentation, but they do have a metric on operating margin. And you can see that the median for uh, for academic medical centers is 5% compared to the the one and a half to uh, to 2.8 that you see there for the for the rating agencies. So based on that, that uh, our internal targets do have uh, higher targets for the academic medical center. But when you look at the weighted average um, of our internal targets, you can see that they very clearly line up uh, with the benchmark ranges. So operating EBITDA margin, the target that we have in our framework is from seven and a half to nine percent. And you can see the S&P to, to Fitch range is from 7.3 to 9 percent. So they, they, they pretty much all uh, line up after you've done that, uh, that weighted average. Important to note that these ranges that we have in our framework, the lower end of those ranges um, puts us at risk for a downgrade. So that's not the place that we want to be. Uh, we need to be at the higher end of that range um, to ensure that we're financially uh, stable. And then the last piece that uh, I've highlighted here in yellow, um, because there is a deviation from our internal framework compared to what you see um, in the benchmark range um, has to do with our operating margin. So currently uh, we have a higher uh, um, target um, for operating margin than what you see in the, the S&P and Moody's and that is directly related to the fact that we haven't um, spent the, the amount that we should have been spending the last several years on capital which means when you look at our profit and loss statement, we have less depreciation on our profit and loss statement than what you would find in, in other organizations. So hopefully, um, assuming our budget um, gets approved and we start getting on a path that allows us to spend more capital, that internal target uh, will go down over time as more and more depreciation expense starts to, um, starts to uh, become a part of our uh, our PL. Next slide. I just included a quick example just to kind of show how that will happen. So this is if you if you assume just static uh, revenues and expenses, um, so no change there, but you start spending more on capital, um, which will drive up the depreciation expense that we have. Uh, you can see that that doesn't change the operating EBITDA margin, um, but it does over time start to drive down the uh, the operating margin. So um, that's what will uh, will happen to our uh, internal targets as well um, as we hope we're able to increase our capital spending on much needed um, uh, 
uh, investments, um, our internal target will start to uh, to go down uh, for our operating margin. Next slide, Jen. So this is a look at uh, where we have fared over the last um, few years when you look at the internal targets that we've had. Um, the yellow highlighted numbers are uh, numbers where we're below our framework target for that given year. Um, green is, sorry, the yellow is we're within the framework target. Uh, green is we're exceeding the framework target. Um, and then red, we're actually below those targets uh, that we just, uh, we just took a look at at the previous slide. So the story that this really uh, tells when you look at, you know, from 16 up through our 22 budget is we were on a on a on a good um, solid path back in 16 and getting into 17 in terms of our operating EBITDA margin. Um, you can see that our cash still wasn't within range, but was starting to climb as a network. Um, it went from 188 to to two or one, um, but from then on, you know, our operating EBITDA margin started to decline, uh, which caused the cash to decline, and the decline, um, as we'll, you know, highlight um, as we move forward through the presentation, really uh, the key missing piece there is the is our uh, revenue rate increase. Um, did not keep pace with our expense inflation during that period of time. So um, that's kind of the key, you know, the key uh, messages to take away from this uh, from this slide. Um, what this does show is we are in a, um, if you take a look at our long-term debt to uh, capitalization ratio, we are in a good place there in terms of how we compare to the, the benchmarks and where we are compared to our internal targets. Um, once we are on a path where our operating EBITDA margin is consistently back into the, the range we need it to be, um, that's an area that we'll have more confidence in being able to take advantage of that, uh, that debt capacity um, that we have there. Finally, um, if you uh, take a look at the budgeted, the FY22 budgeted column, you can see that we're um, the target that we've set for the operating EBITDA margin for this year is still at the lower end of that uh, range. Um, but if we can start to make um, some progress uh, like we did uh, last year, um, where our rate increase did um, did uh, come very close to covering our expense inflation, um, if we can continue to make progress there, um, you can see we'll will at least be at the lower end of the, of the range and hopefully in the years ahead um, we'll be able to, to focus our benchmark targets on that A rating. Um, the, the rating itself is not what we're essentially striving for. It's more about what the rating says. Um, so first of all, 90% uh, of S&P rated hospitals do have an A rating or greater. Um, so the targets that we have set are not targets that are unreasonable. Um, they're very reasonable that they're where we should be um, as an organization. Um, the A rating, you know, indicates the financial capacity that we have to care for our community. Um, it indicates that we have the resources to pay competitive salaries, to recruit and retain uh, the people that we need to care uh, for our patients. Um, it signifies that we can keep pace with advancements uh, in medicine. Um, it signifies that we have the financial stability to, to weather uh, unexpected events. Um, back to the, the, the deep appreciation that Al shared uh, when he was talking about the federal and state uh, stimulus money that we received. Um, the fact is, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we were in 
not the greatest financial shape to be able to weather uh, an event like that. And had that not been for um, the federal and state funds that we did receive, um, you know, the impacts of the pandemic and the downturn in, in our finances would have been even more uh, dramatic um, and even more um, impactful to us uh, continuing to meet uh, our mission. So we want to get back to that place where we have um, the financial stability to, to be able to absorb those unexpected events. Um, something very tangible that the A rating means is that it ensures that we have access to capital markets. So when we do need to borrow money, we have that ability. Um, and it also uh, ensures that we um, have low interest rates on that, uh, on those funds. The rating agencies and their uh, meetings with us this uh, this past year made it very clear that um, that they're expecting the health network to be back into that seven to nine percent uh, operating EBITDA margin range, or um, that you know we were at risk for for a downgrade. You know they've seen even before the the pandemic that our finances were starting uh, to deteriorate. Um, so they're really expecting uh, this next year that we're back uh, into that range. Then finally, what that would mean if we were uh, to receive a downgrade, um, you know, it really would mean that uh, we don't have the financial uh, wherewithal to continue to make um, investments in our people, um, in our facilities, in our technology, um, that the organization um, you know, would seriously be at risk for uh, not being able to continue to meet um, the needs of our uh, the needs of our community. So I think that's it for. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark, who is going to highlight our net patient revenue growth, and then also uh, go into detail on our commercial rate increase. Thank you, Rick. So. Um, as I go through these sections, you know, Rick and I are going to be sharing some of the talking points back and forth. So um, there are a couple slides he'll be doing. There are a couple slides up I'll be doing, but I'll be pausing at the end to see if Rick has anything to add. Next slide, please, Jen. So this is just an idea of how we go about constructing, constructing our net patient service revenue budget. Okay, it is, it is. It is very consistent. It is very system driven. Um, there are nuances that need to be factored in for the three different hospital types, but this is basically the practice that we've been doing for many, many years that has gotten our NPR rate, I think, fairly close to target each year, understanding the last two years. Um, to um, Al's talking point earlier, there's about $300 million worth of less NPR coming into the system over FY20 and 21 for our hospitals. So the first column, you know, this just highlights what goes into the, to the 21 budget, all of those same general assumptions. And so what we attempted to do here is to say that these are the components of how we break it down and speak to the major items that drive it. And there's some notable items at each one of the bottom. That's more there from an awareness perspective. But I can't overemphasize how important that base period of the year to date, October to January is for this overall model. I mean, that is really, really the foundation that establishes all of those relationships of, of payer mix, service mix. Um, so and 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 the emphasis is 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 probably more important than this year than ever before. As Al spoke to those challenges earlier on an earlier slide, all of those challenges hit in that October to January period. And and so so the challenges that we had as a network is that we take that October to January base period and then we say what sort of adjustments do we need to make to that to basically get um, the simple example that I use is that before you look at any 
any rate changes? You know, how do we make September look like it's a 12 month budget? How do we align all of those dollar values that happened in September as a 12 month as a 12 month budget? And as you're going to see in a later slide, you know, from Al um, on volume that also presented a little mm -hmm. bit of a challenge this year. I shouldn't say a little bit, a significant challenge on how to predict where 22 is going to fall for some of those challenges he mentioned earlier and some more that he will mention later. But so here's how we went about it. OK, October to January still served as the base, but we had to go in there and do more adjustments than we have ever had to do. And I've been doing this more than 20 years. OK, more adjustments than we've ever had to do. And basically what we had to do is is we went back and we looked at 2019 actual. That was the cleanest year that we had. And we basically looked at 2019 actual, and then we looked at October to January, and then also those all of those adjustments that need to happen or be taken in consideration. Um, and we put our best work forward, taking all of our expertise, and this goes all the way down with the revenue chain, by the way, of saying, how is this going to impact us as we go into next year? So like I said, there was a lot of considerations. There was a lot of changes, but we took a mix of 2019 actual, the October to January base and the known adjustments that we would have. And then we said, is there any changes in utilization? Um, it's very difficult to come to a single utilization um, statistic that say this is how revenue changes. So the proxy that the R model uses is gross revenue. It's not perfect, OK, but it's probably the best that we have. Um, the imperfections with it is that it really doesn't um, give the credit to each type of volume of how the value of that payment may change. So, you know, there's some fluctuations there. Um, then there's the physician um, acquisitions or transfer component that needs to be considered. And then we take a look at what is our 22 expense inflation. And that's purely on rate, that's purely on unit cost change. Um, um, and we're going to get into this calculation next. And, and you total those all up. That's how we get to our 22 budget. And you see like the same list of base assumptions that you saw starting with 21. Next slide, please. OK, so. These are the numbers that go along with it. Um, and and so um, and I'm going to speak first to a little bit of that scalability with that John spoke to earlier that it's important to keep in mind that when you look at some of these numbers, they are big numbers, they are large numbers, but when you put it in relativeness, to the base um, in a very complicated payment model of how close that, you know, we are actually able to get these numbers. Um, um, you know, it is pretty remarkable. So, um, but I'll go through and um, I'll speak to each one of these at a high level for each one of the facilities. Um, there was the most variation at the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, the starting budget was one point four billion dollars through that base period and through those adjustments there was almost 47 million dollars of changes i can tell you there was a payer mix change well that took that down by a significant number and we did see a change in our budgeted collection rates by payer that was attributed to a shift in the mix of services and um al spoke to this earlier meaning the acuity or the treatment levels that had to be provided to patients were at a higher level. Um, and, and, and it is just the way our payment structure works, okay? Those higher acuity services, like a surgical case compared to a medical case, even if the gross revenue is the same on both of those cases, the surgical pay case, is usually paid a little bit higher. OK, so that acuity mix was a large, large driving factor of that forty seven million dollar change. There was a little normalization in there of, you know, transitioning like 
the hospital rate year to a calendar you know, rate year, you know, so on and so forth. That accounted for about 9 million of that 47 million. But the major part of, of that was a change in the type of services um, that the patients, um, you know, were seeking out. You know, the utilization for the University of Vermont Medical Center was um, uh, uh, basically a push, I would say. And, you know, keep in mind, Al's going to speak to the volume you know, later, uh, there was a physician transfer between two of our organizations. Um, the, well, the rate increase that was necessary to cover expense inflation was $42 million. And that's what, that's what brings us to the $1.5 billion. Um, the rest of the two organizations, um, CVC and Porter, they were a lot more normal of the year. And I also should say this too, is that that $47 million, I looked, back that past year's filings, it is a little bit higher than past year's filings. So that's probably that volatility that we had to do in that adjustment period. But when you look at CVMC and Porter, the adjustments were much, much smaller through the base in the adjustment period. Um, you can see through um, uh, their utilization that we are predicting a utilization increase. Al's gonna speak to those volumes later. Um, their expense inflation is respectively 6.8 and 2.6 million dollars that brings uh, CVMC's um, NPR and FPP budget to 250 million 251 million and for Porter 94 million dollars and then if you break that change down in totality that for the University of Vermont Medical Center that's a budget to budget NPR change of about 85 million dollars um, if you look at after the physician transfer column, you know, respectfully, the staff still need to do their work at the Green Mountain Care Board to calculate those percentages. Um, but if you look at it after the physician transfers, that's about a $6.3 million change. Um, and 3% of that $6.3 million is related to the 22, you know, rate change that is directly tied to expense inflation. And Rick's going to talk a little bit you know, later on the difference between those two slides and, you know, how you break all of this down when you look at it on a population basis. But if you look at it at CVMC on the surface, it, it, it looks like they had a very large NPR increase of 6.5%. But after you factor in uh, physician transfers, um, it goes down to 4.5%. And their 22 rate that's related to expense inflation for 22 is 2.9 percent um and then if you look at poor hospital it is 4.9 percent and 2.9 percent respectively next slide please yeah so this this slide is uh, meant to just to uh, highlight a, um, a couple of things but primarily uh, because you'll see in a minute um, as we did last year our commercial rate increase is um, is completely being driven by the need to cover the inflation on our expenses and so when you think about volume or expense increases, there are expense increases that are generated by volume and then there are expense increases that are generated by inflation. And when we look back at our finances over the last several years, um, if there was no expense inflation in our numbers um, and we just had a, you know, a volume increase that then had a, you know, a corresponding expense increase, with all the, the fluctuations in terms of the types of volume changes that we've had over the years, whether it was admissions or radiology exams, different payer mixes, um, different um, amount of fixed versus variable expense on that particular volume uh, um, metric that was increasing. When you take that all into consideration, essentially our margin would have just been, you know, essentially unaffected by volume changes you know over the years that um the the revenues and the expenses essentially were you know were you know were pretty much uh, in line um meaning if we had no expense inflation we would need no rate increase because you know all of the 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 moving dynamics within our finances of changing volumes and the things that we've done uh, to 
help manage expenses um, all essentially you know uh, you know brought us to a kind of a level kind of margin what has been missing is that um, that rate increase to cover and keep pace with the expense inflation so that column B that you see there in that small uh, grid down the bottom that's been what our struggle has been um, that because we haven't been keeping pace um, with that expense uh, inflation, we've been losing ground um, in terms of our uh, of our margin. And uh, uh, last year, we made great progress um, where the, the revenue um, rate increase came close to covering our expense inflation. Um, so hopefully we can uh, continue to make that progress, but that's really the missing piece. Um, and as you'll see here in a minute is the piece that uh, as we've done the last couple of years, that um, is how we build our commercial uh, rate um, need. So back to you, Mark. Next slide, Jen, please. Okay, so, so this is how we went about our commercial calculation. It first starts with what the expense inflation was for all of our payer population. So, and when we say expense inflation, to be very, very clear, we are only referring to FY22 expense inflation. So we're looking ahead, we're trying to pick, we are trying to predict what that looks like, and that's what we're building into our ask. We're not doing a look backwards. I mean, as we all know that the expense inflation Al spoke to earlier in 21 was probably higher than most, if not all hospitals budgeted. So this is only 22. And you're gonna hear at the end of our slide, you know, presentation, what some of the risks are. Um, one of the risks is, is this expense inflation that we're building into our 22 budget isn't high enough based upon what we're currently seeing in the marketplace. But this is what it was based upon. So we first start with the expense inflation number. We take away all of the other payment increases from the non-commercial payers. You know, that equals with well, the remaining expense, which needs to be put um, onto the commercial payers. We divide it by the per 1%, and that does the solve for for the commercial rate. So, you know, that's basically how we do it. Um, and we'll go through the numbers for each one of the affiliates. Okay, okay. So the first thing I will say, this is where the expense side really matches up with the NPR side, okay? Um, and, 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 you know, the numbers might not match exactly because we're trying to go after it from a, um, from a payment level and an expense level. So there's a little variation in the rounding here. Um, but basically, if you take a look at the expense inflation for the University of Vermont um, Medical Center, the total expense inflation was $41 million or 2.5% from an expense level. We did have to back out a portion of that was related to our other revenue activities. Um, so basically the net starting point of how much fell into the expense inflation that needed to be funded by NPR was the 38.6 million. Um, I'm just gonna go through these categories and just kind of share what the, what the um, change was. So on the salary inflation in this one, it was three per, or um, 3%. On the med surge, it was 3.2. On the pharmacy, it was 2.8. The other category was 0.9%. Um, and you know, the expense inflation on the provider tax is purely related to the unit cost change in the revenue. That's one of those categories that it's just not one calculation. It's a three or four step process that you need to consider as you go through that. And we're happy to talk to that. Um, um, further at the end of the presentation or, you know, with the Green Mountain Care Board staff after, but it's very important that you look, consider those three or four steps. And, and another way of looking at it is, how is the expense changing if the volume doesn't change? So, you know, that's another way of looking at it too. But basically, if you go down below the, the first column, well, that says, 
if we were to out and in and by the way in the little assumptions after medicare that just shows the medicare inpatient assumption was two and a half percent outpatient to professional was zero percent it looks like it was cut off um the basic assumption in medicaid you know was zero it says a minus here but that's where we get into some of that rounding aspect um in, in the model you need to consider other payers and bad debt and free care and then commercial but if if that 38.6 million and and i'll note this is part of the rounding it's off by 15,000, but that's just the multiplier on large numbers um is if if the expense inflation was to be funded equally based upon the current mix of business this is what it would look like for each one of the payers um medicare would be at 11 million Medicaid would be at 4.5. This other category would be a little bit over a million and the commercials would be about 22 million. Based upon those assumptions that were shared off to the left, these were the rate calculations in the model. Medicare funded 4.2, that was basically zero. Um, bad debt and uh, free care, which was the main driver and the other pairs went backwards and that meant to balance out the solve for to the end that um, the commercials ended up with $39.5 million. You can see the difference off to the right. And if you take that $39.5 million down below, the per 1% on a budget year is $5.6 million. And that calculated 7.05% rate increase. So next slide, please. So going through the same mechanics for the Central Vermont Medical Center, their total expense inflation is 2.3%. Once again, it is fairly modest. If you look at, across the individual categories, a salary infringes 2.5%. Med, surge, and pharmacy are 3 and 4%. All others under one um, uh, in uh, the provider tax is about 2.4%. Um, compared to the unit cost change down below. This just speaks to the same thing. Their assumptions were 2.5% um, for inpatient Medicare, 2% out and zero. Uh, Medicaid was zero. Here's the impact of bad debt and free care. If you allocate that $6.1 million across all of the payers, it is 2.2 million for Medicare, a little under 800,000 for Medicaid, the miscellaneous category is 250 and commercial payers are 2.8. Once you factor in the cost shift, it brings us down that the commercial um, payers have $5.8 million. You go down below, you take that $5.8 million, divide it by the per 1% of the 791,000, and that's how CVMC comes to their 7.41% commercial rate. Next slide, please. Okay, so as we look at Porter Hospital, so, um, they had a pretty low cost inflation total. That's about 2.4%. Their salary in fringe was um, 3%, well, the med surge was in the 3%. Um, uh, and, and then the other thing that, well, that I should say is all of these numbers tied to the appendix table that we submitted um, under the inflation category. So if you want to reconcile those numbers, that's exactly where they come from. Um, so so on forth going, all other was under 1%, whether provider tax was 1.8%, that was in line with their unit cost inflation. Um, as you go down to the rate assumptions, um, Medicare inpatient and outpatient had a 2.4%. Um, that's a little bit different because they're cost-based reimbursement so um, on the hospital activity so it makes sense that that is that 2.4 percent is exactly in line or or very close to being in line um, with what their cost inflation is um, on the professional since they're not paid that um, way on a cost basis it was zero percent medicare was zero so just to kind of outline this, I mean, what you can see going across, there's 800,000 for Medicare, 200,000 for Medicaid, and 1.1 million for commercial. Um, you can see that 
Medicare for cost-based reimbursement comes a lot closer to funding that inflation cost. It's a much smaller number. So the solve for there was a little um, under $1.9 million for commercial is $321,000 per. And, um, and so that calculates a commercial rate of 5.86. Um, I would just like to say that, you know, um, this is just one aspect of the NPR change. You know, Rick's going to be talking about the next aspect of the NPR change and how you start to transition this look of an NPR change and start to look at the impact of it of when it's evaluated across the population base um, in our service area and exactly what that means. So I'll hand it back to Rick now. Thank you. Uh, next slide, John. So yeah, as Mark was saying, so what we just went through um, on those slides is the is the rate component of our NPR. Um, the other component um, is the utilization piece. So what I'm going to take um, uh, to take you through in the next few slides is how that rate um, and utilization uh, compares to the population uh, we serve and. Um, make the case that when you look at it uh, from that lens um, uh, compared to the denominator which is the population we we serve that uh, we feel we're within the three and a half percent uh, net patient revenue growth uh, guidance uh, jen next slide so in asking that our net patient revenue growth uh, be viewed in that light um, on a on a per capita basis um, obviously, we're, I hope we're in agreement that we're not asking the board to go beyond the bounds of uh, the statutes uh, that regulate us. So um, hopefully, um, hopefully that uh, this what we're about to go through makes uh, makes sense to you. Next slide, Jim. So when you when you think about total cost of care, as I as I mentioned, so it's a combination of the price uh, for the services times the utilization um, that we're expecting. So our total NPR is essentially that total cost of care. It's what we're projecting for the price of the services that um, that we have, including the commercial rate increase uh, that we're we're requesting in this budget times the 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 utilization that um, uh, that we're projecting for all the different volume variant uh, metrics um, admissions uh, radiology exams the the everything that we have um, in terms of utilization the next piece of that equation is then taking that net patient revenue number and dividing it into the population that we serve since as one of our key and core missions is trying to keep our population healthy. Um, we're actually trying to decrease uh, utilization. So you need to look at that denominator because that indicates, you know, the, the patients uh, and the population that we serve that haven't uh, received services, which is, you know, obviously, um, you know, part of our uh, of our goal. Next slide, Jim. So this, this, some of the, the, the bullets that I have in here, some of the talking points have changed even in the last uh, two weeks here, but uh, we submitted our, our presentation um, a little while ago. Um, so I'll just highlight some of the things that have, uh, that have changed. So overall, um, as we've highlighted uh, the last uh, few years, and as you, I'm sure you've seen, uh, the population um, in Vermont has been flat through 2000 or was flat through 2019, um, but that our primary network, the counties that surround uh, Chittenden County, so Addison, uh, Grand Isle, Franklin, and Washington counties have been growing even though through 19, the population of Vermont has been flat. We saw in um, mid-April the newest census data that came out that showed that the population in Vermont um, had grown from that 2019 estimate of uh, 623, almost 624,000 people up to 643,000 people. So a very unexpected uh, result, um, and that's even before 
uh, we've seen any kind of data on what's happened in 2021, which I expect when we do start to see some data, we're going to find that that number has grown even beyond um, uh, that number. Um, at the time that we submitted this, we did not have the census data available by county um, that did come out a couple weeks ago, and it has, you know, essentially validated our um, sense that our market area is growing. Um, Al, later on in the presentation, is going to share some of the results of, a, of an independent study that we had commissioned that um, that will show you a little bit more detail on where we think that that's headed um, uh, in the years ahead. Um, like the, the rest of the Vermont, uh, the UVM Health Network's primary market area has been aging. Um, in 2018, um, we were fourth um, in the country uh, as a state um, where we had 19.8% uh, of our residents that were over 65. In this newest 2020 census data, that's grown to, uh, to 20%. The reason why that's uh, important, um, as we all know, um, the older the you are, the more you utilize healthcare uh, services. Um, and this chart at the bottom of this slide um, highlights the data that uh, that has been put out there by the Department of, uh, of Health and Human Services that shows that those 45 to 64 use healthcare services at two and a half times those under 45. Um, and those over 65 utilize healthcare services at uh, almost four and a half times uh, those uh, under 45. Next slide, Jen. So this model uh, that we have built uh, to adjust our net patient revenue on a per capita and age adjusted basis, we had in our narrative, um, we've condensed it here in the in the presentation just to highlight the kind of the, the, the key uh, pieces of information. But if if you're looking for more detail, the chart is a little bit more expansive um, in the narrative. Starting at the at the top um, is our uh, market share over the years. Um, so for FY21, for example, it's that 325,000 uh, figure. And this is the market share for all three of our Vermont hospitals. Um, again, just to, I'm just going to, as we're going through these numbers, just to remind um, everyone, these numbers that you see for 20, uh, 21, um, and the 22 budgets are before uh, we um, had access to the most recent census data, which shows that these numbers actually should be higher than this. So when we update our model, um, it will um, it will change these uh, these numbers because the population is actually higher than what uh, we have in here. One of the, the factors that we've used as again, uh, as we highlighted in our narrative is to, to adjust the population for the, the age of the population and to use those utilization factors from the previous slide to make those adjustments so that we factor in as population, um, the age of the population changes that we can measure the the, the the true impact of that when you look at net patient revenue so that we're comparing apples uh, to apples. Um, we've taken our uh, UVM Health Network patient revenue um, and we've taken out all the New York based net patient revenue um, so that we're truly only talking about the net patient revenue that's been generated uh, by Vermont patients um, so that uh, we can compare that to the uh, the population numbers. This next section here on the slide we've added, we didn't have in the narrative uh, because on the next slide, I'm going to compare this number to some national trends. Again, trying to uh, use benchmarks wherever we can so that um, we have some external um, look on these numbers. But when you look at the last five years uh, at our net patient revenue, uh, per capita, not adjusted by uh, the age, we've averaged 1.2% uh, increase in net patient revenue um, over those uh, per capita over those five years. 
when you look at our budget to budget change, uh, we're at 3.9% uh, per capita. Again, these population numbers are lower than what we know today. Um, so both of those percentages with updated population numbers uh, would generate lower numbers than what you have here. And then finally, the uh, the grid at the bottom that is the age adjusted um, number over the five years, the net patient revenue per capita adjusted for the age has um, increased by 0.2% over that period of time. And then finally, um, from uh, the 21 budget to the 22 budget has increased by 2.6%. And it's that number that we feel strongly um, fits within the three and a half percent guidance um, that has been set uh, by the board. Next slide, Jen. So here, just to show again how this compares to some external, uh, not necessarily benchmarks, but data, um, as I just went through, um, the UVM Health Network um, from uh, the non age adjusted per capita growth from 2016 to 2021 um, has been 1.2% over that period of time. The, nas the national growth rate, if you look at the chart at the bottom uh, over that same period of time, has averaged 4.4%. Um, the non adjusted, the non age adjusted per capita NPR growth rate from our 21 budget to our 22 budget um, is 3.9. Um, when you look at that 22 increase again on the chart below for the national uh, projection, it's 4.9. Um, again, both of those numbers uh, will be lower when we, you know, when we update with the newest population data. And then finally, not something for uh, necessarily this, um, you know, this budget hearing or to uh, to use uh, for uh, for today. But just looking ahead a little bit, when you look at the data, the national growth projections, um, and you look from 2022 to 2028, um, the national per capita growth projections are 5.5 percent per year um, during that period of time. So just putting, you know, putting it out there that um, that you know we know that the Vermont population is growing faster than the rest of the nation, and we know that utilization of um, uh, older um, folks generate more utilization. That. Um, looking ahead, that three and a half percent growth target number, uh, even when it's adjusted on a per capita basis, um, based on these projections that are being made, may be difficult to achieve, and just something we need to consider um, in the in the future. With that, um, I think I'm now turning it over to Dr. Leffler to uh, to share a little bit about uh, the EVM Medical Center. Thank you, Rick. Steve, before, before you start, um, at some point uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes, um, we would like to take a 10 minute bio break. Is now the logical time for that or should we wait till after your portion? Sounds good to me. Let's let's take a break. Yeah, I think uh, this is the right breaking point, Kevin. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. Thanks, John. So I'm going to um, recess this meeting until 1020 and we'll see everyone back at that time. Thank you, Kevin. Next slide, please, Jen. So um, I think it's an important point that um, the UVM Medical Center serves both our local community and the entire state. We're the academic tertiary care center for approximately a million people in Vermont and upstate New York. We're also a very large community hospital and our employees serve about 100, almost 170,000 people in our local region. That's critically important for everything we're going to talk about today, that we have this dual function. I can tell you as a provider and educator, that's an amazingly great place to be to have both a community hospital and academic medical on COVID-19. And we committed using all the resources that we had to support Vermont's pandemic response, whether that was testing Vermonters, vaccinating Vermonters, standing up surge sites. One of our um, infectious disease providers in sessions
to um, underrepresented Vermonters to help them make the good choice to be vaccinated. So across the organization, people were very committed on using the resources of the medical center to help Vermont, I think, have the best in country response to the pandemic. This slide was put together when we were optimistically saying we were going to return to many pre-pandemic capital projects, but the pandemic, even though we wanted to be done with it, it's not done with us. We have 13 people in the hospital day with COVID-19. We have five in our ICU who are quite ill. That's down from 15 over late last week. Um, and we have 54 people waiting for discharge who can't leave the hospital but are ready to because we don't have safe places to send them. That's mainly pandemic related and staffing. Um, we do need to get back to the other important work that we do, and we are very focused on projects uh, around staffing, equipment needed like MRI machines and space. I've outlined some of the things that you're very aware of because we've either put a seal in or I've told you we're going to. We're working hard on a staffing staffing collaborative with our union to make sure we have safe, safe staffing on all of our floors. That's worked very well. Our emergency department, I've been here for 28 years. We've set our top number 10 days over the past three or four months. Um, yesterday was a day of 210 patients. Um, I'd only seen that a couple times before in my entire career, and we're breaking 200 almost every day now. Um, we need a new, we need another 3T MRI. We have backlogs for MRI right now. Um, we have the only 3T MRI in the state of Vermont currently. It runs 17 hours a day. We do our inpatients during the nighttime so we can make sure we get outpatients in. Um, 3T MRI is the state of the um, art for diagnosing cancer and other complicated um, complex illnesses. And we desperately need another one for access for Vermonters who need that study. And uh, you've already heard a lot about the Fannie, a huge challenge for the medical center, but we need a current, modern, flexible outpatient surgery center for the patients that we serve, for our providers, and for our learners, they can understand as more surgeries move to outpatient care, how that would work for them and the future careers they're gonna have. Next slide, please, Jen. Our challenges, and once again, you've already heard this in the presentation, but I have to hit on this. We have a significant access challenge right now, as great as any challenge I've seen as long as I've been here. I think that the growth of Chittenden County, as well as the aging of the Vermont population, and the coming out of the pandemic with people being um, having delayed care has put us at a critical time right now. Um, last Thursday, we were in near crisis mode in terms of trying to care for everybody who needs our services. Um, the whole United States right now is having staffing challenges, no matter what you're doing, healthcare um, particularly is having huge challenges. We are having staffing challenges right now and working hard to make sure that we are an employer of choice, that we are recruiting well, that we're retaining well, that we are a pipeline to the colleges that are training our next generation of providers. Um, but staffing, I think, is going to be a challenge for the next five to ten years, and we have to we have to make sure that we are a place that people choose to work. Space. Um, right now at the medical center, we are using every available space we have. Um, in the in the um, early spring of 19, I came to the Green Mountain Care Board and we asked for permission to use some space. And since that time, we're using all that space every day right now. We recently asked to add 15 more beds. And even that right now is not meeting the demand for patients that we have. In our emergency department this morning, we have 22 psychiatric boarders. We have 43 total patients. And we have uh, three people, this is actually a very low number, three people in our ED waiting to go upstairs, but we have five people at outside hospitals that need to be transferred to the academic medical center that can't come. Um, that's a daily occurrence as a physician that really bothers me. I wanna get people to where they need for care. So um, I, we're very focused on that and trying to have space and staff to care for people across our region who need us. Next slide, please, Jen. So I wanna make sure that people realize that the pandemic, as Al said, has been an accelerator, but we were having issues before the pandemic. If you look at the med um, medicine volume up through 19, this is pre-pandemic, and the surgical volumes, they were both already increasing. Then we get a dip from COVID. Um, people stopped seeking care. We stopped doing a lot of care. 
Um, but since about April, we've been back at least on these two curves, if not greater. So we were already experiencing challenges around um, having um, space and equipment needed to care for people who need us. And since about April, it's been um, at an unprecedented increase. Next slide, please. So we break every single day at the medical center into three levels of capacity. So green is level one, that means operations as normal. The way I think about that is we have enough staff and space and equipment for everybody who needs us, no problems. Blue means we're challenged, but we'll get through it. Blue is we call it le level two. And, and blue is a, not an easy day, but we have, we'll get through. And the, the um, upper level here, the orange or yellow, is we're at census level three. It can't be operations as normal. It means we have to divert people away from normal activity to figure out how to care for everybody who needs us, both with staffing and space challenges every day. Um, you can see that for the month of May, May and June, we were in either level two or three every single day. We've been in level three right now for seven consecutive days. We project, we, um, project to be in level three all the way through at least mid next week. That means that the staff here is working exceptionally hard, trying to manage patients and trying to get everyone what they need um, in um, really difficult circumstances, um, extremely challenging. On top of that, I just will tell you that we're gearing back up for another major testing and vaccine campaign. The medical center through the fairgrounds through a lot of great partnerships vaccinated, you know, 83,000 vaccines through the fairgrounds. We believe almost all those people are going to need boosters now. And we believe that with the challenges you're seeing in front of you in terms of um, managing the high census at the medical center, we're also going to be doing another huge testing and vaccine campaign that we believe is going to last through at least February. We look at eight months out from everybody's first vaccine. So through a, what looks to be a very busy fall, high volumes of COVID patients, sick patients otherwise, high volume of transfers, site crises, we're also going to be running another major COVID campaign, which is the right thing to do, but will be challenging. Next slide, please. This, I already hinted at this, but you can see that um, uh, from March 21 through June 21, there's a gradual but steady increase in patients, or, or I would say outside facilities re requesting transfer of their sick patients to the medical center. I want to be clear, this is our mission. This is what we're here for. We need to be in a situation where we can accept every one of these patients as soon as the outside hospital says they need to come. So that we've maintained for the whole pandemic, even during uh, the cyber attack, um, that we would accept critical patients, emergent transfers, and we've done that consistently even today. But with already multiple people in the ED waiting for admission, some of these people have to wait for a bed. There's just no place to put them. Um, so that's a critical issue we have to address. Next slide, please. I want to make sure you know that even during these challenging times, we're very focused on being efficient on making sure that we're not using resources um, uh, in ways that don't make sense and that we're controlling the cost in every way possible. This is um, a slide from what's called AAMC, the Association of Ad um, Academic Medical Centers. It's about 130 medical centers, including this in this chart including the UVM Medical Center. Um, for as long as I've been here, we've always been an extremely low cost academic medical center. This is directly with our peers. You can see that on this chart, we never even hit the midpoint, the 50th percentile. We're oftentimes at the 25th percentile or lower. So we are doing everything in our power to manage expenses and actually not to overuse, utilize resources. When I tell you that our MRI machine is running 17 hours a day, we're one of the lowest utilizers of MRI in the United States on data. Next slide, please. Another slide just to highlight that. Supply expense for adjusted discharge. Um, you can see that um, we consistently are extremely low cost compared to the um, College of uh, Teaching Hospital median. And finally, if you look at our compensation ratio, so that's basically our, our cost of staff, Per budget, we, we maintain right at um, A rated median right there, if not slightly below. I think that's my last slide, Jen. Yes, thank you all.
Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to give a brief overview of uh, Central Vermont Medical Center. Next slide. So just to reground us, um, Central Vermont Medical Center employs 1,700 staff members, and we serve over 66,000 people in the regions across our 24 cities and towns. On our main campus, CBMC provides a range of inpatient and surgical services, as well as our long-term care and short-term rehabilitation at Woodridge Rehab. I do want to note that since the beginning of the pandemic, we launched our Incident Command Center on March 9th. Uh, Woodridge Rehab and Nursing has had zero positive COVID residents, which is almost unheard of in the industry. So I just want to credit the team for all the work and uh, making sure we kept our residents safe uh, through that uh, this very challenging time. CVMC also has 25 medical specialties and 23 um, medical practices across our HSA. Uh, we, as, um, as all organizations in our network, have been acutely focused on our pandemic response, uh, doing all we can to support our community. Um, uh, we gave 34,000 um, vaccines in our hub um, in the Berlin Mall, and we, um, as, as UVMMC is, are preparing for um, testing for um, our employees, again, as well as the community, and vaccine boosters. We are seeing, as Steve mentioned, a dramatic increase in the complexity and the acuity of our inpatient admissions. Most of our inpatient admissions are medical and most are over the age of 60. We've also seen high volumes in our ED, again, unprecedented for us, as well as um, ex extraordinarily high volumes in our express care. Um, some of the highest volumes we've seen in my tenure of the last four years. And again, the number and severity of our borders and our ED have increased through the pandemic, both for the adult and pediatric mental health borders. We're also experiencing medical borders in our ED, um, uh, significant volumes increasing there. And as Al mentioned earlier, our acute care census um, is the highest that we've seen in my tenure. Next slide. Just want to go over some priority areas for CVMC. Um, I'm going to spend some time talking about workforce um, a little bit later in the presentation, but I do want to mention that um, for us, as with Porter, we're going to be going live with Epic Wave 2 in our acute care uh, setting as well as our revenue cycle. We're looking forward to being on the same platform uh, across the entire enterprise. And um, we are anticipating that with the increased census and staffing challenges, that training for that uh, will be a bit challenging. But um, I think as a network, we've been proactive in trying to secure additional staffing to support um, a successful go live. The other focus areas for CVMC are in margin improvements. Uh, we've used a variety of lean and rapid cycle improvement methodologies to enhance efficiency of all of our operating systems. I'm going to focus on um, a couple of projects in particular, and those being optimizing our surgical schedule. So in collaboration with the UVM Health Network team and UVMMC specifically, we've opened up and allocated OR space and resources to provide OR time to UVMMC surgeons to come here and provide care uh, for patients who live in our catchment area. I think that's a strong example of the effectiveness of a network. The other area of focus for us is in our OR supply chain um, management and optimizing um, of our supplies in that area, reducing inventory and cost of limited use items, again, just to reduce our overall expenses in that area. Uh, in the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, area here, uh, again, Dr. Brumstead shared a lot of what's going on at the network here specifically for CVMC. We've chartered a diversity, equity, and inclusion steering committee uh, in August of 2020. They meet monthly. That team reflects the diversity of our um, employees here. Very engaged team. Um, as Dr. Brum said, mentioned, we have a lot of work to do. Um, we did um, uh, get support from our board of trustees for a DEI uh, commitment statement which we've launched and is now part of sort of the grounding um, foundation work for all of our DEI efforts. 
We have declared a Martin Luther King as an observed holiday, uh, switching from a traditional Christian holiday of Christmas Eve uh, to keep it budget neutral, but that was an ask from our employees, so we uh, wanted to move forward in that direction. And DEI content now as part of the education is part of all employee orientation, including our physicians that are part of our medical group. Dr. Brumstead sent a letter um, to the board in mid-July describing a large number of facilities projects within our network, and obviously core to that is our inpatient psychiatric capacity project. Uh, that project is essential to address a severe shortage of inpatient psychiatric beds um, that we're experiencing across the state of Vermont. Um, we've already talked about the border issue, um, and these patients, as you know, um, wait in our EDs every day um, of the year, um, and that has only increased in severity since the pandemic. We've done a detailed analysis of the statewide need, and we acknowledge that we think that uh, we can address that need to some degree by adding 25 additional adult inpatient psychiatric beds here on the CVMC campus and relocating 15 beds that currently exist um, for a total of 40 beds. Dr. Brumstead has reconstituted the um, PIC steering committee, which he will chair. Um, that committee is picking up where we left off when we paused our planning efforts in April of 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. We're beginning to explore more affordable options for creating more inpatient psychiatric beds here on our campus. And once we've determined the most efficient location for the beds, we expect to be able to take full advantage of all the planning that's happened to date. And that occurred prior to our COVID related pause. And we're looking forward to providing the uh, Green Mountain Care Board an update in late fall of that project's progress. Related to the pandemic response, I think we've already talked about what we've done um, uh, to address it. And we are now uh, working as a network to talk about how we um, address the booster needs, as well as the mandate for um, vaccinations going forward. Um, and so that work is um, underway um, and we expect to be able to provide those resources as part of a network response. Other key initiatives that I wanted to mention, um, and the first one is the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition. Drug, um, alcohol, and tobacco use <clears throat> are leading causes of death and disability in the Central Vermont area, and that was um, as a result of both data we received nationally, statewide, and as part of our community health needs assessment. We've uh, launched a Central Vermont Prevention Coalition, which is an interdisciplinary collaboration of organizations and agencies that are working specifically on primary prevention, harm reduction and disease prevention, treatment, recovery and restorative justice. CVMC serves as the backbone organization for this effort in Central Vermont. We received a three-year federal rural communities opioid response program grant of $1 million and over the next 18 months, this team will analyze the impacts of the COVID pandemic on substance use disorder recovery and ways in which we can really strengthen our treatment pathways. Another focus area, as Steve mentioned, is access for us. We've rapidly expanded and we continue to invest in telehealth services um, as part of a joint partnership with a, with a health network and their patient access and service center. We're a, a pilot for some of that effort here. And uh, we're working hard to try to expedite referrals throughout the network for some specialties like urology um, and more locally rheumatology and endocrinology. So access is still a focus, uh, though again, to Steve's point, access is uh, challenging um, with individuals having, I think, delayed some um, preventative health measures during the pandemic. The other area of focus for us is our com accountable community for health um, that's called Thrive here. CVMC serves as the backbone organization for all that work and we're uh, focused on improving the social determinants of health. This team's goal is to optimize the health and well-being of our community through informed, collaborative and innovative solutions. CVMC has worked collaboratively with 54 partners um, and they were essential in our, uh, I think, a robust community health needs assessment that we completed in 2019. And we're continuing to use those data to drive our focus areas as part of our strategic plan. The other area I want to mention is the Working Community Challenge. Um, this uh, initiative was launched in 2019 and it supports diverse local teams tackling complex challenges facing their communities. 
Uh, it's a three-year grant um, that uh, is co-sponsored by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, the state of Vermont, and national and local phil uh, philanthropy and private sector employees. Eight communities in the state of Vermont received a grant, and Barry was one of those communities. And we're really, we're really grateful to be able to leverage our accountable community uh, for health to do this work. So our focus area here in the Barry community is by 2030, there will be 15% fewer single moms living below the federal poverty level um, than their counterparts in 2020. CVMC is a core partner in this program, uh, working with Green Mountain United Way. And we're specifically focused on expanding um, a program that we've been using here at CVMC called Working Bridges with Green Mountain United Way. Um, and we're looking at um, how we can bring resources uh, to those um, uh, single moms um, that have dependent children and how we can really optimize the supports they have um, to allow them to really fully engage in the workforce. So that's, that's work that's underway. And um, again, I wanna highlight our work on food security and wellness. This is work we've been doing for a number of years. That collaboration was more critical uh, during the pandemic. As we know, food security was a huge challenge for many of our uh, community members um, during this pandemic. So we've continued that effort, um, serving over 300 households every month. Um, and, we, and in addition to 150 households um, getting weekly health care shares with a, a very strong partnership we have with the Vermont Youth uh, Conservation Corps. Um, workforce. Um, again, you're going to hear this repeated, I think, from all of us. And I know you're all aware that the Vermont Department of Labor noted that Vermont's workforce has shrunk to this lowest level in 30 years. So our uh, workforce peak was in 2009, and now it's down to that same size um, as it was in 1994. So much of that decline has been in the last 18 months, and we're certainly feeling the ramifications of that in the healthcare systems. Reasons for um, that um, uh, a challenge is an aging out of the workforce. Uh, not only are our patients um, demographic shifting, but so are our employees. Availability of affordable housing is also a challenge. And then again, the pandemic imp impacts. So um, the staffing challenges that we face here are uh, all over the board, uh, entry level positions, but particularly acute in the RN sector, radiology techs um, are, are also an area that in the past we've, we've not had challenges with, but we are today. So one of the things we're doing is exploring EB3 visas. Uh, to place foreign nurses into permanent positions here at CVMC. The goal is to bring talent into Vermont, expanding our pipeline, and also at the same time diversifying our, our community. Um, what the an early analysis of this program would show a significant reduction of cost in shifting away from travel or expense. It would be a three-year commitment for those individuals coming into the U.S. and Vermont specifically. And when we're working with um, companies that have done this all over the U.S., um, it's just more unique uh, for us to be exploring that today. But we see that as a, a, an opportunity um, here at CVMC. And then probably the area I want to focus the most is the programs we've had um, growing talent locally uh, through our nursing career pathway programs. So our LNA programs are strong and running. We've run full, four full co cohorts of um, LNAs in the last um, six months. We streamlined that program to two weeks. We have a lot of churn in our LNA um, uh, employees. Um, and again, uh, bringing um, LNAs on board reduces our um, reliance on travelers. Uh, the piece that I probably want to highlight the most is our LPN program, which we launched prior to the pandemic. Uh, the first cohort was launched in 2019 uh, with a strong partnership between Community Colleges of Vermont and Vermont Technical College. These um, employees who are LNAs or MAs here at CVMC um, are um, screened and applied for this program, and if they're accepted, um, they're supported um, in completing the program in an 11 month cycle. Um, our own staff serve as um, faculty for this program, whether they're BSN, baccalaureate or doctoral prepared nurses, they all um, support the program, which has always been a challenge for nursing programs around the state of Vermont is the, the lack of faculty. They work 48 hours, they have 12 hours of paid study time and work life balance um, time. 
and their program starts Friday afternoons. They um, do the program on Saturday and Sunday. All those uh, uh, classes are offered here on site and that transportation was identified as a barrier for these um, individuals. And the first class um, graduated uh, in June with 13 LPNs, which um, in another month will get us out of the traveler business at our uh, Woodridge uh, rehab facility. Uh, VTC recently shared that they're actually getting calls um, to uh, their organization asking how they can uh, students can enroll in the CVMC program, which is wonderful to hear. And of course, they tell them they first have to be an employee of CVMC. So the good news is we actually have gotten a few folks that have come through that channel uh, looking for employment specific to CVMC. Um, because we offer that program and obviously we're trying to replicate that across the network. We also are now offering an RN program, uh, which is um, a graduated program from the LPNs being able to move on to the RN program that just launched this week and for the LPM graduates are now part of that program. So I'll pause there and um, hand it over to Tom for Porter's update. Chair Mullen, directors and staff, Mr. Fisher and Mr. Peach, thank you for considering the fiscal year 22 budget of Porter Hospital. Uh, my name is Tom Thompson. I'm privileged to serve as the president and chief operating officer for Porter. Uh, a year ago at this time, I was presenting this budget with Jen Bertrand as an interim president. I've obviously since accepted the role on a permanent basis. And I just wanna let you know that a key factor in that decision from my part was the health network's focus on high value care and commitment to how care is delivered or changing the nature of how care is delivered and funded in our state. I'm joined today by uh, new Porter CFO, Scott Como. Uh, Scott has significant healthcare and uh, private industry finance experience, including 12 years with uh, the University of Vermont Medical Center's medical group. Um, a quality I very much appreciate in Scott is his perspective of finance as a means to an end in supporting our mission. And he's a great partner with our team here to help advance that end. I would also like to uh, recognize new medical center CFO, Judy Peak Lee, who was serving as our interim CFO during the budget preparation. So I'd like to take a little bit of a different twist hey, in our Tom. presentation. Tom, um, your video isn't coming through. At least it isn't for me. I don't know if your camera's uh, uh, off. There, there's your smiling face. Thank you. Thank you. I won't start over. Bless you, um, Chair Mullins or Steve. You know this technology thing. It's it is uh, infectious. Um, so again, thank you, John. Uh, we'll take a little bit of a different twist in our presentation today to highlight how Porter's plans uh, advance a focus on high value care in our market and as a member of the UVM Health Network. Um, so for, for uh, just to rec recall a little bit more about Porter, um, we consist of a series of primary and specialty care clinics and uh, post-acute and long-term care services in addition to the acute care and swing bed services of Porter, Porter Hospital. Um, this care continuum obviously presents a very effective platform to support high value care. And I do, if you would, Jen, flip the page for me or flip the screen. Um, on your screen is our strategy map. Its goals and objectives are designed to advance the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's triple aim, as well as a fourth aim to provide for a fulfilling work environment. All work within this plan is uh, designed to lead to one or more of those four ends. And while events of the past year have caused us to moderate our plans expectations a little bit, I would like to highlight some of the areas of progress that have uh, particularly have high value care impact in our plan. So this past year, um, one of those is that we've moved away from a leadership model that was organized by site of service to an integrated model across our care continuum that features physician and administrative dyads and triads working in a team-based leadership approach. We, this group is actively pursuing priorities to integrate care and work processes across our continuum. We also started our high reliability journey by training leaders in improvement science, creating process improvement expectations within each department, 
and recently recruiting a new director of quality safety and performance improvement to help us advance the safety culture and process improvement approaches in our work. We are redesigning our primary care clinics to operate in what many refer to as a team-based care approach uh, with a focus on a blend of professional roles working at the height of their credential to deliver the right care at the right time and at the right cost. And as Dr. Brumstead uh, indicated in some of the opening conversation, we have conducted a survey of our organization to understand perceptions of diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. Results have been shared in dialogue with all departments across the organization. Our DEI Council has been very active in implementing strategies affecting language access, signage, policies, and organizational communications. And a last thing I'd like to highlight on this slide is our work with community engagement uh, strategies including intentional collaborations with community agencies and efforts to engage community members in our work and in our mission. Jen, could you go to the next page, please? Okay, so we have several strategic advantages available to us to lever and some challenges we need to overcome to be successful in our plans. And I'm gonna start with dedicated staff, which have clearly stepped up tremendously through the entire COVID 1.0 experience, as well as the recent weeks and months of persistent high patient uh, activity. We have a great community as far as perceptions and engagement with Porter as a treasured community asset. And I think as importantly, we have an atmosphere in our community and area um, where we have several really high quality agencies that are uh, uh, collaborators in our mission. The UVM Health Network relationship is key in our strategy. It brings scale, unique expertise, uh, support for care transitions, provider resources, uh, shared services for, uh, tech, for uh, technical support that we could not provide on our own. And last but certainly not least is EPIC. Uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, we go live with uh, wave two of the EPIC uh, investment here in the next couple of months and there is a lot of activity toward our preparation and our ongoing uh, uh, optimization of that tool to change how care is delivered both at Porter and across the network. Um, we do have a number of challenges in our plan also, and numbers one, two, and three seem to be workforce shortages. And I, I mean, it's again, it's a repeated, uh, repetitive theme. Right now we're at 150% of budget on agency support. Um, and we are significantly past all other previous year's high water marks in that uh, need for support. We have managers who are routinely staffing shifts. And I think probably what keeps me up most at night is a concern that the uh, our organization's compensation is be low market in a variety of areas and concern whether or not our budget uh, that we have put forward can adequately address the needs that we have to keep up. A second challenge, also a, a, an opportunity, our capital needs and funding. You know, as one of the previous slides indicates, we have ticked over 15 years in our average age of plant. And this year we'll be putting in place, hopefully, some uh, progress on our master facilities plan and investment in some of our areas where we want to best, better meet community need. That, of course, will, however, place pressure on cash levels and margin pressures as we make those investments. Um, to go along a common theme here, patient access constraints, uh, I'll take a little bit of a different twist in that our, our recently completed community health needs assessment did cite affordability issues as one of the top three uh, concerns expressed in the assessment process. Uh, at Porter, we have uh, significant primary care access concerns and are uh, looking both at traditional models as well as alternative models to pick up the slack and being able to introduce new folks to our practices um, and starting care relationships with us. The network here has also been of tremendous value in extending specialty support and outreach relationships to ensure local access to care. The capacity issues are highlighted by, again, persistent high volumes, higher acuities, longer length of stay, mental health, folks in mental health crises. And as uh, Dr. Leffler mentioned, um, the dispositioning issues that we face across our health system within the network, across our state, across our country, 
uh, finding the right place for folks to, to receive care. At Porter, one of our uh, additional challenges are facilities that are appropriate to accommodate uh, these types of care volumes. Uh, several of our facilities um, are quite dated and outmoded for the types of care we deliver today. In a last area I'd like to cite as a challenge and an opportunity also, our care inequities. And I think it starts, the challenge part starts with not knowing what we don't know. I think we have a lot to learn about those who are underserved and best means to reach them. Um, progress, however, is an organizational imperative. Um, and we have been doing great work to date to start addressing some of the issues of the marginalized. Jen, if you want to flip the page. I would like to conclude um, with some critical success factors for our plan success. We have a very ambitious plan, even if it's had to be moderated a little bit this year because of a lot of other activities. Our, our focus is on the IHI's triple aim and to realize those outcomes in a fulfilling work environment. I would cite some of the, some of the items on this slide as, uh, as critical to our success. First um, is that we accept the responsibility and obligation to be a market leader as both a large employer and as a critical community resource. Uh, we are organized and are implementing priority plans to break down system barriers to optimizing work and care integration and thus advance a high value strategy. We recognize that Porter needs to be a provider of choice for Addison County residents for that care which is clinically appropriate in our setting. Our plan focuses on improving access through value added programming and new service development to achieve this end. A role model of mine uh, once said that progress consists of several small steps and an occasional great stride. EPIC is a once in an organizational lifetime opportunity to revolutionize care locally and regionally for Porter and within our health network. We believe that uh, continuous quality improvement investment leading to high reliability in our work is a required path for sustainability and high value. Uh, we are making those investments and setting those priorities. Um, the needed capital investments I mentioned earlier, um, we are hoping to begin that work with our master facility plan this coming year to support both our work and care environments and address community need. As mentioned earlier, this is both opportunity and challenge for our organization. Uh, finally, uh, building on our community engagement. Uh, community engagement is pivotal in our plan, both in maintaining ongoing dialogue with our communities and in programmatic relationships with organizations of like mission, as I mentioned earlier. In sum, the, the budget proposal that we have put forward is our best effort under difficult planning circumstances. We appreciate your receptiveness to our approach and we look forward to updating you as our work unfolds uh, over the year. So thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Strong work. Next slide, Jen. So we hope that uh, the data and analysis that we've presented today has been transparent, accurate, accurate, and in the spirit of collaboration. These are four points that I want to highlight about the three affiliate budgets. First, we believe our net patient revenue growth is below national growth and within the 3.5% guidance when treated as a total cost of care per capita assessment. Second, most of our, of our expenses are outside of the control of Vermont, of our network and of the Green Mountain Care Board. You've heard an awful lot this morning about workforce and the pressures that we're feeling in the workforce area. And we are competing in a national marketplace for talent. And, and that is just a fact of uh, healthcare in 2021. Next, our commercial rate increase only covers the cost of expense inflation. And last, we think we've done a good job this morning of showing that we are efficient when compared to national benchmarks. And we look forward to having conversations with the board and the staff about that. Next slide, please. 
this is just a, a picture. We included this in our narrative last year and this year of a breakdown of the total expense growth of the three affiliates combined and just how much salaries and fringe pharma and pharmaceuticals and provider tax comprise those increases. You can see here that 3.9% of the 6.1 is an increase in salaries and fringe. And that goes back to our point that we're competing in a national marketplace in an incredibly dysfunctional labor market um, where uh, we are seeing expenses rise faster than anyone would have thought a year ago. Next slide, Jen. So I want to orient everyone to, to the next three slides. They're a breakdown of UVMMC, CVMC, and Porter Medical Center's volume as seen through billing when compared to a 2022 budgeted monthly average. One weakness of this uh, of these three charts is that we did not seasonally adjust the 2022 budgeted monthly averages. It is a straight average. We use these same charts when presenting to our um, to the rating agencies because if you go back and look uh, at October, November, December, and January of 2020 and 21 you'll see that we presented to the rating agencies in March and we basically only had red to show them. And we were trying to, to figure out where volume would go by basically now. We thought this would be helpful to the Green Mountain Care Board and the staff of the Green Mountain Care Board to understand the volume assumptions in our budget and the volume trends that we're experiencing um, that we've talked about this morning. As far as how we construct our budgets, we construct them on a conservative volume basis. We do that because to, to do that in any other way, meaning in a more liberal way, we would actually commit to expenses that we would not be able to reel back in. And so each line of this is done carefully beginning in March. For everyone listening, it, 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 if, you, if you haven't thought through the timing of this, we do our budgets from the bottom up in March and April, and they're done in May so that they can make it through our boards and be to the Green Mountain Care Board by July 1st. And so that's what Mark was talking about earlier with looking at the October through January. And you can see here that October through January in, in 20 and in 21, was no map to estimating the budget in the upcoming fiscal year. And so we had to do a bunch of adjustments to try to figure that out. And that's why we've said budgeting through the pandemic has been so hard and it's hard to, to know if you're getting it 100% uh, accurate. And so we've done our best, we stand behind our budgets, but these are the inputs. And so when we say that the ED is, vi is very busy at UVM Medical Center, second line down on the left, you come across, we're at 115% in June. That's just an example of what we're seeing. And if you go back to um, the first wave of the pandemic, which isn't shown here, or the second wave of the pandemic, you can see that folks just didn't go to the ED. This, this graphically tells the story. If you have questions on these, we can go into detail, but I'm just going to call out a, a few things. Um, please go to the next slide, Jen. So this is Central Vermont Medical Center. One uh, point I'd make is if you come down three, three lines on the left, you'll see inpatient births in June. People have asked if there's going to be a mini baby boom from the pandemic. You can see 152% of projected volume. That may be pointing to an answer. We'll, we'll see what, how the statistics play out, but it's just interesting to see this at this level. You can also see that inpatient discharges are above uh, where we're projecting for 2022 by the month. But there's a lot of red on this chart. And so volume assumptions here are critical to making sure that we make our budget for CVMC. Next slide, Jen. 
So this is Porter Medical Center. This does also include Helen Porter. If you come down on the left to inpatient days sniff, you can see the volumes there. Um, just to be clear, we include all of these when we do our analysis. You know, I, I would also call out the ED visits for Porter at 107% of the projected FY22 budget, just to also show just how busy we are um, in the thing that we called the aftershock, which when we wrote our narrative, we thought we might be through by now and we were wrong. Next slide, Jen. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about um, what we're seeing in terms of population and demographics. BRG did some good work for the Green Mountain Care Board and based it upon, uh, I believe, the 2019 census estimate. We decided to take a look at that and hire some outside folks and really dive into where we think this is going, growing, going for us. Because I want to be clear, we are not comfortable with uh, where we are at in terms of uh, satisfying the volumes that we're seeing at this point. I believe Dr. Leffler explained that very well. And we were trying to understand where the population uh, is going. So just a few key things to think about. The Burlington Metropolitan Statistical Area is going to grow by 16% in the next 20 years. And that is from the 2019 projected. So we believe it'll even be faster than that. So we think even this is now a conservative estimate. The Medicare eligible population will more than double and Medicaid will grow by 12%. Next slide, Jen. And so this to me is the single most important slide in this whole deck. Because I asked you earlier when we were when we were uh, talking um, to to really focus on staffing, that staffing was the thing other than approving our budget. I wanted you to take away from this. And this is why. This is a problem that we need to partner to solve. We, the UVM Health Network, need to partner with the Green Mountain Care Board and with the state of Vermont to be able to have the people and the facilities we need to care for this population. What's going to happen to the Medicare population in the next 20 years cannot be better explained than this chart. And again, this is a conservative estimate. We've got to begin to get ready now with pace and a sense of urgency, or things will only grow worse over time. So again, we need help, and we need your best minds on this, and we need partnership, because this is truly something that we need to face together. Next slide, Jen. We've talked about our people. This is the projects that we've talked about publicly and written to you about. These are. We do not believe that we'll be sex successful over the next 20 years if we do not invest in both our people and projects. I I'm not going to go into detail on every single one of these, we've mentioned them throughout the, the, the presentation. Um, we, can, we can answer questions uh, once we get to that. Next slide, Jen. I think we should have probably kept count on how many times we've mentioned access being an issue in this, in this part of the, uh, of the presentation, um, because I think it's obvious that we're all taking it very seriously. I just want to call out a couple of things. We cannot address access without our budget and without a margin. It, those things can't happen without happening together. And we can't address our facilities without partnership with the state and with our regulator. And so when you look at the bottom bullet here, that we are actively recruiting over 75 physicians across 
our affiliates in Vermont, that should that should explain physicians. If that's the only problem we had. OK, so um, in order to address access again, we need people and we need facilities and we need a margin to take care of both of them. Next slide, Jen. So as I said, we put together our budget from a bottom up process in March and it's approved in early May. So there's always risks, meaning we're making big assumptions on the future. So let me go through some that we see, and I'd really frankly like to hear any that you see because, you know, anything that'll help us, um, you know, get the ship to port, so to speak. First, obviously, if we don't receive the commercial rate we've requested, that's a risk to our budget. Second, since we put our budget together, the topic in, in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times almost every day has been, is the inflation that we're seeing transitory or is it sticking around? And I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to weigh in on that, but it seems like it's a little more sticky, um, at least this month, uh, maybe people thought. So that could impact us. Medicaid and Medicare payment policies. If Medicaid and Medicare do not keep up with inflation, it continues the pressure that we put on the commercial payer. This is the cost shift. Um, you've spent a lot of time talking about it as a board. Um, this is a stress to our budget. Um, this is a stress to the commercial payers. Um, next, if the ACO program rate that is allowed with the federal government under Medicare, or if Medicaid were to change its policies and limit that in any way that is not, in, that would be a risk. The next bullet, who knows what's next with COVID? There's been a new crisis rolling, you know, right along. And so we need to be ready and uh, we, we are, but it may impact our budget. We have not made decisions based on money when dealing with COVID. An example would be vaccinations. John's point on vaccinations was if we get paid or don't get paid, he did not care. He wanted us to vaccinate everybody that wanted a vaccination. And we held to that. And obviously we then worked it out uh, with the state and federal government, but we were head down uh, trying to get that accomplished. Next, our outpatient pharmacy revenue may be overstated, and that is due to the ever-changing and shifting sands of the 340B program. Last, workforce challenges. I think we've said enough about that today. And finally, EPIC. EPIC implementations at our two uh, non-academic medical center affiliates in Vermont. Um, could, the budgets could be at risk if we poorly implement and perform once EPIC goes live. That's a real risk. Um, I will tell you that the benefits outweigh that risk to the, to the good points that Tom Thompson made about the incredible moment we will have once we get everyone up on EPIC, but uh, that is a risk to the budget. Next slide. John, do you want to jump in here? Um. Go ahead and take this, Al, uh, first shot, and then uh, I'll jump in and I have a couple summary comments. Thanks. Yeah, so um, the great thing about these hearings is we get to talk about more things than just the budget, and we get to think through things uh, that are, are really important to educate Vermonters about that aren't just truly financial. But at the end of the day, this is a, a budget hearing where we're asking you to to approve what we've proposed. And so here's our ask. We have a budget of all of our three Vermont affiliates combined. That's about one point eight billion dollars as proposed for FY 22. And we need the NPR and the commercial rates that we've requested. 
to accomplish the mission that we've set out for FY22. We hope you're comforted by the fact that we are not asking for anything more than or anything less than what we need to cover our expenses. Final point, we need the margin to be able to invest, to invest in our people and be, to be able to invest in our facilities. Thank you, John. Thanks, Al. Um, uh, you know, uh, our current times, uh, I said they were complex. Uh, sometimes I characterized them as interesting. Um, uh, they really have been put in the context of uh, uh, crises. Um, we have a uh, crisis uh, with a worldwide pandemic that just keeps coming and coming and coming back in various forms. In our state, we have a crisis with uh, mental health access. And, you know, uh, I don't yell um, uh, fire in a crowded movie theater. It's just not what I do, but there's no way to categorize what's going on with mental health access in this state other than a crisis. You combine the two uh, and we have a crisis uh, in access. And um, uh, actually uh, in talking with state leaders, uh, workforce has been uh, put into the mix as a crisis. And I can tell you, I'll give you a little vignette of what's going on around uh, our piece of the universe. Um, way back with the first wave of crisis, we had an every afternoon call that had leaders from around the network and then around the region that got together to brainstorm uh, solutions and to give uh, um, uh, situation representatives of uh, where we were. And we've gone back and forth uh, on that model. We're back. And it's not just for COVID, it's the constellation of things that we're facing. And we've had three or four of these meetings now, and they are remarkable happenings. The things that are being discussed by our leaders are just mind boggling. And I would invite any of the Green Mountain Care Board members, uh, if you want to attend one of those meetings, we're totally transparent, you can do so. I can guarantee you that you will be dramatically impacted by what our healthcare leaders clinical and administrative are facing and and accomplishing every day. I've obviously been around this block for decades and decades and decades, and I'm impacted by those meetings. Uh, I'm impacted because they are the most difficult situations that I have ever experienced. And I'm also unbelievably proud and gratified by how our people are stepping up to meet those crises every day. Steve said, you know, the academic medical center uh, levels uh, our uh, access and our capacity uh, on a uh, moment to moment and day to day basis. Um, you know, uh, this is um, just incredible time, interesting time, uh, a time of crisis. And the way we get through that is we all pull together. So what I said right at the beginning, we can't do this alone. We have the people and um, the experts. If we have the resources and the ability to reinvest in our organization to get through the near term, and to be sustainable uh, in the long term. And that's how all of this ties together. It's not hyperbole, hyperbole um, and uh, it's not uh, crying wolf uh, or fire in a crowded movie theater. Uh, and again, anybody that wants to experience exactly what we're talking about, 
uh, I'll invite you. Uh, Al runs the meeting as our chief operator, um, and uh, uh, happy to have you uh, listen in uh, if you want to experience what it's like on the, the front lines today. So with that, Chair Mullen, uh, I'll turn it over to you uh, for the, the rest of the time. Decide how you want to uh, uh, administer the questioning. And again, you know, I can serve as a uh, MC unless one of the uh, uh, board members you want to direct your question. Of course, you can do that. Otherwise, I'll I'll try and direct um, uh, where the question can be best uh, answered. Thanks. Thank you, John, and and thank you for the whole team for the uh, presentation. Very thorough work. Um, just want to uh, before I start to uh, go to questions, I just want to. Uh, um, respond to um, Al's point that um, you really need willing partners to solve the workforce issue. And um, I refer back to 2018 when I testified in the legislature and called it a crisis for the healthcare system. And people thought I was being melodramatic at the time. And here we are today. And uh, clearly it is a crisis. And it's something that not only the state of Vermont, but our entire education system has to become involved with in order for you to have success. This isn't something that anyone can accomplish on their own and we'll have to uh, all work through this together. Um, I have had already a request for another bio break. I've asked that person to please wait until noon. I will be very prompt at noon to break for lunch. I'll even um, Inter interfere with the questioning of a board member at that time if uh, that occurs. And uh, to start the questioning off, I'm going to ask our staff to ask um, some questions that they have, and then I'm going to start with board member Maureen Yusufer. So Patrick Rooney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Joanne, for the record, this is Patrick Rooney. Um, title is uh, Director of Health Systems Finances for the Green Mountain Care Board. <clears throat> I would also like to thank the UVM Health Network leadership for their time today and the opportunity to ask some questions. And also I would like to reiterate that the staff have greatly appreciated the uh, dialogue that we've had with UVM Health Network leadership outside of this budget cycle over the past several months. It's been very informative to discuss some of the uh, complexities that are facing your organizations. Um, throughout this year and with the ongoing uh, rise of variants with COVID and some of the other complications that have arisen uh, that impact your uh, providers throughout your network. So thank you very much for that opportunity. And Dr. Brumstead, I'll meet your request to push my questions through you uh, and for you and your staff to uh, leadership to respond to. Um, I apologize for the uh, lack of organization here. I've been jotting these down as we go through the presentation this morning. So from a topics perspective, I might jump around a little bit. No problem. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, with that, Dr. Brumstead, you had spoken earlier about bearing the fruits of integration, and certainly it takes several years to integrate or affiliate a standalone organization into a network. And for example, IT systems alignment, supply chain, administrative functions, etc. That said, you have several people on this hearing today who can offer some valuable perspectives. Ms. Noonan spoke to some of these questions, some of my question earlier, but looking at fiscal year 22 and beyond, what are some of the remaining challenges or opportunities that exist for management to bring the Central Vermont Medical Center to a financially stable and financially profitable state of operation on a year to year basis? Um, uh, just to generalize uh, that great question, uh, Patrick, um, we're just now starting to realize the true benefits of what you said, bringing all the organizations around on common uh, systems, processes, IT platforms, and we're just starting to see the uh, spend on administrative shared services to go over the top. And, you know, further questioning, Rick Benson, I'm sure, can provide value as to how that's going to rapidly accelerate in a good direction going forward. Specific to Cent Vermont, I'd like to start with you, Al, because you can put it into the general perspective of uh, all of our, uh, uh, our entities. And then, Anna, you can provide some specifics. 
So, Patrick, how are you? It's nice to meet you, even if it's over Teams. Pleasure. Uh, yes. Absolutely. So, uh, so CVMC, you know, if you look, if you remember the margin chart that I can't ever forget, has not had a positive margin in several years. And so the, the good question you're asking is, when do we see that turning around and how do we see that turning around? Well, one big giant step is bringing together all of the technolo technology platforms that we have, that we're implementing, so that we will be able to have um, eyes into everything that's happening in real time and also better manage the rev cycle and accounting systems of CVMC. So specifically, Epic. You know, it, it, I, I'm going to say this. I, I think uh, Anna mentioned it last year um, or in another hearing, but the OR at CVMC runs on paper, just as an example. Okay, you know, that's, that's not a goal of any health system. And so that's something that, that Epic will change and that obviously we've done all the work with Epic and all of the process work that Anna talked about to fix that. But that's just a glaring example of how technology will bring systemness and transparency within our own network as to how we're doing. And so I'm answering your question though, specifically to the question about what I think of as shared services. We can also talk about volumes and, and changes to, you know, the operation there if you want to have that conversation as well. Anna, did you want to add anything to what I just said? No, just underscoring what you've already mentioned, Al, um, you know, the it, it's vitally important in today's world that we have um, information to drive our operations and CVMC has been lacking in that regard for a number of years, uh, which makes it challenging to um, pivot um, to address concerns. Um, so Epic is going to be a huge lift for us. Um, and, and the fact that our perioperative um, service line is entirely on paper in 2021 is pretty extraordinary for a healthcare system. And I think that just underscores um, the challenges we have here. Um, manual is my least favorite word. Epic will be a huge huge boom in that area. Um, and so I, I think for us that systematizing um, by leveraging the, um, the variety of um, electronic um, advances, work, Workday being one, um, Premier is another that we've implemented, and now the last one being Epic is going to be critical to our realizing a positive margin. That along with opera, operationalizing and improving the efficiency of our operations, Periop is a good example of that. So um, increasing uh, the, um, the productivity of our perioperative services. And again, this is a great example where coming together as a network is a, is a wonderful thing. So UVMMC um, has had some challenges. We've been able to uh, bring some of those volumes here um, and keep care local um, and still uh, make sure that we're optimizing uh, a pretty invested area like Periop. So though that's just a small example of where coming together as a network is advantageous for us. I'll just pause there and see if that answered your question, Patrick. Yes, it does. Um, as Mr. Gobe noted, that past margin has been a bit of a concern for us as we look at the month-to-month -month operations of CVMC. So it's nice to have a, a clearer picture of where uh, you expect to capitalize on some of those improvements. Um, certainly, uh, anything running on paper these days is a bit of a uh, concern. So um, glad to hear that operationalizing that hospital should provide some improvements and efficiencies to help help you suppress cost growth and maximize margins. So thank you, I, I appreciate the answer. Um, <clears throat> my next question, uh, Dr. Brumstead, Mr. Gobe, you discussed the expense controls undertaken by the network to counteract the financial pressures brought on by revenue reductions largely related to COVID. Uh, when I read your most recent Fitch analysis in March of 21 for your network hospital's financial state of being, they use your efforts to control costs, 52 million in expenses, $45 million in capital as part of their justification for giving you a stable outlook and thus maintaining your A plus rating. 
So will any portion of those non-capital expense controls be permanent in nature for the University of Vermont Health Network? Um, Rick, do you want to uh, pitch that one first and then Al, if you have something to, to add? Yeah, pretty much all of those things we put in. Hi, Patrick, by the way. Um, Good morning. <laughs> Pretty much all of those things that we put into place are still um, in place today. I think that the the key thing that we uh, and we we put this in place even before the pandemic um, was very tight uh, position review um, committees at all the organizations where we're truly um, making sure that we have the work um, and the volume to support any um, either replacements or position uh, additions. Um, has been that was something that was put in place before the pandemic that hasn't that obviously hasn't uh, gone away. The other really is on the um, the uh, the shared service um, uh, part of the organization. And when I say shared service, that's all administrative services. So HR, payroll, revenue cycle, all the non-clinical services that we provide. Um, that we even with the fact that we're not yet all on the same systems, um, you know, we've seen that that is, um, and that's something that we, you know, we've been at for a while. We're continuing to make progress uh, in that space, and we haven't, you know, we haven't peeled back anything that we've done in that area either. Um, that we, you know, that the rating agencies saw when they uh, when they reviewed us uh, back then, and once we are on the same systems, um, that's just going to accelerate the ability not only to, to to maintain or reduce costs, but also to improve performance in those areas um, so that we maximize the whether it's having a, um, a very efficient payroll department, a very efficient accounting department in terms of the, you know, the quality and accuracy of those services. Um, None of that has gone away since the you know, since the rating agencies uh, reviewed us. The capital spend, Al, do you want to just talk a bit about how we're uh, loosening the, the chains on that? Yeah, so be before I do that, John, I do want to comment on one part that that did go away, and that is we we did reduce the pay of leadership. Um, we did eliminate retirement benefits, any premium pay. Um, and that was a, a large, I don't have the amount of money off the top of my head, but that was a huge contributor to that 52 million that was reinstated, um, including redu reduction of uh, provider um, salaries and benefits. But that was reinstated um, throughout the first quarter of this fiscal year. So that, that did go away. Um, as far as capital, um, you, you, we constricted capital to maintain days cash. I can't I cannot adequately articulate what April of, of fiscal year 20 was like. We basically shut down our healthcare system for elective surgeries, but folks weren't coming for anything else either. I mean, we, people hunkered down. And in the middle of that, we quickly realized we were going to break our bond covenants and that we had a 200 plus million dollar hole to close by September. And so we got to work on it luckily the federal government came through with the cares act money that i discussed earlier but the amount of actions that we had to take to even close the gap that wasn't covered by the cares act was huge we were afraid at that point that our day's cash would plummet and we would be uh, you know in a real cash situation so happy to go into detail offline with with numbers patrick but we've we need to get back to spending capital for the good reasons that Rick made about how it impacts our EBITDA and our performance over time. So, but it's still a very controlled, centralized, controlled process, Patrick. And that's one of the changes we've made over the past uh, several years is that no longer does each one of these entities that were solo uh, really uh, control their own capital spend um, if they do have um, uh, any fungible dollars those are allocated uh, from a central pool and based on our quarter to quarter performance so that uh, control centralized hasn't gone away 
even as we loosen things up um, and uh, how we're spending our capital and prioritizing that we're doing as a collective group, uh, but it is centralized. Thank you. And Mr. Gobe, time permitting, I may follow up with you after the fact so we could speak a little uh, more granular about some of those items. So I appreciate that offer. Absolutely, I'll make time. Okay, super. Uh, Dr. Brumstead, you had spoken earlier about the crisis point as it relates to the current state of the workforce. So my question is for the health network leadership, as you have a unique perspective being the most active founder of the ACO, you have a tertiary care and academic hospital as well as a PPS and critical access hospital, all participating uh, with one care and in the all pair model. So with that said, does the current workforce challenge or challenges being faced by providers affect the progress of payment reform for your hospitals and Vermont as a whole? And if so, how does it challenge the overall outlook for progress? Uh, great question, Patrick. Uh, everything uh, is a challenge when you're going through a transformation and you throw a, a few uh, massive curveballs in and it, it really uh, escalates things. How it's playing out, uh, and this will continue to play out um, uh, for Vermont specifically in one care. Um, is that the Agency of Human Services last November uh, put out a uh, how we can uh, improve the all payer model in our performance and sort of segmented, um, including the Green Mountain Care Board uh, and the delivery system, but also the ACO, how we can make improvements. And that um, uh, spurred the Green Mountain, uh, the uh, uh, ACO, One Care to go through a strategic planning process, which really hadn't been done since uh, inception. Um, and what's come from that is the uh, reality that for uh, the transformation for the UVM Health Network to uh, value-based payments and a population health approach, um, we, along with the rest of the delivery system in the state, can't build the structures, hire the people, have the IT systems to have us be successful in that and have our uh, resources go in and build duplicative systems within uh, One Care Vermont. So coming out of that strategic planning process with the support of the very uh, diverse uh, um, group of providers that are the board of managers of One Care, we're really integrating the um, uh, the people in the system support that one care needs to be successful with the uh, processes, the procedures, the people that are providing the same service in the UVM health network. And as we work through that, you know, there'll be a lot more specificity that comes to that. But um, in the same way that we've done and other industries have done, it's another uh, instance where integration of services is necessary um, if we're going to be highly efficient. And what's really changed, and I'll be very transparent about this, if we had tried to uh, have uh, providers broadly in and out of the UVM Health Network share systems, and we hadn't done that five or six years ago, there would have been hue and cry and hell to pay. And I think what's really happened because of time and relationship building and also accelerated by the crises that we all face, there is um, uh, much more comfort and trust that we can collectively build those systems, even if they sit on the budget of the UVM Health Network, and that we're going to be able to serve the broader needs of uh, the, the rest of the providers that are participating. So it's really playing out in that there's a squeeze on dollars coming in. So you got to be as efficient as you can be to build the systems. And I think as we do that, I'm really bullish on the transformation to um, uh, value-based uh, reimbursements. Uh, and we're doing a huge amount of work inside of our tent um, 
uh, with our leadership uh, and with some of the uh, advising of the McKenzie Group to, to do our part uh, on that transition. Thank you. Um, so more specifically around the challenges for recruiting and maintaining nurses, mid-level providers, physicians, et cetera, um, and being able to care for those attributed lives under your health service area, does that, do those challenges pose an additional challenge to the work of the all-payer model in being able to facilitate the care, uh, quality care for people uh, who fall under your HSA? I hope I'm asking that right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't think uh, it's um, directly related. If anything, the prospective payments, as long as they're set at a reasonable level, um, enhance our ability to do uh, the predicting of what we need to do with our expenses um, going uh, going forward. Rick, you're on the One Care Board and you chair the Finance Committee. Um, uh, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I think, I mean, we're doing all we can as on the provider side of that equation uh, to, to improve our recruitment and retention of all the staff that we need. Um, the HR team here at the, the Health Network um, has recently put together um, some you know some high level action plans for how we can start to make an impact there to your to your question patrick to ensure that we do have the the people that we need to provide the access so that we can still um you know participate in the and be a you know a, a strong participant in the co programs um so, but it's as a challenge. I mean, we we certainly we're going to be competing. I'm sure there are many other hospitals um, and health systems out in the in the country that have their same action list on how they're going to try to attract and you know and retain um, the people that they need to care for patients. Um, so I feel like we've got a we've got a good path forward, but it it will be a challenge for sure. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so my next question here is again for UVM uh, Health Network leadership. Uh, do you believe your organizations still have revenue growth potential under the current all payer model? And if so, how do you plan to grow those revenues in the coming years? We're seeing a bit of a looks like budget to budget stagnation on uh, specifically fixed perspective payment. Uh, so do you believe you're maxed out there or is there room to grow and where is there room to grow? Um, I'm going to pitch this to Rick in a second, but and it might seem counterintuitive that to uh, gain participation, we've had to squeeze down the risk corridor um, that uh, those contracts uh, through uh, OneCare have. And the real potential is uh, for the providers being accountable is to increase the risk corridor um, as we improve our ability to manage care um, and reduce cost because it's in that upside potential that we see growth. In 2018 or 2019, um, uh, McKenzie characterized that the UVM Health Network left about $20 million on the table because at that point with that risk corridor, we just sort of hit target we didn't uh, really uh, perform at a level that uh, we would um, uh, yield the gain. So a couple of core uh, issues there. One is get to a point where we can uh, expand uh, the uh, risk target. Second issue is we really need to address the, um, uh, the uh, current uh, mixing in of uh, blueprint and sash into that because it uh, limits the provider side ability to move within that uh, uh, up and down and it's totally on us on the delivery system to um, improve the care to the point that we can um, provide uh, excellent care and do so efficiently so that we can yield uh, gains in that expanded risk corridor. Uh, Rick, do you have anything to uh, add to that? 
Yeah, maybe one other item that I think uh, we need to uh, address um, to expand the potential growth in those those all pair model programs is that Dr. Brumstead didn't mention is the targets and the way that they're set right now are are looking at historical claims um, uh, experience. Um, when you do that, essentially, all you're doing is chasing, you know, you're chasing your tail to a certain degree, because if you have, if you do a good job at reducing utilization and that good utilization is then used to set your target for the next year, you're never able to get to the point where, you know, you're building up, you know, some reserves and actually seeing the benefit. Um, it's, it's essentially the bar kind of keeps moving up every year if you're, you know, if you're doing a good job with the way that the targets are set um, today. So that. That's the other piece of the programs that need to be fixed. And then finally, I think, you know, it, it's all it all comes down to attribution. So it's about, you know, convincing other uh, providers and insurance companies to participate um, in the programs. Um, and so you have to make it, um, you know, attractive to them. You have to make, you know, the you know, it has to be it has to make financial sense for them to join. But it's that's in terms of the, 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 the key number there. Uh, for us to expand um, our our uh, revenue stream in that area, um, it, it's all about attribution. There's one other thing I'll just mention, uh, Patrick, is that I think we need to to make sure that the way that we're measuring our participation in those programs um, isn't just purely about the fixed payment, because we do we do have some programs where we're completely at risk. For the population that we're serving, but it's not in a fixed payment model. That is the ideal, and that's where we want to move to: is having fixed payments that are unreconciled. But if you look at our participation in some programs, uh, we are, you know, at a risk. It's just that we adjudicate the plans at the end of the year um, instead of a instead of having it be paid through a through a fixed payment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, I'm almost done here. Um, <clears throat> again, for the uh, UVM Health Network leadership, you'd mentioned uh, in some of the dialogue that the staff has been having that uh, you are planning to have a meeting around the budget hearing date with some of the stakeholders uh, around at Medicaid uh, regarding the cost shift. And I'm just curious if that meeting has occurred yet, and if so, what was the result of that discussion? Um, great question, Patrick. The meeting hasn't occurred. Um, uh, we will uh, make uh, it very clear the information that we've provided to you uh, today in the cost shift right down to the dollars and cents of it uh, to DIVA and the Agency of Human Services um, uh, in time to impact the next state's fiscal year to have the meeting uh, sort of out of sync with when there actually could be uh, actions didn't make sense to us. So we will be uh, in time to impact this next uh, fiscal year, be making uh, our observations and uh, our recommendations known in writing. Um, and I'm sure when we do that, um, much like the reaction that the Green Mountain Care Board uh, has gotten when they've made those uh, comments, we'll get uh, we'll get some attention. Okay, thank you. And finally, here when I look at some of the numbers around staffing, to go back to that or uh, and recruitment, um, UVM Medical Center from 21 projection to 22 budget is listing an increase of 363 full-time equivalents and budget to budget 21 to 22, 179. So those are some large numbers, uh, no matter which way we look at it. Um, how confident are you that you'll be able to achieve those recruiting aims uh, as we move into the next fiscal year, given the current labor market and uh, work shortage amongst providers? Um, uh, Rick, Al, and then any president that wants to uh, chime in for your uh, local, um, your your piece of our organization. Yeah, really quickly, I'll just speak to the reality is we're we're already at that number today. Um, the problem, as we've shared, is that's being you know that that FTE number is being to a large degree being filled with travelers at a very high cost. So. 
the you know what we're trying desperately to do is attract um, permanent employees to reduce that um, that cost that we're all uh, incurring. Um, that's you know that's always obviously the safety net uh, for us is you know um, and hopefully that you know that avenue doesn't dry up for us either in terms of being able to have access to uh, to temporary workers. Um, Steve, any other thoughts? Yeah, Patrick, thank you for asking that. And so to Rick's point, we actually are more or less staffing to that level now, but as Rick pointed out, it's with expensive travelers. In the budget for 22, we're, uh, we wanna add 75 new nurses. That's part of the work we did with the Nursing Union Collaborative to have for um, state floor staffing. We have, an op we have about 200 nursing positions open right now. And so uh, it's imperative that we, um, as I've already mentioned, um, become a, a preferred employer, um, the whole network, also so we're not fighting with each other. What's interesting right now for travelers is that um, in the past, most of all of our travelers always be um, nurses. We have a lot of travelers for other positions right now. We have travelers for CSR, we have travelers for others. And I would also add just finally, one other significant piece in that um, additional positions that we're adding is for mental health technicians and sitters. Um, we are running a full inpatient psychiatric service on our ER every single day, um, uh, every day. And so trying to staff that is very challenging. Um, and uh, we, we, on a daily basis, don't have enough sitters. So we've added significant to that as well. But most of the positions added are direct patient care positions. And that's how we built the budget. Thank you. So, um uh, one of the centers of excellence that uh, we've been building uh, in HR across the network is talent acquisition. And um, there is a uh, direct uh, relationship between the number of people that you actually have recruiting per the number of open positions um, uh, to successfully fill those positions. So we are actually staffing up uh, in that area um, and actually bringing in some external external expertise. I don't know, Al, if you've got a comment on that or anything else. Yeah, I, Patrick, I think my comment would be is there's two things happening right now, right? One, volumes are much higher and the acuity of those volumes is much higher than we would have predicted six months ago. We, we thought there would be a return after the pandemic, it's just higher than we thought. Second, the dysfunctional labor market that I that I brought up earlier. The question is, how long will both persist? I I really I have no no guess. Um, All right. Well, thank you so much for the time uh, this morning, Mr. Chair. Back to you. I think you're on mute, Kevin. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, I just want to uh, uh, remind everyone that the statute is specific in the way that the Green Mountain Care Board um, must um, look at each hospital. And that's the way the, the words are specifically stated in the statute. So um, I think that this is probably a logical time to take that lunch break, given that it doesn't make sense for Maureen to ask one question and then um, go to a break. So what I, I'm going to do is just lay out the parameters for what will happen this afternoon. Um, when we come back, um, because that statute says that um, we must uh, look at each hospital budget, we're going to take a look first at UVM. Maureen will start the questioning. We'll next go to CVMC, where Jess will start the questioning. And then we will go to Porter, where Robin will start the questioning. On each of the, these uh, rounds of questions this afternoon, we will then turn it over to the HCA and then turn it over for public comment so that someone can offer comment on a specific hospital. Um, and at the end of the day, if there are some more general questions that haven't been answered, we can go back to the uh, more general format, but we'll be um, focusing hospital by hospital 
when we um, commence again at one o'clock. So at this point in time, I'm going to put this meeting in recess till one o'clock and um, we'll see everybody then. Thank you. So I'm going to reconvene the meeting of the Green Mountain Care Board and I'm going to turn the questioning over to Maureen Yusufer. Maureen. Uh, thanks. Um, first, thank you for your very thorough presentation and for all you're doing during this really challenging time and the pandemic. And clearly the network is stressed with surges and um, with the impact that this must be having on staff as well as patients. And I really do appreciate all the benchmarks that you put in and comparisons to peers and things like that. That's that's helpful as we kind of move through. So I want to focus my questions on some of the drivers of the financial statements um, in 2021 and 22. Um, so starting with NPR in 2021. Um, the forecast is down about $124 million from uh, one point, a little over 1.4 million to about 1.3 million. And can you address specifically how much of that decline you would attribute to COVID, how much to the cyber attack, how much to Fannie Allen? So those three components, if you could break out, you know, that, and then, and then if there are any other major drivers, but um, you know, if you could, at least touch base on those three. Rick, that sounds like either you or Judy, me. <laughs> yeah, Maureen, we'll have to get you uh, that answer. We don't have that uh, as we sit here today in terms of being able to break that down. It's um, without the exact number, the the, the largest impact um, is um, likely the cyber attack. Um, then followed by the the pandemic and then the Fannie Allen closure. But we'll have to we'll have to get you exact numbers if you want that number broken out uh, specifically. Okay, because I think that leads me really into the next question, which is, you know, when we turn to 2022, and I appreciate that the you know budgets are prepared so early that you really you know are preparing it on on data where you don't really know where you're going to um, end up in forecast for 21. But when we turn to um, 2022 against the forecast, because of your comparisons were against the budget, um, we're going from about 1.3 million to, uh, you know, just under 1.5 million if you take out the adjustments for COVID. So it's up about $200 million or 16% from year over year. And you know, would really like to understand there as well what the bridge is um, for utilization. Um, you've shown kind of what the rate increases are. Um, what is it bringing us back for for COVID? Maybe the COVID catch up or the delayed care and the acuity. But you know, really trying to look at that. You know, because from year over year, we're showing a 16% increase, which is pretty significant. Um, you know, from budget to budget. You know, we know the budget is is obsolete at this point. So, um, do you have some context into you know other than the forty million dollars that's in there for rate? Um, there still would be another one hundred sixty million dollars of of growth year over year. Yeah. So there's there's two components to that. So so the the largest is is obviously volumes have come back um, or we're at least projecting that volumes uh, will continue to be where they are at in 22 uh, compared to what we had um, last year um, so that's that's by far the biggest component of it the other component that we saw a little bit of um, that mark kind of touched on when he was doing his chart of the he was breaking out the the change from the 21 budget to the 22 budget where he had utilization and um, how much was rate increase in that um, that bucket of the change in base we've seen a bit of a change in terms of service mix uh, where we have some higher reimbursed um, services that are making up um, a higher proportion of our revenue um, in 22 again it's not a on a percentage basis it's not a big number um you know it's you know one and a half percent or so that is contributing to that you know somewhere in the 37 million dollar range but that is also um 
uh, a piece of what um, is changing from uh, from year to year is that is that service mix. Okay, so it's important to understand, you know, some of those drivers because um, it's such a big increase in total. So maybe that's something to kind of follow up on. Um, and then within the net patient revenue, um, just just to touch base on any ACO reserves or settlements. I mean, it appears that there are no no reserves, but just want to confirm whether you have an ACO reserve sitting out there. And also what your expectation, if any, of settlements from 20 or, or any any other, you know, any other things you're hearing either positively or negatively. So, so you're asking about the 21 projection or the 22 budget? Just what you have, you probably still have settlements to come in that aren't resolved yet. And so I don't know how you're booking that through your P&L. Are you expecting to get a favorable settlement? Uh, for Medicaid, um, and if so, how much, and is that reflected in the numbers? And um, are there any reserves that you're capturing um, on the balance sheet? Um, it doesn't look like there are any, but just just want to clarify specifically for the ACO. Yeah, for the FY21 projection, that includes the reserves that we do have on the books. Um, so we're right now assuming that we will get a positive settlement on the um, the shared savings component of the programs for both medicare medicaid um, and the mvp plan for 2020 so again you know, there we're quite a bit in, in arrears in terms of these um, the settlement of these programs but that's that's been reflected in our current financial statements the same time we have a reserve for the fixed perspective payment versus fee for service um, also called the AIPBP reconciliation we have a reserve that's on the books for that um, for 2020 um, as well that will be needing to pay uh, Medicare back for that component um, so our financial statements includes the the you know the most current uh, estimates for those 2020 settlements. For 2021, um, we don't quite yet have enough data. We probably will before before we reach the end of the fiscal year to book estimates for the 2021 shared survey, shared savings components of those programs. Um, but we do have and was included in the financial statements a uh, reserve again for that AIPVP reconciliation because we've actually started to do that internally rather than relying on one care to provide that projection because we we actually have more real time data than one care does so we essentially treat those fixed perspective payments um, and compare them to the shadow claims every month um, and essentially convert those fixed payments to fee for service um, every month so. Right now, we're on the reserve side of that uh, of that equation, where we've had to reserve because our shadow claims are higher than the fixed payments that we received so far in, in fiscal year 21. Um, but that we do on a on a real time uh, ongoing basis. Okay, so is there an incremental reserve that you're posting? Is there is there a net change from 21 to 22, positively or negatively? reflected when you look at the between the two years if you were bridging no the the net impact of all of those entries um my without seeing the exact numbers in front of me are probably um, pretty close to a wash okay um and there's just another question on 21 um, and, the, and the other part I didn't, I don't know if I said on the NPR was also the Fannie Allen and the impact that would have had as well on your revenue. But I want to talk about operating margins. So for 21, you were projecting 40 million was your budgeted operating margin. And it's estimated to be coming in at 52 million. Um, however, if you exclude all the COVID money, um, it would be negative nine million. And can you talk specifically about what the impact on the operating margin was in 21 from the cyber attack 
um, and from the, the issues at Fannie Allen? So I can give you the number for the cyber attack. Um, the Fannie Allen will have to get you that uh, that number as well. So the, ty the cyber attack uh, we calculated cost us about forty five um, million dollars um, in FY twenty one. Um, okay, I and mean, I think you know where that is important is um, you know when you look at I think it was Al's chart that kind of goes down like this, and he said this is the one that scares me the most, but you know, it, it would have been quite a bit better um, if that 45 million was dropping to the bottom line, um, both on cash and in, um, you know, operating margins. And specifically at one point when we go to talk about cash, you know, I think it's been a, a pretty big, you know, impact, impact there. Um, and do you have any insurance claims that you can talk about um, on the cyber attack that might be coming in in the future, or have you booked any expected um, reimbursements there? So we've filed our uh, claim for cyber insurance. Um, we haven't um, we haven't received them. We haven't booked anything in FY 21. Uh, we've had a little bit of back and forth with the insurance company, uh, which um, I think may be a little bit of a struggle to get the full amount um, of our coverage, which is 30, uh, 30 million. The thing that's complicating the, 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 or what's causing the insurance company um, uh, a pause, if you will, is the same question that you asked earlier, is how much of that is cyber related, the lost revenue cyber related versus Fannie Allen versus, you know, the pandemic. Um, so it's unclear at this moment uh, that we get um, the full amount of our coverage, um, but with uh, with where we're at, there's there's nothing that's, um, that's been booked on our financial statements. So if we, if, if um, and hopefully, you know, hopefully you will be able to recoup some funding there, so if that were to occur, that would happen in 2022 and, and could be to the tune of, of $30 million. Is that um, correct? That would be the that would be the highest amount. Yes. Okay. And where would that book? So that would book as other uh, revenue. OK. Um, OK, so now moving to um, commercial rate. And, you know, you've kind of gone through the methodology of how you calculate um, the, you know, commercial rate increase, looking at um, the inflation issues and less any increases from the prior, you know, other, other payers. Um, but to me, in all those um, reconciliations, one thing that's a little bit striking is you know, additional cost saving initiatives. And I, I know I bring this up every year and I know when you address it, it, it's, you know, we've done all the low hanging fruit where we really don't have additional, you know, major additional cost saving initiatives. But, you know, in most industries, I know this is different, but in most industries, you know, much of the inflationary growth is offset by continued continued pushing to, to on margins and cost savings and supply chain and you know specifically um, you know epic um, you know want to understand you know where all the legacy offsets and the staffing offsets that were supposed to be occurring this year I mean those are all things that should be um, bearing fruit on top of all the work that you're doing on supply chain consolidation system consolidation, um, so where is that in the equation to show, you know, as somewhat of an offset? Because, you know, volume increases are going to drive top line volume and carry expenses, but should be contributing bottom line. Um, inflationary increases, yes, need to be covered. Um, but if there are all these programs that are coming in, several of which were, you know, we could go back to the to the EPIC CON, um, were significant impacts to this year and i just want to kind of get a reconciliation on where those offsets are um, to start i think the one of the 
the points that I was trying to make in terms of the, the volume related expense increases. When you look at that over the over the years, there's no doubt that um, that our expense um, uh, saving initiatives has played a part in that, in that we've been able to maintain um, a fairly static margin without any expense inflation because of those uh, because of those activities. The the volume in our industry. Um, you know, as you can imagine, the the differences between you know fixed and variable costs across all the types of services that we provide, the different reimbursement uh, levels, requires that even you know to try to maintain um, balance there, um, you need those you need those expense saving um, initiatives to play a part in trying to maintain uh, that balance. Um, there's no doubt that we've already started to. To, to impact uh, from a total administrative cost perspective, um, the, the cost uh, for those services. We've been a little bit delayed with some systems. Um, I'll just speak to, to Epic specifically just to give you a, a sense on what that will mean when we're fully on uh, the system across all our affiliates. Um, Right now, we have teams that are um, that are tasked with working specific um, uh, payers. So we have payers that um, that work Medicare claims and Medicaid claims and you know commercial claims, um, and that's a function of having to be very hospital centric. Once we're all on Epic, you know, there's going to be an opportunity where the that work. Um, instead of being nece you know, necessarily based on uh, the insurance will be this is a this is a particular um, claim that can be worked by um, this uh, kind of a level one staff person level two level three well that will create um, significant economies of scale that will be able to do that work um, with fewer um, with fewer people and so we're we're getting there. Uh, we're close. The, the three main systems that really will impact the administrative services um, are Premier Connect, which is our accounting um, and supply chain system. So there, we're almost um, completely on the same system. Workday, which is our HR and payroll system, uh, which we're, uh, we're 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 close to being um, across the network there, uh, and Epic. Um, so we've already seen the impacts of even not having all affiliates on those systems, um, but in the years ahead, that will that will certainly start to ramp up the the cost savings that we'll see. I just want to add to that, Rick. That I do also think, Maureen, you have to consider that the data that Dr. Brum said showed we are right now the the cheapest state in the country for Medicare expense. I'm not sure how much you can squeeze further than being the cheapest. If we were like, you know, the way up the great craft and you said, you know, well, you have, you know, 3000 per patient, maybe there's some opportunity there. We can always be better. We can always be more efficient. But if you look at the demands right now on services um, and um, many people when they're sick or very sick medical medical patients require more more care, they require more oversight. Um, so I don't know how much cheaper we can get than cheapest in the country and maintain the level of quality that we demand of ourselves and that we just our patients deserve and access. I think there's somewhere there's a balance there that, and we might be off on the access one right now, honestly. I think the, the chart too that's probably a little bit more direct to the expense side was in Dr. Leffler's um, section two, Maureen, where when you look at our total cost um, per adjusted inpatient day, um, um, to the, the point that Steve is is making, I mean, we're already as an academic medical center compared to our uh, to our national uh, peers. Uh, there are also um, AMCs. I mean, we've never gone over that median number, uh, which that's that's all in cost. That's staff. That's supplies. That's overhead that gets charged to the AMCs, and we've been bouncing around that 25th percentile. So. Absolutely, we still, um, we, you know, trying to contain costs and uh, having these initiatives is something that we do every day. Um, but 
that's a great point that we are you know we are starting at a fairly um, fairly low level to begin with just one final comment to add on when you look at the amc data i know because i talk to my peers across the country all the time we have one of the most highest challenges in the country for discharge to nursing homes because vermont has so few and so i think our costs are actually artificially high because many people would leave sooner if we could discharge them as i told you we have 54 today they're all incurring expense that really wouldn't fall to the hospital part of it if they could go to a nursing home today. So I just want to add that. Okay, I'll, I'll stop now. Okay, thanks. Um, and last year you talked about improvement and documenting and coding and acuity of patients and that, you know, this may potentially have some impact on revenue. And, you know, just wanted to, to find out if you could quantify if that is impacting in 2022 and, and um, or if there's, opportunity you know there as well so let me start rick we we just yeah add on but we just saw some data this week from our chief quality officer that um some initiatives we put in place um through this spring have returned about 4.5 million in uh revenue from improved coding yeah the other piece to, that we were planning on when we talked when we mentioned this last year was, was this engagement that uh, was looking to um, to help improve uh, coding and uh, revenue recognition um, but the other was a system that we had to delay um, due to the due the due to the pandemic and the cyber attack um, that was a um, essentially an artificial intelligence system that would would mine the data of our inpatient records to highlight um, the you know the, the the issues that weren't correctly documented and weren't correctly coded and we've had to delay that implementation um it's now going to be impact it's now going to be implemented in the fourth quarter this coming year so we won't really see um an impact of that system in this uh the 22 budget okay so now just um going back to the commercial rate and the calculation um so uh I put put my push on the the uh, you know cost savings, but but assuming there's there's no additional cost savings to help offset um, the thirty eight point six million dollars in inflationary expenses, um, having um, need some help reconciling um, the chart. I mean, when I when I look at the methodology that talks about um, take the expense the thirty eight point six, um, take any increase um, from non commercial. Um, and, you know, that looks to be about the 4.2 million from Medicare. Um, on Medicaid, appreciate that you're going to be talking to Diva and hopefully we can transition some of that cost shift because your relationship between Medicaid and commercial is, um, commercial is at least double, more than double. But um, when I take the 38 million and I take the $4 million roughly that we're going to get from Medicare, it yields about 34 million. So on the chart, you have another $5 million. And since the chart was done at, at NPR, so I'm assuming should already be factoring in uh, things like um, the bad debt and free care on the incremental gross revenue that comes in. That's a pretty big number and worth 1% of the commercial rate increase. So I really need to, you know, be understand what that is because I, I just I don't understand that 5.2 and a million dollar negative. That's on page 32 on your chart. Mark, do you want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, Maureen, that's exactly what it is. Um, um, well, you touched on it. Okay, from a gross revenue perspective, is that every every dollar that changes on your gross revenue fee schedule well, well the way you get to net is you subtract all of the deductions okay and and basically whenever you have a gross charge increase okay it is not only the bad debt and free care on the payer increase but it's the bad debt and free care on all of the all of the difference on that charge increase so you know we're happy to walk you through that um yeah, you know, to get you to a comfortable level, but that's exactly what it is. Yeah, but I, I, what I'm saying is, I don't get that if it's at that. So we're probably gonna have to take it I'll off. I'll walk you through it. I mean, I mean, happy to walk you through it. This is a mathematical calculation, um, and happy to walk you through it. 
Yeah, because you're saying you need 38 million, yet you're getting 43 million in in rates, and oh, that uh, actually, 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 that piece I can answer, you know, right now, um, um, about four percent, a little less than four percent of, and so keep in mind when we say NPR on that rate schedule, that's fee schedule. That's not what we actually collect. Okay, so you have to deduct charity and bad debt from that. And that right there is in, a, in for commercial is in the range of about three to four percent. Yeah, we'll need to go through it because I mean, yep, at the yep. end of the day, you need to recoup 38 million and you're asking for more than that from commercial um, and getting it from medic, you know, getting it from Medicare and um, that those since they're net numbers, it should already be taken into to impact the uh, bad debt and free care. We're not giving away more, more of what you never got because we're talking at, at the end of the day, you get paid. But that's my point is, is that's not a net number for commercial. You have to take bad debt and free care off from that afterwards. So anyways, we can walk you through the math. OK, so we need to understand why. You yep. No, nope. I completely understand what you're looking for. And then um, just talking about the value of the 1% commercial, um, I thought in when I read through your materials that you were taking an increase across everything, um, inpatient, outpatient, and professional. Um, and I think your commercial base is about um, 800 million or so. Um, we could look at the number. And so 1% of that is gonna be more like 8 million. So can you reconcile to the 5.6 uh, for one percent commercial. Do you want to take that one? Okay. Well, well, the commercial rate in this model is that's a challenge between the calendar year and the fiscal year. When we say the new commercial rate kicks in, it doesn't start until January. So our yeah, our inflationary last year. Yeah, but our inflationary expenses start in October, but. That's a big piece of it. So what you are referring to is a 12 month impact versus what the prorated impact is in the budget of three quarters. But yeah, we need to go through that too because you got 8% last year. So the first quarter of this year over the year before you got 8%. We can't not count it every year. So, so last year was three quarters, but you got 8% and then you're getting an additional eight on top of that. Nope. Um, I completely get that, but the expense base changes because of our staffing, which is our largest expense in October, not January. Right, we'll have so, to look at it because you, yep. you have to count that quarter. No, 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 I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and then it's just moving to um, to cash and, and where you are right now for cash. Um, I think you're at uh, well projected to be what 224 million um, at the end of 21, um, and or was that in 22? I guess you know where do you expect cash to be? And it's a little bit of a loaded question for you, but you know it seems pretty strong. So how 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 do you look at your cash balance now and days you know days on cash um, from where it's been historically? Yeah, so go, I mean, going back to the benchmarks, I mean, that's where we're trying to get to. So um, if you look at uh, slide 23 of the, of the presentation that we, uh, uh, that we just went through, the, the target that we're trying to get to to be in that A rated category, again, the place that we're financially stable is for the medical center, we're um, we're trying to get the cash balance to be somewhere in the 224 to 269 days. Uh, for CBMC, uh, we need to get to 149 to 179 days, um, and then Porter is the same number. So that as a network, um, we take the weighted average of all three of our Vermont hospitals. We're in that 210 to 252 range, which would put us essentially right in the the, the range of the rating agency um, A rated benchmarks. And do you have offhand what one day's cash on hand is for UVM? For the medical center, it's for four million. Okay, so 
you'd go up if you were to get thirty million dollars more from the settlement. Um, that would increase that by another eight days, roughly. I would just <clears throat> make the point because uh, it's come up several times now. Um, uh, there's uh, a large issue uh, going forward with cyber insurance um, uh, in that we likely aren't going to be able to get fully insured from dollar one. Uh, and so there may be draws on whatever um, uh, payments we get from the insurance company to create reserves uh, until we get back to a place where we can be reinsured again, obviously to go bare without any um, coverage in the arms race that Al alluded to um, is uh, not a place we want to be. So I, I want to be careful. Yeah, we might get that uh, 30 million or 20 million, at least a big chunk of that. Uh, against um, uh, uh, any future occurrence, uh, occurrence if we're going bare. Okay, and then just the last question is um, how much COVID funding, if any, is still on the balance sheet um, or that, that may may help help you additionally this year? All the uh, all the COVID related funds that we received have been reflected on the p and I think um, I think the last so there's nothing left on the balance sheet. It's all. Okay. On the okay. I thought that was the case, but just wanted to see. Um, Okay, thank you. You're on mute, Kevin. Thank you, Maureen. Next, we'll go to board member Holmes, Jessica. Thank you. Uh, long day for everybody. Uh, and in fact, I think it's been a long 12 to 18 months for everybody. So the first thing I want to do is thank everybody uh, on the Health Network team for the presentation, but also for all your efforts over the past 12 to 18 months. I know it's been exhausting. I know it's been grueling. And I, I really, as a Vermonter, I want to acknowledge that. Um, also want to acknowledge that I think budgets are always built with some degree of uncertainty, but anticipating revenues and costs for next year is a near impossible task. So I recognize that. Um, so I'm hoping we can muddle through some of this haze together. Uh, I'm actually going to start, maybe this is probably going to be a question for you, Mark, since uh, Maureen asked about it. I think that slide 32, um, which is the slide where you all are making the effort to explain how you arrived at your rate request and the impact of the cost shift on the commercial rate payers. First of all, I really appreciate that slide because I've been trying to understand how the cost shift impacts commercial rate payers for a while, and so I think this slide helps us get there. But I really want to understand some of the calculations. Um, so my first, I guess, question is, because I think this is a really important, obviously an important table for us to understand. And it may have to be offline, Mark. Maybe it will have to do a tutorial with Maureen and I <laughs> afterwards. But let me just try and ask the first question. Um, I understand what you're conceptually trying to do. The first column where you allocate the $38.6 million expense inflation across all the payers um, to come up with the rate without a cost shift um, I'm wondering why you allocated that $38.6 million using the um, net revenue payer mix. If you're trying to start without the cost shift, shouldn't the initial allocation be based on gross revenue payer mix, right? As you said in your presentation, you use gross revenues to proxy utilization. Medicare is 45% of your gross revenue, but only 29% of your net revenue. So I would expect the initial expense allocation to reflect that Medicare are your costliest patients. That's where your utilization is large, excuse me, largely coming from. So why wouldn't you use the gross revenue payer mix to allocate those initial expenses pre-cost shift? My first question. Okay. Okay. So the intent of that slide is to say what portion of the inflationary cost would be related to the cost shift, not to adjust any of the current base. So, so that's purely to say of the inflationary cost, that's new cost to the system through inflation, that what's the cost shift or related to that? 
So there's no adjustment to the base starting point. And, and you know, um, and, and, you know, so at least if we could get to that ground zero, it would be a good place to start. Well, I guess my question is, I mean, most of your expenses are you are asking me what the total cost shift is? Well, for I guess our whole budget. <laughs> no, I'm I'm saying that most of your expenses, right? You've got some expense inflation. If the majority of your patients or the costliest patients, right, the most expensive patients are Medicare patients, shouldn't that first column reflect that more of that allocation is being attributed to Medicare, since that's where, at least on a gross revenue basis it seems like most of your costs are coming from most of your utilization is coming from so i, I understand yep yeah, okay so, so well so like i understand why you would ask that question but when you look at current payment schedules and rates of change it's all based upon current payment schedules so okay. so so well so that percent change is all based upon what they're currently paying us today you know so well so that's why so you're already embedding some of the cost shift in the initial column, and then you're looking yes, at- Yes, actually, this is only the cost shift. Yes, absolutely. Okay. This is only the cost shift that's related to that 38 okay. million. So then I guess my second question is around, as I look at that Medicare, for example, the let's assume that the 11.2 is the correct allocation. Um, the, the rate with the cost shift, so that means that you're only going to recoup 4.2 out of the 11.2 expense allocation there from Medicare. Is that right? That's right. Am I assuming that correctly? Yes. yes. Okay. So I guess that surprised me as well. Um, because when I think about your inflation, right, the growth is about 2.5%. If I look at the appendix, you, ref you referred to the appendix, right? The inflation appendix, as this is where a lot of these numbers are coming from. So the, the overall inflationary factor, the, the 38 million over the 1.6 billion is about 2.3, 2.5%, right? That's the inflation. And and Medicare is their inflation, their reimbursements are going up 2.5 for inpatient, two for outpatient, nothing for prof professional. But they are to some degree covering some of that 2.5% inflation between their outpatient and their inpatient. So I would have expected more recovery of that expense from Medicare that I'm seeing, right? This is only 4 million of the 11 million is about 37% of those expenses are being covered. But I'm, so I'm trying to understand this table and maybe this is something that we do have to take offline and I, I don't wanna you know, burden everybody with my trying to understand this, but this is an important table. One, because I think it tracks the cost shift and two, because it's how you arrive at your rate request. So, you know, I am trying to understand that. I think you're muted, Mark. Yeah. Okay. okay. No, actually, I was just pretending not to talk. No. No, actually, so um so to be very clear, all of these numbers tie back to how we do our accounting in our GL system, how how all of the numbers track back to each other. You know, there could be a difference in the thought and how we go about assumptions, but we are very, very happy to take the time and actually welcome the time in order to go through that level of of detail but there's a lot of detail there to go through and it's more of how do we walk you through it from start to finish not starting at the end and how you and how do you deconstruct it from there so you know you know whatever time will we need to make to walk you through we are very willing to do it okay well i'll follow up with you on that i guess yeah. maybe as we plan for that i would think about you know, when I think about the expense growth being about two and a half percent, then I think Medicare is coming close to covering it, not completely agreeably, but coming close to covering it with what its reimbursement expected increases are. Medicaid not coming close to it at all. Huge cost shift there. And then I guess we have to see what happens with, you know, the commercial rate for, you know, how much that will be covered. But with your seven percent, you know, uh, it's clearly would more than cover it. Um, on the commercial side. So that will be helpful. We'll, we'll talk about that at another time. And I, I do want to talk about, um, thank you, Dr. Brumstead, on the topic of the Medicaid cost shift. I'm really glad to hear that you're going to be reaching out to DIVA to discuss the Medicaid cost shift, its implications for commercial ratepayers. Um, in your conversations, it would be really helpful, I think, if you could, maybe with Mark and others' help, to, to share some measure of the cumulative impact of the Medicare uh, cost shift on commercial ratepayers, because this is not the first year 
that we've had zero percent increases for Medicaid. Um, so I think understanding cumulatively how this has impacted over the last five years, for example, would be really helpful. Um, my question around that is, I know you're talking to Diva since you serve a lot of New York patients, and I'm imagining there's a cost shift on that side as well. Will you also be reaching out to the Diva equivalent in New York to talk about them and to legislators who ultimately hold the purse strings, at least in Vermont, clearly they do. Uh, legislators on the Vermont side, uh, absolutely, uh, and we're already uh, crafting strategies on how to do that. Um, you know, New York State is a whole other kettle of fish. It is the size of, uh, you know, in world economy terms, it's uh, like in the top uh, 15 uh, 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 largest world economies uh, in the state um, and so uh, our uh, voice uh, particularly since um, and I'm I'm not speaking out of school there's 250 years of history that support this the north country of New York uh, is tremendously disadvantaged relative to uh, the South uh, and the East, uh, where huge amounts of the resources go. Um, and so um, uh, even those that have a strong voice for the North Country, uh, when advocating, it gets diluted relative to um, uh, uh, New York City uh, metropolitan areas. But we do have um, voices into the Department of Health, uh, which uh, does have a a deputy uh, commissioner that uh, uh, is charged with all things hospital. Um, there's been, uh, if you've been watching the news, there's been a tad bit of a shift in power uh, <laughs> there. So all of the people that we knew that I and others have spent a lot of time um, uh, developing relationships with, um, with uh, an appropriate attorney general's report went bye-bye. So uh, we do have uh, um, uh, plans uh, in the very near term in September to get back and to reestablish uh, relationships with the new set uh, of players. But that's that's totally uh, different when we're talking uh, Medicaid on, uh, on that side of the lake. Got it. Um, and I guess as we're talking about that side of the lake, there was a lot of discussion about the need to preserve um, an A bond rating, and I can appreciate that on so many levels. Um, and my understanding is that the health network's bond rating is determined by the performance of all the hospitals, not just the Vermont hospitals. And in fact, you mentioned that the medical center actually has to achieve a better than benchmark margin to support the other hospitals. We never really hear about how the New York hospitals are doing, but clearly they contribute to your bond rating and they contribute to the need for the UVM Medical Center to have a higher than benchmark, you know, uh, margins. So I'm wondering if you can just speak to whether or not the New York hospitals are performing better or worse than CVMC and Porter and thus how they're contributing to the overall bond ratings, the need for UVM MC to generate higher margins than than the benchmarks. Um. Thanks, and, and Rick, you can uh, jump in here too, but, uh, and Al, uh, but just sort of uh, looking at trends uh, 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 since, say, April or May, um, Champlain Valley Physicians Hospital, which really is uh, the lion's share of the activity there, um, has actually been in the black uh, every single one of those months, which is a dramatic turnaround uh, and has been uh, a, a great leadership team there and Al uh, Gobey have really focused on turnaround there. And remember that that uh, hospital and their um, uh, portion of our medical group uh, are uh, a little bit bigger than uh, Rutland. So it's a uh, it's a large uh, organization. Um, Elizabethtown uh, and Ticonderoga is our shining star. Um, they just crank along at a three to four percent margin uh, as a um, critical access hospital that does um, uh, very little procedures and don't have an operating room. So there's 
a lesson for you that it can be done. Yeah. They are eminently sustainable and provide tremendous service to Essex County, uh, New York, um, uh, an incredibly rural county. So, you know, um, that might be a great case study for the Green Mountain Cure Board, a regional case study on what might be. I don't know if anybody else wanted to follow up on that or. If yeah, just to add, Jessica, it, um, um, as John said, you know, Elizabethtown is, you know, has been very financially solid for some time. Um, you know, uh, CVPH has, um, has had some improving finances. So when you when you put those into the mix, it doesn't dilute the, the data that we showed on the um, essentially the, the weighted average targets would be, you know, would be essentially the same when you put them into the mix. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Jess, can I ask a follow up question? Of course. Just because I didn't hear anything about Potsdam, are, are you still uh, experiencing problems there? Um, we've never really experienced uh, problems. We had uh, many years ago, um, it was very obvious that there was just a cultural mismatch uh, between their uh, philosophy as a healthcare provider uh, and ours. So it just never came together to be a uh, uh, an organization that we could bring into the UBM Health Network uh, fold. Again, there's just a mission uh, mismatch. Um, we still have significant um, uh, tertiary care referrals from that region and referrals from St. Lawrence County um, really are critically important for some of our key uh, academic and tertiary quaternary uh, programs, uh, cardiology, uh, neurology, neurosurgery. So, um, you know, they're still in our catchment area from, uh, from a clinical perspective. We're just, um, uh, we're not um, affiliated uh, really in, uh, in any way administratively. Does that help, Kevin? Yeah, so there's no plans to do anything there, John? No, they're, they're formally aligned um, with um, uh, Rochester General. Uh, and um, uh, it's probably more a funds flow and almost a bank uh, type relationship because that's uh, where their head uh, was at uh, and their philosophy. Um, uh, but there, there's no um, uh, other than clinical program development and maybe some transport uh, um, um, uh, mutual investments. There's nothing on the docket that I see uh, unless uh, yep. somebody else uh, on, the, on our yep. team has a difference. Yeah, so John, I, I just want to jump in and, and ask. I'm sorry, uh, I this is the court reporter. I can't see who's speaking. Hi, this is Al Gobey. How are you? Thank Kim? you. I'm good, thanks. Awesome. Uh, Mr. Chair, the one we haven't mentioned is Alice Hyde Medical Center in Malone. And I, I wanted to make sure that everybody uh, had that in their thinking that is part of the network. Um, so. And how are you doing there, Al? So. Rick, do you want to describe the obligate, obligated group and how that works with our bond rating? Yeah, so right now, Alice Hyde is not part of the, the obligated group. So the question that Jessica was asking about, you know, the, the rating agencies and how they view us, that is not yet in the group. So their financial performance, their cash is not part of what the rating agencies look at. Um, I assume that's what you're, you're asking for, Al. Yeah, and, are and, any funds flowing from the network to Malone? Not um, per se. I mean, um, we do uh, at the network level backstop um, uh, debt uh, that uh, they have, but um, uh, as the other um, uh, affiliated organizations, uh, our expectation uh, and what we're working towards is to have them uh, at least be uh, break even. Uh, they're not right now. Um, uh, it it is um, one of the areas that uh, I'm 
uh, very sad that we lost relationships uh, at the uh, uh, Department of Health uh, in New York because we were starting to build up uh, to a place where we could get the same sort of New York State funding as we got to convert Ticonderoga uh, to a, uh, a medical village uh, for Malone. They're uh, an area that needs uh, restructuring, but right now there's no plans for us to uh, put the the capital in that would be required to uh, restructure that uh, organization. Uh, there is break fix uh, capital going in uh, and um, uh, support of programs. But again, uh, you know, Rick can speak to this. It's uh, uh, it's not particularly in total as we've uh, demonstrated many many times a negative funds flow from uh, Vermont to New York, quite the opposite. Sorry, I interjected there, Jess, go ahead. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, so actually I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about access to care, which I, you know, at the Academic Medical Center, first I just wanna appreciate your attention to the issue and the presentation and in some of the, you know, uh, press releases I've seen of late. Um, and I want to acknowledge that the medical center has taken some unexpected blows, right? Starting with the challenges of Epic implementation, the shutdown of Fannie Allen, the cyber attack, and pile on to that. I recognize the, the nationwide labor market shortage and that you're in uh, a county that's the only county in the state that's really growing, or one of four counties in the state that are growing. So I, I have no doubt that all of that is factoring into current weights for care, but I have to convey my worry um, largely because I'm now hearing from those in the medical profession that are sounding alarms about patient health. And so I, I want to talk a little bit more about it, um, particularly as it relates to the budget for, for 2022 and what your expectations are around how access backlogs will be alleviated. Um, you submitted some data on the percent of new patients seen within two weeks, and I think that's really helpful as a snapshot. Um, but I actually, I have a couple worries about that as a, as a metric. Uh, I think it may est underestimate the true access barriers. For example, I don't think I'm probably included in those numbers, yet I tried to make a couple of appointments and was so discouraged by the wait time that I actually kind of hung up and, and sought care elsewhere. So I don't even think I'm in those numbers. Also, I worry a little bit about tracking the proportion of patients who are scheduled within two weeks. That may tell us that, for example, 30% of patients got in within two weeks, but it doesn't really tell us what happens to the other 70% of patients and how long it takes for them to get in. So I'm, I'm wondering about other measures that you might use. You know, a lot of the other hospitals seem to use the days until third next appointment. Um, time until appointment for the average patient seems like it would capture some of that long tail of some people who can't get in. So I'm wondering, if you can speak a little bit about the metric you're using, and then that's my first question. And then um, however we measure it, I think, and you all agree, you did agree that we're in a crisis here. So one of the, I think, strong justifications, frankly, for this year's budget request, which some may say is a little bit high, um, given that if we project it out of three and a half percent from 2019 until 2022, this would exceed that three and a half percent growth. But I recognize that there's a need to accommodate Chittenden County population growth. There's a we do have a patient access issue. So the second piece to my question beyond just what metric are you using is you mentioned that you're already, you know, although you've budgeted 300 new positions in fiscal 22, you're close to staffed at that level now with travelers and you want to swap out travelers for permanent. So I guess I'm trying to understand specifically how this year's budget, if approved, is actually going to help reduce that backlog if you're already staffed at the levels that are not necessarily getting us through the backlog? Two-part question, long question. So I'll start, but please jump in others. I'm not sure why we switched metrics. I remember we did it, but I can't remember why we went from uh, third next available, which I we had for a long time. There was a reason, but it, it slips me right now. How, why would you know why, Rick? You're, you're not. There was no way to really benchmark it against other um, organizations, so that that metric that we include, you can actually benchmark against other um, other practices. And the third next available, we had our own internal benchmark that we would use, the you know which was 14 days, but there was no way to see how that compared to other uh, other practices. In 
Thank you, Rick. I appreciate that. In terms of um, overall access, Jessica, I mean, we access really comes down to, in my opinion, three big things. It's space to see people. It's the staff to take care of them. And it's the equipment and facilities you need to provide the level of care. And we're working on all those. In fact, a number of them with you. Um, we desperately need another 3T MRI. I already mentioned on this once already, we have the only one in the state and it runs 17 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, the faster the Green Mountain Care Board approves that CON, the faster we'll have it in place and we'll be able to scan people. I was in our MRI suite yesterday. We're back down to a backlog of about three weeks for MRI, but that's still unacceptable for people who have cancer who want to get a scan quickly so their doctors can schedule their appointments and stage their cancers. We desperately need that MRI machine. That'll help the back for 3T MRI. The only thing that's going to help right now is another scanner. Um, the, the more difficult one, honestly, is staff. And we've already talked about it a lot. I can tell you that um, our um, we have an access program going on right now. We have some pilot programs going on to get people scheduled throughout the network when that makes sense. We're doing a lot of work with our doctors to make sure we're scrubbing their schedules really carefully to make sure we use every appointment available. We are aggressively recruiting. And while there are challenges, we do have some success. We, we need 10 neurologists, which sounds overwhelming. We did hire three in July. We have one coming in November. We are bringing on new staff as quickly as we can. Um, but there are other opportunities. I'm not sure how much of them will come into fruition in 22, but there is a program through Epic where Epic can do what's called e-consults. And it makes a huge difference in access to specialty care. Um, not to toot Dartmouth's horn, but they do it particularly well. We've been down there, we've learned from them, they've shared their information with us. I can't wait to have that at the Academic Medical Center because I know it'll make a big difference for our patients and for our specialists. Um, and so I think we have to keep chipping away at this. I, I don't think we'll fix the whole thing in 22. I, I think it's a bigger problem than that. Um, I think it gets back to the other things we've talked about, making sure that we're a preferred employer. And that's wages, that's benefits, that's space to work, that's cutting edge facilities, that's having the right team around you. It's a bunch of stuff. I think for a long time, when I came here, you took the Vermont discount. You know, it was so great to be in Vermont. You didn't need much else. Those days are gone. And I think we have to make sure that we're competing nationally for the people that we need to care for our population. Jessica, this is Tom. You know, I, I think I'd, I'd volunteer also the team-based care redesign and the primary care practices, which is our biggest challenge for getting folks in particularly new folks, but I think all folks, um, in redistributing who, who patients see based on the type of care that's needed will help alleviate at some level backlogs. Um, you know, even in our practices here in Middlebury, we've introduced an ambulatory pharmacist who might even see patients in a, in a panel just to help, help with that, nurse and nursing visits, and also interjecting uh, more mental health supports into our primary care practices that support primary care these are and there's a culture change and a transition period involved with that that does take some time too all right well i appreciate all that i mean I know, I know you're making efforts i hear the efforts that you're making i also hear the frustration in your voice because i know dr leffler that this is not something that you want right i mean obviously you you know your mission is to care for everybody who needs it and so i know the frustration that you're all experiencing um is there you know is there a, is there anything that referring providers might learn from a conversation with you about some you know about some of the efforts that you're making i'm just wondering if they may even have some suggestions for things that they're experiencing as a referring provider that might you know be short term solutions i'm wondering if a meeting of the minds might be helpful or you're already doing that i don't know so um dr deschamps who's our medical group president i don't believe is on today but i know that the medical group and all others on this call would welcome that. So we want to be here for our referring providers. We want to make sure that we are getting their patients what they need. And I do think um, there are ways to probably make it better than it is right now. So yes, we would be happy to do that. And Jessica, if you want to send me an email, I can help to set that up. That sounds great. Um, I think those are my questions. I really, really appreciate it. And again, just an appreciation for all that you've done and all that you're going to continue to do. Thank you, Jess. Next, we're going to move to board member Lund Robin. Hi, everyone. Thank you again. I'll echo uh, what Maureen and Jess have said about um, thanking you for your presentation today and spending time with us um, to talk about your budget for next year, as well as all that you've done during the pandemic. Um, I think I'll 
kind of start where we were, where you just left off around um, staffing, because it, in look, in hearing all of the discussion today and reading the materials that you submitted, um, I, I wanted to see if we could get a little more detail about some of the HR initiatives that you mentioned in your narrative and here today um, that you're hoping will help with recruitment and retention. Uh, because quite frankly, based on some of the public comments that we've received, it does seem like there could be a morale problem at UVM. And I'm just wondering how, um, you know, a little more granularity about how you're addressing that component of it. Thank you, Robin. Um, so it's no secret that UVM Medical Center has been through a really tough 18 months. Unprecedented yeah. challenges one after another. I mean, I was going to mention in my comments before that we were not really out of the cyber attack, but I was deferring people to start building up the vaccination clinic at Epic. Like, even when we need, most needed to be turned in internally, we were still trying to externally support our community. So um, people are tired. It's been really tough. Yeah. Um, I, I will also tell you that um, we are relying on travelers more, much, much more than we want to right now. Um, we did use extra travelers over the summer to make sure that our people got some vacation. We knew that was critically important going before the fall came. People mostly lost their vacations last summer. So we are using more travelers. Um, we have been working um, with the union to try to um, work on some areas that have higher than expected vacancy rates or longer to um, higher than we would hope for. Um, we have a pilot going with them in one area right now and are hoping to work on some more. Um, we did a, a, a just did a salary adjustment for 208 employees that we felt were under what the market would show. And I think we have to do a more work around market. I also think that at the network level, we're trying to figure out how can we make sure that we retain our staff? Um, so it's it's more than just wages. I want to say that it's it's the whole package. It's it's having being paid fairly and, and feeling like you're getting what you deserve. It's having a good benefit package. It's having the support and facilities you need to provide high quality care. Um, and I will tell you right now at the medical center, the stress every single day of not having the staff you need for everybody that's here is overwhelming. Um, every single day when you get here, trying to figure out how you're going to manage the care for everybody who's here at Needs Us is all consuming and it goes till late, late at night for the leaders and even more for the people that are on the ground. So um, I, I, um, I sympathize with the people here. I'm so grateful for them. We are. Thank you. Um, in terms of retention and um, and uh, looking at your turnover rates, is that something I assume you you normally track in your HR system? We we do. We're we're very on top of our retention, and we do know our turnover rates. I believe they're a little higher than usual, which is pretty common across the country, but sure. not exceptionally higher. Okay, great. Um, and in terms of sort of a longer term strategy, because of course, as we've all discussed um, already, workforce is not, there's no simple, easy fix for that. Um, could you speak to some of the ways that you're thinking longer term about uh, recruitment and retention? There was just a network presentation. How do you want to talk about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd be happy to, to jump in. I mean, I think the, Robin, first of all, it's nice to see you. Good to see you too. Um, you know, I think that so this is a budget hearing, you know, and we're here to say, hey, this is what we need. And what you're bringing up is, hey, maybe you need more than what you think you need. <laughs> you know, that's really the point here I, of what I hear in your question. And so I welcome it. I think that when you think about our workforce, workforce needs pay compensation, but workforce need, needs housing. Workforce needs child care. Workforce wants parking. Workforce wants recognition. Workforce wants to be appreciated over time in different ways. And so we are literally trying to think on all of those fronts and then also how we can build internal and external pipelines. I think President Noonan gave a great example of work that CVMC has done that's been very successful in a micro way that could be, could be made larger. But we need to get better on all of those fronts, and we are we are working on each one of the ones that I've been talking about that I went through with you just now. Um, most of those are not going to bear fruit 
immediately. And I think sure. uh, I think that Jessica Holmes has very good points on access. That's why I, I appealed to the Green Mountain Care Board this morning for partnership, meaning the only way to fix access to take care of our people and to have the facilities we need is to get the resources we need and head in a direction we all agree on. It's the exact same thing with our HR issues. We've all got to agree where we're going, have the resources and have the have the five year plan to make sure that we can get there. But that that's where our minds are at. Is that helpful at all? Yeah, no, that's helpful. It's it's um, there's certainly an immediate crisis and immediate access issues, but um, we have to obviously, to your point, I'll be thinking out yeah. into the future. We'll never get ahead of it. Right. And if if I could just add, you know, we try to hire people and they come here and here meaning, you know, Washington County, Chittenden County, Addison, Addison County, they come here and there's nowhere to live. Yeah. We bring travelers here and there's nowhere for them to stay. So it's not just simply are you willing to pay the hourly rate or the weekly salary? It's way more complicated than that. Yeah. I hear you. And we've been hearing that from some of the other hospitals as well, particularly around housing and child care. Yeah. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, in our staff presentation, which uh, hopefully you're familiar with, they did a breakdown of, and actually I'm going to just pull this up so I get it right. Um, they did a breakdown across the whole system about pressures on um MPR, uh, and one of the areas that they highlighted was something that we're calling UVM Health Network Fiscal Year 21 Billing Variances. And my very limited understanding of that is that it perhaps has something to do with the cyber attack and the need to push billing out until the systems were rebuilt and all of that. Um, and I didn't notice anything about that in your narrative, so I was hoping that you could just speak to that a little bit. and. Um, so that I make sure I'm understanding what it actually is. So I can. I don't, I don't know who that goes to. So. <laughs> like I can I can start, and I think Mark can kind of fill in some of the the technical details. Um, actually, we did um, speak to it. Uh, we didn't I think call it billing um, oh. issues or variances. Um, yeah. Oh. When we broke out the the net patient revenue change from the 21 budget to the 22 budget in those charts, we highlighted that big base number change. That was a little bit of you know what we were trying to describe there. And the issue is with the cyber attack um, and the Epic Go Live. Our total charges were certainly we got them in the system, but were they in the right? Uh, financial class, you know, from the beginning, like was it a Medicare patient? Was it a Blue Cross Blue Shield patient? We did, you know, that took a while to clean that up. And when you cross those two fiscal years, that created some noise that typically we don't have in our, you know, in our budget filing. So in totality, we feel like our net patient revenue number is, um, um, is accurate. But when you look uh, from one year to the next, uh, because of those disruptions and the cleanup that it, you know, that we needed to do, there was uh, some noise there from uh, from one uh, from one payer to the next that um, typically uh, isn't there. Got it. Thank you. That was that's very helpful to just explain that a little bit better. Um, okay, hold. Bear with me for one moment because I. My questions are a little bit scattered in my materials, so uh, let me just get to my tabs and see if I've covered most everything. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention, and this is really a comment, so you, there's no need to respond to it. Um, I'm happy for Jess and Maureen to understand the commercial calculation uh, in greater depth, but to the extent that that's not in the record, we won't be able to rely on it for our decision. So I just wanted to mention that if there's anything that's particularly relevant in that discussion that should be in the record, uh, that that need, that 
would need to be submitted officially. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, Robin, this is Al. Could I just comment on that for a second? We, we, yeah. We'll be happy to get something in the record, but also Patrick, if we could talk about the cost shift report and the way that you do that and the way that we're doing ours, and then maybe explain the, the difference so that the board that is well versed in your way of doing the cost shift report then understands ours. I think that might be a way to translate. That sounds great. Um, so I had a question around the per capita um, calculations and the and some of the data. Um, and I want to just make sure that I'm understanding it right, because this is certainly an area that um, internally we have been thinking about um, in terms of the hospital budget process as a whole. So um, based on what you said, it looked to me like you were using the census data presumably on a county level to um, in your per capita calculations. What I'm wondering about is for the counties where some of that care, some of those people will be going to a different hospital that is not in the network, for example, Franklin and Grand Isle. Did you adjust for that in some way or are you just including the resident population of those counties as unique patients in that per capita count? No, we're we're adjusting that based on the market share that we know we have based on uh, billing data. So Franklin County, for example, it's um, you know currently right around forty percent um, is our uh, patient. So the, the primary counties that make up that number in the analysis that we uh, that we had it was Chittenden, Franklin, Grand Isle, Lamoille, Washington, Addison uh, County are really uh, and so there's percentages of each one of those counties that um, that make up the total population number and market share that um, you see on that report there. And presumably Washington County, I assume. Yeah, did I skip that one? Yeah. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> Since I live in Washington County, want to make sure I'm in there. Okay. Um, so when you are, the other question I then had is like, how do you then know if you're looking at total cost of care that a unique person isn't counted twice? Like, for example, if I go to uh, you're just counting me, even it, regardless of whether I go to CVMC or UVM. Like, can you tell in your market share that one person is sort of crossing those hospitals? No, I mean we're we're essentially just counting them once. So the way that we did this is, you know, we're we're looking at the three hospitals revenue and the three hospitals essentially market share. Um, so yeah, we're got it. All that. Thank you. That was helpful. Um, and I think I am coming to a close. Oh, um, I did want to um, ask specifically about um, the the 15 beds that were that you reopened. I'm wondering how the staffing for those beds is how that's going, because obviously the space, as you mentioned, Stephen, uh, the space alone is only one component. So, Robin, we only have three of them open right now. That's on, uh, those are neuro beds um, that we could add capacity right away. The other beds take about eight weeks to get ready. Um, we will uh, use travel staffing if we have to. Many of those patients are here now, but they're boarding in the ED or other locations. So, um, it was basically able to get people out of hallways and into rooms. So, not all the staff, but most of the staff is here already, and we'll have to deal with that. It'll be one of the challenges of staffing those places, but it'll be a way to get people out of the hallways. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then I, let's see. Let's, I think I am done. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Next, we'll go to board member Pelham. Tom. Well, thank you for being here, and I'm wishing for all of you the day that uh, you can look back on this period and say uh, that you were there and that you did a lot of good, because I think that's what's happening. But sometimes when you're in the middle of a crisis like this, you don't have the time to even reflect on your own um, contributions to uh, the public good. So thank you very much. Um, my first question is it, it's not it's not so much a question it's just a kind of an observation but it has to do with the cost shift 
And I, I, I kind of feel that no matter how you calculate the cost shift, it's a big number. Um, and so it's not something that's going to get resolved in a year or two years or three years. And so a longer term strategy uh, might be necessary. So I, I, I applaud you for going and meeting with Diva and talking to Diva about the cost shift. But I think you might also want to consider talking to the emergency board. Um, the emergency board, as some of you may know, is comprised of the uh, chairs mm -hmm. of Ways and Means and Finance and the Appropriations Committee and the governor. So it's five people. And they actually vote on at the beginning of a session on the kind of guardrails around uh, the Medicaid program um, very specifically. And uh, so if you're not uh, uh, in their wheelhouse um, come November, December, when they get together before the next session, then uh, you could you know, fall by the wayside. And so for example, in the, in the, in the 2021 presentation, it, they voted explicitly not to allow reimbursement increases for Medicaid unless they were federally mandated. Um, and to give you a sense of the significance of it, I just want to read a couple of sentences from their July 30th, 2021 meeting, which is three weeks ago. And uh, in their report on Medicaid, they say, uh, right, expenditures. Overall, Medicaid and Medicaid-related expenditures totaled $1.8 billion in fiscal year 21. This total is 3.9% or $74 million below the gross funds budgeted for fiscal 21 through all of the budget adjustment actions and is 1.4% below the amount spent in fiscal year 20. However, the general fund impact is much lower. This underspending results in 8 million general fund carry forward available for one-time use in the next budget cycle. And uh, it, it goes on to kind of profile that in terms of state funds, that each 3.42 million in state funds is equal to a 1% increase in Medi uh, Medicare reimbursement rates. And that's a statutory requirement that, that needs to be reported. So. You know, I'm I'm on your team when it comes to the cost shift, and um, and and I think a long view here is important. And um, but I um, I also make one more quick note here that the composition of the of the uh, of the emergency board is Representative Hooper from Montpelier, Representative Ansel from Can uh, Callis, uh, the governor's on it, Jane Kitchell is on it, and Senator Cummings is on it. So. Uh, Washington County has a lot of representation on the um, uh, uh, emergency boards. So, Anna, it's up to you. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, my next question has to do with the value value based care participation, and I think that um, um, we you know before the hospital budget season, we went through rate review, and uh, both carriers, MVP and um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, with um, Blue Cross Blue Shield being pretty direct, basically say that uh, when it comes to their commercial participation in these value-based care pro uh, programs, that they don't have willing partners out there, and um, and kind of point to the providers as kind of liking to have a big foot in the fee-for-service canoe, and it's hard to move, move them along. And so I'm looking at your presentation here um, for where the, UMC, the University Medical Center projects 182.3 million in FPPs for, two, uh, for the 2020 budget, comprised of 130.6 million in Medicare funds and 52.2 million in Medicaid funds. But no, but, uh, but, but I know not a dollar um, is in there for commercial. And so I'm just, uh, I guess my question here is uh, what, you know, that uh, um, fixed perspective payments equal about th both 30% of your Medicare and Medicaid um, revenues, but what, how can you prove Blue Cross Blue Shield wrong? How can uh, you prove to them that you that that you are not the problem. That you have some solutions um, in your kind of pending negotiations for uh, 
2022 rates. So I, I can certainly start just to clarify one um, um, one aspect of how we're looking at the numbers and that we do participate with um, in the Blue Cross and Blue Shield for all three of our Vermont hospitals. We participate in the Blue Cross and Blue Shield and MVP um, ACO programs, um, but those programs are not FPP, meaning the program has a spend target, but we settle at the end of the year instead of having a fixed payment throughout the year. Um, and we've, you know, the the place that we've been at for, for a while is a, is a fixed payment that reconciles to fee for service really doesn't have value. Um, all it does really is create an administrative burden that um, and creates uncertainty in your financial statements that you need to stay on top of to ensure that you're accurately re reflecting revenues. So we do participate um, um, in both of those programs. Um, and when you include those, you know, those numbers, it does increase, you know, our total percentage of revenue that is at risk uh, um, in those programs. So I'll just clarify that piece. I don't know if, uh, if anybody wants to add anything else to that. Well, I'll, I'll just say that we'd be um, uh, first up if uh, any commercial payer wants to come forward with actuarially derived um, uh, total cost of care targets uh, and are willing to uh, allow us to um, have the portion of the premium that uh, would flow through the ACO to support uh, care management be first in line. Well, I, I raise this because on your payer mix table and on the reconciliation tables in the budget submission, um, there's still a zero there for um, commercial carriers. It's uh, and uh, but significant amounts, um, as I said, in the 30 to 32 percent range for you know the. Uh, the for the Medicaid payer and Medicare and I'm I, I just I just feel caught um, uh, where I actually was surprised you know that the, the carriers were kind of saying well it's not our problem we're here and we need willing partners and you can go back and read the transcript you know that term came up quite a bit and uh, um, I'm just uh, you know I'm glad to hear uh, Dr. Brumstead you know make the point that that uh, you're 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 there to increase your numbers and and hopefully uh, you you find the path to do that. Um, my next question, uh, I had a question on the COVID program liabilities, which you answered. I think Jess or, or Maureen asked a question about that, but I had another one um, where I noted that the grand total column, and this is on Appendix Seven, that the grand total column did not include 4.98 million in Vermont healthcare stabilization grant phase two funds, nor 9.6 million in FEMA funds. And I'm just, I don't even know if there's any significance to that, but uh, on the other uh, appendix seven tables, I've seen everything ties out and I, I couldn't tie, tie out UVMMCs. Yeah, unless Mark can answer that, uh, we might have to get Back to you, Tom. Mark, are you able to answer that question? I don't have the appendix in front of me. Okay, because uh, the the um, the FEMA one was like nine million bucks, so it was a big number. Um, so the uh, my questions on FTEs have been asked by uh, two of my fellow board members. I don't need to to go there anymore. Um, I did want to uh, uh, just kind of ask what your thinking is about your Medicaid projection for 2022. You you have it moving um, by a 20% increase from 135.7 million in 2021 projection to 163.2 million in your 2022 budget. And this is without a rate increase. And the three moving parts that you reference are utilization up um, as a big positive, uh, reimbursement and payer mix is a big positive, and the FY rate uh, as a big positive, and I, I just, I, I, I just wonder if you can uh, add a little color here that you know if if Medicaid is not coming in for a rate increase, but their projected revenue for 2022 over 2021 P 
is a 20% increase. Um, how, how does one kind of reconcile that? Or, um, or maybe you all can reconcile it, and it's just me, but it, the 20% just seems like a big number, and it's in line with your Medicare increase and with your um, uh, commercial increase, which uh, do have rate increases uh, to some extent. But Medicare has, Medicaid has no rate increase, but you're, you're looking for a 20% increase in an NPR FFP in Medicaid. Yeah, so, so I think the, the, the important thing to think to remember about the projection is it includes uh, our cyber attack that, it, that occurred in November, um, and it also includes um, volumes um, with the surge last fall of the pandemic that weren't quite um, where they normally are. So that, that projection number is starting from a low uh, point uh, to begin with because of those two events. So now we're essentially you know, we're past our cyber attack um, where volumes have come back to pre-pandemic levels and then some. Um, we've assumed that they'll, you know, they'll essentially, you know, maintain that level into the 22 budget. But the, the biggest the biggest reason for that large jump is the projection includes those periods of time that were much lower than what they uh, than what they normally are. Um, I, I get that. I just thought that um, I, I, I think Medicaid is within a point or two of its peer payers, um, and I thought that they would be uh, because if they they don't Medicaid doesn't have a rate increase that they would be farther behind. But I, I understand the logic that you know that that, that you're putting forth. Um, and other than that, um, I'm through with my questions. Uh, um, it's uh, nice to go at the back of the line because. Uh, you get other people to ask ask questions that you don't have to ask, and I and I get to get out of the way of my my chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Tom. So, um, Steve, I'm just going to uh, follow up on a few questions about uh, access, and I know that you've been asked some of this already, um, but I can tell you that um, you know. Throughout the years, even as a legislator, I would hear stories about access problems, but you know they were one-offs, they were anecdotal. Um, but this year, the amount of concerns that we're hearing at the board, and the amount of concerns that we're hearing not only from patients but also from providers about their concerns about whether or not they're providing uh, good care, really scare us. And I'm just curious, other developed countries um, in the world that are putting out better quality outcomes at sometimes half the cost have twice as many primary care doctors as specialists, and yet we have the exact reverse in the U.S. And you referred to higher acuity. Um, that's a recurring theme throughout all the hospitals we've heard from this year, is that the patients that they're seeing are sicker than what they've seen in the past. And I'm just curious if you think that um, our lack of having adequate primary care providers is mm -hmm. adding to the problem. And maybe if some of the specialists are doing some things that primary care docs could be doing, and if they weren't doing those, there would be more time to concentrate on their area. So if you could just speak generally about that, Steve. Thank you, Kevin. So, so um. I think part of the issue in Vermont, honestly, is once again that being the academic medical center also in the most populated part of Vermont, you know, if you say the, the UVM medical center serves 170,000 people as its as its primary care hospital, um, that's how you need a certain number of neurologists for that and surgeons, certain number of endocrinologists and so on. Um, when you add to it that because the rest of the state is so rural and our other hospital partners are small, and it's very hard to have more than one of any specialty in some of our smaller places, if you have any, all that's coming to Burlington as well. So I think we have a particularly um, difficult challenge here in that Chittenden County is growing, consuming. And so the people from Burlington and Chittenden County and Grand Isle that expect to be able to come here and get timely access, which they deserve, um, it's hard for them and it's hard for our referring doctors. So I think it's a double whammy. I also think that um, being a, a very, very low cost state and being very frugal for a long time might be catching up with us a little bit. I think that it's possible that um, 
um, some of the investments that we need to make now, we have to make them more quickly to get caught up. Um, in terms of primary care, absolutely. There's no question that having good access to primary care is the foundation of keeping people healthy. No question. But in a state like Vermont, where we're aging faster than most other states, and we know as you age, you have more medical problems, most of the referrals and transfers we get need two or three consults. They need a cardiology consult, maybe they need a pulmonary consult, maybe they're coming for a trauma, but they've also had a heart attack because of the trauma. They would be very, very difficult to manage in any of our community hospitals, which is appropriately why we're here. Um, I think that um, one of the options I've already mentioned is once we have Epic up for all of our network, that will absolutely improve access to specialty care because more patients will get what they need from primary care through that e-consult. I think telehealth also is a huge opportunity. We're doing some, but we have to do more. Being able to keep maybe someone at Rutland or at um, St. Johnsbury because we can do a telehealth consult, we have to be able to do that because um, they're staying there now because we don't have a bed for them. So um, I think we need to um, really, really be thoughtful about what care we want Vermonters to be able to get in Vermont. Because without some changes right now, um, Vermonters are leaving Vermont to get care because they can get in other places where there's more, better access, just to be honest. And someone asked earlier, you know, an accountable care, care for them within your system because you're the low cost, high quality provider. So um, I think we're feeling the pressures right now of population growth, population getting older, and, and being very, very cost um, conscious every time, which is, I'm a Vermonter, I'm frugal by nature, but I do think right now we're feeling some of that. And I do feel, hear it in your voice, I, I think that you genuinely are, have heartfelt concerns to make sure that uh, Vermonters do have uh, quality of care. But I do want to push back on uh, Rick's statement a little bit because the question was about the measurement. And of course, UVM has always made the argument that um, third next available is not a good measurement. So a couple of years ago, you made the argument that um, 10 days was the right measurement. And it almost feels like, you know, you you just signed up a bunch of left-handed hitters and, and are moving in that uh, um home run fence from 420 feet to 350 because now you've gone from the 10 days to the 14 days. And I think one of the things that we have to do before we can even begin to really assess what the true access problem is, is have a measurement of what is an acceptable wait time. And I, I just don't know why it went from 10 to 14 days in this year's answers back. Um, but I think that it's something that we all have to put a lot of thought into and come up with something that truly is a good benchmark if we're going to uh, have something that we're measuring against. What I would say, Chair Mullen, is whatever measure we use, we have a problem. Yep. Whatever the number is, I, I mean, we know that. And so I, I personally am less concerned whether it's third, next, next. I basically want people to get in when they need to get in. I want providers when they call us to be able to get a hold of a specialist and get people up here. I want pe our patients to get in beds and be able to get scans when they need them. Whatever measure you want to use is fine with us, but that's what we're about. That's what I'm about. Yeah, and the measure certainly didn't change to Steve's point to make us look better. Um, you look at that number and you compare it to the benchmarks, which is why we change because we can compare ourselves to other, uh, to other practices. Um, we certainly didn't do it to make ourselves look better. The, the numbers don't look good. Um, there's no, there's no, there's no hiding from that. So, Rick, if you're um, convinced that the the 14 day benchmark that you use this year is the right one, maybe you could just put in writing a few um, paragraphs about why it's the right one, and we could change what we're asking for from all the hospitals in Vermont for the reporting, because everybody else is reporting, you know, um, third next available, and I. I agreed with you two years ago that it probably wasn't the best measurement, but I don't have a better measurement. So that's what went out again. And um, it would it would just be helpful in that. Um, Steve, I just want to uh, clear something up for the record. You have never, ever said, I'm not going to hire someone in a specialty because I'm worried about 
um, them bringing in additional revenues to our institution, have you? Never. Thank you, because there seems to be some type of misconception out there where people are are hearing um, people say that the Green Mountain Care Board is preventing additional specialists from being hired um, because they're not uh, approving a higher NPR. And I just want to say that a couple years ago, we rebased your NPR. I think that just speaking for myself, you've made a very compelling argument today about population growth and why it, it you should deserve a higher NPR. So, you know, that's um, not a concern to me, but I just want to make sure that people don't have the false impression that the Green Mountain Care Board is choking access to care because we're not willing to give you a higher NPR when, in fact, we take very seriously access as being just as important as controlling costs. So I just want to say that we're willing partners and uh, you know, we want to see that Vermonters have appropriate care. So if that means a higher NPR, so be it. So um, very, very um, heartened to hear that by the end of the year, the um, inpatient psychi psychiatric uh, CON will be submitted. It was disturbing, Steve, 22 psych borders is what I heard you say this morning. So, um, you know, John, um, I think Vermonters um, should take some solace in the fact that you're heading up that planning. And uh, I know that with your involvement, this will get done. So um, thank you for taking the, the personal uh, involvement there. Um, one more, my, I guess I can limit my, my questions to one more. And um, that is that, um, and I've I don't have any knowledge of any of the if any of this is accurate or not, but um, John and Steve, you were around a few years ago, so you can you can help me here. But um, providers are are believing that their the communications is somewhat um, troubled in the the network and that it's too hierarchical, and they pointed to something I believe they refer to it as etch findings from a few years ago from an outside consultant. Is is that something that that uh, rings uh, any truth in your heads and, and were the uh, findings from that consultant ever put into place? Go me start? Ahead, Steve. No, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, so um, after um, our, our difficult summer of um, 18, where the nurses went on strike, Dr. Brumstead asked for a consultant who'd been here before to come in and do a survey of the culture of UVM Medical Center. And that culture was uh, that that um, survey was done by a company called Etch Consultants, who had been here numerous times before. And um, there were a number of findings from that survey. When I took over as interim president, um, I, uh, I, many of them with John, did 34 presentations across the, um, the Medical Center campus, all times of the day and night. I attended every one of them to outline the problems at the Medical Center at that time. Um, one of the major ones was disconnection between the leadership, distrust of leadership, and uh, disrespect broadly amongst staff. Um, I've spent every single day I've been here working on this with my leadership team. Um, we have regular communications. I walk this hospital every week. I make appointments with anyone asked to meet with me, and I think we've made huge progress. We have more than 8,000 employees here. So it always can't be perfect communication, but I think that we've done tremendous work to make it better. Um, we have, as we've said over and over again today in our presentation, had a lot of challenges in the last year, which have been very tough. I think if we didn't have the culture improvement that we've had since the summer of 18, we wouldn't have survived it as an organization. It wouldn't have been possible to do the things that we've done. The medical center has a lot of grit right now, but people are exhausted, all of us. So. Um, I hate to hear that that gets to our regulator, the Green Mountain Care Board, that people think they don't have good communication because I can tell you that pretty much every email I've gotten for the past two and a half years as president, I've answered. So um, people know my email and uh, we've worked really hard to uh, be here for everybody, all of our employees. So thank you for the question, Kevin and Steve. Thank you for the, uh, uh, the great answer. Um, you know, uh, an organization 
that wasn't trying to meet the needs of uh, our employees, it would have been real easy uh, to not uh, take some really tough actions um, uh, after the summer uh, of 18. We could have just cruised. It would have been devastating. And so uh, we did uh, uh, go out and with great intention to know what the ground truth was, we went out and we asked the question. And Shannon Casey and Etch, um, I can't even count the number of face-to-face -face, uh, interviews she did to come back and she did, uh, and her company did know uh, our organization well. And, um, you know, uh, I didn't make it to every single one of the presentations, the staff presentations that Steve did, uh, but I got to uh, the, uh, the majority and it was tough. It was tough to stand there as a leader of an organization that both Steve and I grew up in and that we cared so much about and to hear how far off track we were culturally, how uh, um, uh, the distance between leadership uh, and our line folks. And we have all taken that to heart. I certainly have. Uh, Steve has. Steve's recruited a great leadership team. Um, and we've taken that tact network wide. Um, uh, one of the uh, greatest uh, times of my week now is with Dr. Deschamps uh, to have a virtual open meeting uh, for our providers and uh, staff from across the network. And we've had great uh, attendance at those and it's not as good as getting in a room, but it's, it certainly beats uh, shooting out a blast email to try and communicate with people. And those uh, along with the DEI listening sessions that I talked about, um, we're really trying to um, really be visible uh, in every way that we can right now. And I think Steve and his management team at the uh, at the medical center uh, really epitomize what it is to, to be uh, visible leaders in an era where uh, it ain't easy. You know, the best you can do is uh, don a mask uh, and walk around and, uh, and talk to people. Thank you. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Fisher for the healthcare advocate questions. Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, UVM. And um, with a little apology to um, to the chair, I'm going to I have a statement that I really want to direct at all three hospitals. Um, I, though I know we're asking questions only of UVM. It, as you long know, as I, you don't direct it uh, three times, you're okay. That's my goal. <laughs> um, uh, I would echo the thank you and appreciation from every board member um, to uh, to you and to the you know to the leadership team that we have before us uh, but i want to just take it a step further and ask you to convey to the people who are making the rounds you know the nurses that are making the rounds the people who are cleaning the rooms the people who were doing the the the, the care uh, a direct appreciation from the healthcare advocates office and i'm sure from the board as well i think it, i'm going a little bit to the uh, morale point um, sometimes appreciation from outside is important. Um, so this is an, uh, uh, an exceptionally uh, tough year for providers, for sure, um, uh, and a um, uh, tough time. And uh, to just need to make the obvious point that there's uh, a corresponding need to say this is a particularly tough time for Vermonters as well. You know, behind the story of the increased utilization that you tell is uh, a story of increased need. Um, um, so I want to thank you for uh, your efforts to be responsive to the Healthcare Advocates Office, uh, both in, in real time meetings uh, to address the, you know, our, our question about uh, um, uh, Medicare benchmarking charges against Medicare are question one and look forward to follow up on that and also appreciate uh, that you took the time to uh, write down answers um, 
to our written questions. Uh, that helps us have a little bit more of a, of a more in-depth conversation today. So that's uh, appreciated. Um, I'm just going to ask, I think I only have one area um, to ask a question about, and that is the, uh, the bad debt and free care trend over this time period. Um, and, and with full recognition that looking at 1920 actuals and 21 projected, uh, the utility of that is only uh, is only to understand uh, how this trend, how how we manage these issues during a crisis. Um, unfortunately, we seem to continue to be in crisis. So, um, so um, my follow up question. So we asked the question in writing, and uh, and I appreciate the answer. Um, but let me just review it for a second and ask you to. Uh, flesh it out a bit for me. For UVM, um, between 19 and 20, we see um, a slight uptick in um, in free care and a slight downtick in bad debt. Um, but between 19 actual and 20 projected, we see a, a, a sort of significant down in both. Um, you know, when, it, when we, we normalized it for um, gross patient care revenue, we see free care went from 63% of gross patient care revenue in, in 19 to, uh, I'm sorry, 0.63% to 0.47%, and, and bad debt went from 1.13% to 0.98%. Uh, so that's a, a fairly significant reduction that is a, a reduction in uh, in uncompensated care, and um, and I th I think the answer, and I'll just say that I appreciate your answer that you uh, recognizing the increased subsidies, the the, the changes in Medicare, I'm sorry, Medicaid policy, um, as opening up the door for people to be able uh, to to get um, those monies to be able to flow to you. Um, I just wonder if you could could say a little bit more about what you think is going on in the ground. Yeah, hey Mike, uh, Rick here. So yeah, that definitely is um, a piece of what is uh, driving that that uh, 21 projection to be lower than what it has been historically for both bad debt and charity. The other two components are um, there's no doubt there was a there was a lower amount of um, volume in the highly elective costly types of services during the during the pandemic uh, that you know that care was delayed and that you know that that gets reflected in what we see in um, in 2021 the other pieces that we did um, essentially put a hold on all of our self pay collection activities so both internally um, so you know, our internal teams in terms of sending out statements, making calls, uh, we put a we put a halt to all of that. Same thing with our collection agencies. We didn't um, we didn't uh, turn claims over to collections. They didn't do their normal collection activities because we 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 stopped that or we suspended that uh, for a period of time during the pandemic. So that's that's really the the impact that you're seeing in the rates for 2021. Um, but in checking with our teams, um, that 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 isn't uh, reflective of, of patients not being able to access our our um, our uh, financial assistance programs and when they needed to. If anything, we we tried to be even more out there and make sure that they were uh, aware of those uh, of those programs. But from a from a rate perspective, that's really what. Uh, drove that down and we expect and we have you know seen uh, towards the tail end of you know this year um, um, that 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 has started to pick up and certainly in our 22 budget we're anticipating those rates to be back um, you know where they've historically been and we'll we'll continue to do um, all we can to make sure that patients are aware of um, the help that we can uh, that we can provide them with their uh, with their bills. Yeah, thank you. I I, I forgot to uh, give another thank you. Uh, um, I I want to recognize that you uh, updated 
your free care policy uh, during a particularly difficult time that you engaged um, to um, to make some real improvements in it. Um, I guess my question, uh, I really want to go to the sort of the interaction with Medicaid here, uh, given sort of the, the the continued conversation that that we hear that we've heard today about um, underpayment from Medicaid. Um, I think part of the story about tell me if I'm wrong, I think part of the story of what of why your uncompensated care has gone down is because it's easier at this moment during the public health emergency to get met to get people on Medicaid and to keep people on Medicaid. That's correct. Yeah. And and, you know, when I look at the real dollars between 19 actual and 21 projected, I think it's about you've seen your uncompensated care go down about four million dollars. Mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, sort of it, this is neither here nor there for your budget, but just to say out loud, uh, Medicaid ran my understanding is Medicaid ran hot about $21 million in last fiscal year, and it's running hot seven weeks into this fiscal year by about $8 million. So, you know, to this conversation about, um, you know, being able to uh, um, increase, um, go to legislators and ask them to increase rates, um, uh, legislators have a challenge on their hands dealing with uh, Medicaid utilization. Um, I think that's I, I think that's really the point I wanted to make, and um, and I think we have another question from a member of my team, uh, Sam Pish. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just want to start by thanking UVM for your attention and commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion-focused efforts. Uh, we really appreciate that you took time during today's hearing to discuss this work further while also providing written responses to our questions. I also want to commend you for recognizing that becoming an anti-racist institution takes time, resources, and commitment from all aspects and levels of an organization, and that there still remains work to be done. I think it takes um, courage to say that. Um, I would like to briefly highlight the, the distinction, too, between stated commitments to anti-racism and allocating real resources and empowering, and empowering staff and leadership to work on DEI-focused efforts. So we're happy to see that UVM hired several staff to support this work, allocated annual funding in this area, and plan to hire a chief DEI officer. Um, so in line, uh, just following up on something that was mentioned hours ago, um, I wanted to first ask if UVM would be willing to share their DEI action plans with the board and the HCA, as I think this could be an opportunity for all of us in the hospital network in Vermont to learn from and support efforts in this important area of work. Um, so that was my first yeah, thought. Or how uh, simple answer is uh, yes at the network level and Steve. Absolutely, Sam, we're right in the midst right now of building a three-year DEI strategic plan, um, but our VP of HR and our soon-to-be VP of DEI would be happy to follow up with you. So um, I'm not sure I have your email, but I'll figure out a way for them to connect with you sure. for sure. Thanks uh, a lot. And just as far as resource allocation, um, I think what we included in our specific answers uh, is um, um, uh, small uh, relative to uh, the importance and the investments uh, needed, but that's what you know we have uh, in the budget, um, uh, and it's not. Uh, all inclusive. Um, there's a lot of time and effort uh, of uh, executives uh, a at all levels uh, and managers that are going uh, into these efforts. Um, uh, and uh, across the board, uh, when I'm involved in recruiting um, uh, leaders, whether they're clinical leaders or um, uh, administrative leaders, um, uh, I think it's um, uh, not the appropriate approach to sort of put out a dowry uh, in a war chest uh, and dangle that in front of people and have them come in. Um, what uh, the approach that I take, uh, and we have a long track record of doing this, so I think those we're recruiting uh, can trust it, and that's to you come in, you understand our organization, 
regardless of what it is, a new head of the uh, cancer center or uh, a new uh, chief of cardiothoracic surgery or uh, a chief nursing officer or a chief diversity and inclusion officer. You understand our organization. We've recruited you because we believe in you. We think that you can really uh, help our organization. Learn about us. You come with a vision. And what I do, what we do is we invest in that, uh, that vision. If we um, believe that you're the person we want to recruit, we believe totally that you will bring a vision and we will invest in it and we will do everything we can uh, to help us together reach that vision. So just to your point, Sam, uh, you know, uh, we did answer your questions, but I want to make it very clear that um, uh, we will make the investments in time, energy, people, focus uh, to move the dial and to move us uh, along this journey. Thanks so much. Um, appreciate the response. Um, and the second question builds off of that. Just and it might be too early to answer this question, so please say so if if that's true. Um, just curious how these DEI uh, focused efforts have played out on the ground for patients in particular. Whether this is at a patient check in counter, at a financial counselor's desk, back office. Um, just so you could shed a little bit more light on what this DEI work has has played out on the ground. Yeah, I'd love to hear from our presidents uh, on that. And Steve, you obviously can start. And uh, and Anna and Tom, if you have some comments on that. Uh, Sam, I, you know, I mean, a lot of our work has been focused on our staff to make, you know, and we have, you know, between eight and 9,000 staff here to really make sure that our staff feel connected, they feel valued, and they feel heard. Um, but some tangible things we did, you know, we made the important decision to fly the Black Lives Matter flag. We flew the pride flag. And um, I heard from a number of um, patients that that was hugely important to them, that they felt like um, they were being seen, they were being recognized for who they were, and uh, that having those flags up really made us feel like a more inclusive organization. Once again, you've already said it, we have a lot more work to do. But I do think people appreciate we're on the journey and we are doing everything in our power to be inclusive for everyone who works here and everyone that we serve. And I think um, just that makes a difference. And uh, I'm proud I'm going to be marching in the Pride Parade on September 5th with probably 100 people from the medical center. And when I did that last year, I heard from a lot of our patients. That meant a lot to them that, that um, someone who was at the medical center leading it was there um, and was supportive of them for who they were. So I'll just uh, add to Steve's comments, Sam. Uh, for us, um, some of our work has taken the form of a DEI commitment statement, which is sort of a foundational statement that we've socialized with all of our team members, but also with our patients and our residents at Woodridge. Um, and that's just to set the playing field on what we expect from behavior um, for all of us and how we treat one another. So that's a, just a foundational shift. Um, we embrace the Juneteenth celebration, so we acknowledge that here um, and um, asked our um, colleagues of color to participate in that and inform that and educate some of us um, who are less familiar with the significance of Juneteenth. And our staff um, staffed the Juneteenth celebration in Montpelier um, on June 18th. Um, and again, those are just ways that um, as a, one of the largest employers in our community, we can set the stage um, and set the expectations. And I think it's a very powerful way to begin to shift um, the tide around systemic racism. Those are just a few examples. Mr. Chair, I wonder whether we've gotten ourselves out of order, whether whether we should be looking for answers from CBMC and Porter when we're asking those hospitals questions. You're muted. I think we're we're two thirds of the way there, so we might as well finish and um, just don't repeat the question when we go to those hospitals. <laughs> Okay, so I'll be I'll be the final third on the answer to that question, and thank you for it, Sam. You know, I I would echo exactly what Anna and Steve said relative to the expressions of gratitude, both from employees and and from the community and vocally in in both, um, almost like this, um, almost like a sigh of relief from people that um, our leadership position on this, our sincerity of our leadership position on this was recognized. 
Um, I'd also say that um, when we've done work with policy work and gone out to our departments to share results of our DEI survey, um, in some areas, it, it, they were some there were uncomfortable conversations that need to be that were held, but they were held, you know, and there were, and there was dialogue that occurred. Otherwise, it was this. Uh, and there were these unspoken things that were just lying in the background. I think it's it's obviously just a start, but under Dr. Brumstead's leadership, it's been very evident to everyone in the organization that this is we're in this for the long haul. Do you have other questions, Mike or Sam? I just have one more, Chair Mullen, if there's time. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, last question is, uh, how is UVM Health Network investing in both multilingual personnel and in high quality translation services? Specifically, what translation services are available to folks seeking patient financial assistance and or emergency Medicaid? Thanks. So somebody on the team that can take that? I can speak more to patient care, Sam. Um, so for patient care, we both hire a, a broad range of interpreters. And we also have an um, uh, um, iPad app that has more than 60 languages on it 24-7. And I can tell you as an ER provider, that is an amazing, amazing change in the ability to provide care. You can roll it in the room with you. You connect with an interpreter, tell them the language that you need, have an interaction back and forth with the patient. You can give good discharge instructions. Um, we give act I've actually had the interpreter on the screen Hold up, I hold up the patient's phone and record the instructions for the patient on their phone in their language. Um, we do need to do more for discharge languages in terms of the written form, but we are building out on that right now. I'm not sure if that happens in financial services or not, but we could find out for you. I'm not sure how we do that. Yeah, that'd be great. We can touch base offline too, but those are all my questions. Thanks so much. Back to you, Chair Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So next we're gonna open it up to um, public comment on UVM Medical Center Burlington. Is there any member of the public who wishes to offer comment on the budget hearing that uh, has just ensued? I'm not hearing anyone and I'm not seeing any hands raised. So we'll um, shift gears and move to Central Vermont Medical Center. And um, Jessica, you will be asking the first round of questions. So whenever you're ready. Sure, thank you. Um, I actually really just have one question that I'm hoping um, we can shed some light on. So when I look at the uh, NPR growth uh, for CVMC, um, if we looked at 2019 actual, of 208 million and if we grew it at three and a half percent for 2021 22 we would arrive at about 231 million in npr and cvmc is budgeting 251 million for 22 so about 20 million more than we would have expected if npr grew at three and a half percent per year since 2019. so you know I, I recognize that that's actually true at uvm as well but there's a lot of population growth and a lot of other factors going on up there pent-up demand and and other hospitals sending their patients to UVM that would explain some of that. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about it with respect to CVMC. It's not in one of the counties that we're seeing major population growth. Um, I, I did see the chart that, um, Al, that you shared, the 12-month actual volume trend to, to budget monthly average. That's helpful, I think, in understanding some of where this growth might be coming from, uh, you know, where you're projecting it. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more in detail that was driving that growth more than what would a three and a half percent annualized growth would have been. And also whether you factored in productivity losses that may occur with Epic implementation at CVMC. We've seen with Epic Im implementation elsewhere, EMR implementation elsewhere, productivity's decline. So if you could talk a little bit about that, and obviously my worry is that if your expenses are budgeted to grow in line with those projections, and when you don't meet those NPR estimates, then it might be another year of operating losses. So that's my concern if somebody might be able to help me with that. Yeah, I can I can maybe just um, answer a piece of that, uh, Jessica. So while there isn't the same level of population growth um, in Washington County that there is in Chittenden and the surrounding counties, there certainly is population growth. Um, 
and um, so that certainly is a piece of why the you know the the NPR is growing more than the than the three and a half uh, percent. Um, so I'll just I'll just put that out there. I don't know if Anna and um, um, and if there's any other thoughts, but there's definitely a growth um, in the population here as well. Yeah, um, Jessica, I'll add to what Rick's um, just mentioned around the population growth. There is a slight increase in, in Washington County, and we obviously have an aged demographic. So um, multiple comorbidities, what we're seeing is an increase in that. Um, we certainly are seeing, particularly in the last couple of months, um, uh, an incredible increase in acute care volume, as well as what we've already talked around on psychiatric border volume, but we also have med surge borders as well. And for us, it's really not med surge, it's really medicine. Um, so complex um, patients, aged demographic, um, and then to answer your last question around, um, uh, did we build in um, some uh, reduced productivity uh, with Epic Go Live? Yes, we did, because we know we're gonna see a voltage drop. Um, this is um, all in on the acute care side, unlike managing um, a Go Live in a practice setting where we can reduce our volumes um, in, of patients we see in the practices, which we did in um, October of 2019. We can't do that on the acute care side. We have to be ready to care for any patient that comes through. And at this point, be, because um, you know our our volumes are increased, we we will do our best to manage to that higher census. But yes, we did build for slight reduction in productivity, and we also know we'll see a slight voltage drop as we we're bringing our revenue cycle online on the hospital side as well. So there'll be some delays in in those work processes as well. Jessica, if I, if, if I could just say one point. So this is just from recollection. I'm not looking at the spreadsheet that I would normally look at to talk about this. So I'm happy to connect with you and Patrick offline. But pharmaceutical expense was driving a large part of CVMC's budget over that three year period. Not so much this year, but over the three year period. And so that's been a factor there that we could talk about the drivers of um, and, and what is unique to CVMC versus the other hospitals that we that we have. Okay, that'd be great. Thank yeah. you for that. And that's it for me, Kevin. That was my question. Thank you, Jess. Next, we're gonna go to Robin. Thanks. Um, first of all, I wanted to say, Anna, that uh, being in the community, I've heard lots of anecdotal uh, praise for CVMC's COVID response and standing up the vaccination and testing abilities in the uh, in our area. And also um, from at least some of your staff, I've heard a lot of positive feedback in terms of how the staffing was handled and how uh, folks who otherwise perhaps weren't able to see patients at certain periods could repurpose into other roles. Um, and it sounded like that was very well done. So I just wanted to share those anecdotes with you um, uh, before I jumped into questions. Um, my question, since we're on the topic of pharmacy, I did have some questions around 340B and how um, the, that is budgeted in your 22 budget. We have heard from a number of other hospitals about the issues around 340B with drug manufacturers, the recent uh, or relatively recent letter that came out from the feds um, that people are hopeful might reverse some of that. But could you speak to that and how that's reflected in the budget? So we we have um, have a slight increase in uh, 340B revenue uh, for CVMC. We focus particularly um, in those programs in two areas. One is specialty pharmacy, which is a new product line for us. That was something we had hoped to launch um, earlier, but um, it, it because of the pandemic response and the cyber attack, it was put off. So we've just launched specialty pharmacy here. And obviously that's being done in collaboration with the UVM Health Network um, in that pharmacy is a shared service. So that's a new product line for us. 
The other one for us is our health assistance program, which um, we also are uh, borrowing heavily from the work already done at UVMMC. Um, we had, um, that that's not a service that we had provided in exactly the same way. And I think what it'll do for us is, is really um, give us the opportunity to uh, provide um, those medications at a lower cost for patients. So those are two areas of the pharmacy um, uh, service line that uh, we've addressed this year. Thank you. Uh, and again, my apologies while I wrestle my binder uh, to find my other questions. <laughs> sure. um, and Robin, while I have you, thanks for the positive feedback. Yeah, no problem. Um, I did. I, I very much. The other thing I wanted to mention on, in terms of your staffing, Anna, is that I've always been impressed with your um, career pathways programs, and it sounds like those are going well, and that you've been able to expand those. Um, and I was interested to hear about the EB3 visa program as well. Um, are you thinking that once you've sort of implemented those, that um, that that's kind of where you're going to land in terms of your your uh, what I would call innovative workforce issues, or do you have other ideas in the pipeline? Yeah, we're we're going to keep those innovations coming to the degree possible. If you had said to me when in 2017 when I started that I'd be launching an LPN program at CVMC. I probably would have said no, but all the statistics out there uh, with the labor market, particularly the nursing labor market in the state of Vermont, as well as nationally, really pushed us in that direction. And uh, the other thing that it's done for us is it's it's really given people that had never considered a professional side of healthcare um, as an option for them from an occupation perspective, uh, it's given them a whole new opportunity. Um, so it, it, it's, I think it's work we will absolutely continue to do. We've learned a lot through the first cohort, um, who I mentioned, uh, we've graduated 13 LPNs. Um, that's a game changer for those individuals. 60% of that class, um, they are the first ones in their family to complete a post-secondary degree. So it, it is a huge game changer for not only them, but their family and our community. Um, and so we're going to keep those programs going. The RN program we just launched, we just actually started this week. Uh, and again, that's in collaboration with VTC, taking uh, those LPNs that qualified and moving them into the RN program. So we're going to keep those pipeline, uh, talent pipeline programs going. We're working on the MA program because our practices still need um, that level of support. And that's another way to bring um, help support our access is to make sure that um, we have other um, individuals in our practices that are supporting the care flow so our providers can really focus on the clinical care. To do that, we really need to bring that talent into the organization. And we have to grow it. That That's very clear. And the other lesson, primary lesson learned in all of these programs is people need support more than just um, the time. So we're paying them to go to school, but we're also helping them in time management skills. Um, we pay for them to have a 12 hour shift where they can study and also manage some work life balance issues. And we brought in other supports with our community partners um, as exa an example, the Thrive Group, um, United Way in particular, has provided scaffolding around financial management, those sorts of things. So it's really a way to bring a number of resources around those um, employees and, and really elevate their ability to function in a different role. So we're going to keep those programs going. We're um, encouraged by the work so far with our EB3 um, explorations. We've looked at four companies. There's one that we're likely going to go with. Um, and that there are a few other organizations in the state that have utilized them. And again, that's just, we know we have a limited N of people in the state of Vermont for sure. So bringing people from other countries um, is, is a way we can, I think, enrich not only our workforce, but also give people an opportunity um, to live in the U.S. and, and long-term potentially um, as they gain their visas. So um, I, I think it's, it's likely a game changer. And I would also, Say that the likelihood of us getting out of a traveler business, it's not going to happen. You know, the it, travelers now will be part of 
our cost. And I think we need to acknowledge that and recognize that and budget for it. And can, while we continue these other pipelines um, from uh, evolving. So we're trying to do it in a sort of multifactorial way, but it absolutely, the, the growing the locally um, uh, talent pipeline programs are core for us. Thank you. Um, and then I was I was wondering about um, uh, the OR used by UVM docs and whether that's something you think will continue into the future, or is that really more time limited in response to some of the the access challenges? I think it's something that's going to continue in the future. Um, there are again, if we're being patient and family centered, um, offering the care local to where people live um, is one of our goals and that's a goal for the network as a whole. So having some of those providers come down and offer care that we can provide in our surgical services area here at Center Vermont versus driving to UVMMC, I think is a win. Um, the surgeons that have come down have had a very positive experience working here. Um, you know, it's it's easy to park here and it's easy to walk in and we have high <laughs> service quality. So those are all positives. Um, so I don't see that going away. In fact, as we're recruiting new surgeons, we're working with our colleagues at UVMMC to see which surgeons would prefer to work here um, for some of their um, for their patient volumes. So I think it's something we're going to continue to, to uh, utilize. And the other piece is we have the space. Um, so we do have ORs. Um, and as an old surgical nurse, uh, you never want to see your, your ORs um, uh, closed up. You want to have patients in them because that's all cost that's in the system that's not being utilized. So we want to maximize what we've got here. Um, we have a, a great peri periop surgical team and the surgeons have been amazing coming down. So, And what we're hearing from our patients that are experiencing that care, they love it. So I think it's a win on a number of levels. Great, and, and can you just connect that maybe a little bit back to some of your volumes and your NPR? It, is that something that you think is a contributor to um, your request yes. for 22? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think it, it'll also, um, it, it certainly will help us on that regard without the service lines that we would like to continue to optimize here and it should help with our margin overall okay that's what i had thank you thank you robin next we'll go to board member tom pelham tom um hello anna how are you i'm well how are you? Tom? good i i want to follow robin and say as a central vermont resident uh you know the the pr process of getting a test and the process of being vaccinated worked incredibly smoothly and one little funny story is that um, I uh, told my daughter asked me if I got vaccinated, and I said yes, I did. I and and in the old J.C. Penney facility, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, she said, well, which side was it on? Was it on the right side or the left side as you come in? And I said, well, it was on the right side. I said, Dad, that's where I brought my sixth grade prom dress, you know. So it's just uh, kind of funny to see uh, life move along and and uh, how things change. And um, I don't. I, I just have two or three quick questions here. Um, one of them had to do with the provider tax. I I noticed that you in your 22 budget have that in at 6.4 percent, and the rate I think is 6 percent. So you're in a 6.4 percent against uh, um, not 2020. Uh, one budget, but 2021 projected. And I'm just wondering if there's anything sacred about that 0.4% above 6%. Um, I, I would have to get back to you on that, Tom, unless Rick or Mark could answer that question. Or Kim. Anna, yeah. yeah, no, um, I know one component of it, but we can validate that is, is that includes the skilled nursing facility for CVMC and there's a different calculation for the provider tax on that piece of it. Okay. Because it's a it's a million dollar difference. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that one component of it, Tom. I'm not sure if it speaks to the whole thing, but that is yeah. one component of it. Okay. And we can follow okay. up on that. Okay. Um and then under other operating expenses, there's a um 22 budget over 21 projection. There's a 23.9 percent increase from 33.5 million to 41.5. And I'm just wondering what the moving parts are there. You're the big ones. Rick, 
Rick, are you pulling that up? Looking. <laughs> so I think the, the, the biggest piece, I'm not on that page yet, Tom, but I think the biggest piece is the, the EPIC implementation um, uh, that comes with uh, additional costs. I'm trying to find what else is in that uh, um, in that number, but I think that's the biggest component of that uh, of that increase. Okay, thank you. And finally, um, I'm just just some alignment here. I'm looking at uh, the value of um, value um, based amounts on the income statement, and they're they're in at. Uh, 47 point for 2022 budget mm -hmm. they're in at 47.4 million um, and in appendix six the value if you calculate it out is at 45.4 million with 5 million held in reserve so I guess I'm you know I'm 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 just trying to tie the 5 million to what um, it's not it's not you know, and and um, which 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 number is the uh, is it is the income statement number forty seven point four million in FFPs and reserves the right number or is it the one um, on on appendix six at forty five point four and um, what then is the amount of risk being covered for five million bucks? I think that one we'll have to get back to you as well, Tom. I apologize. And that which appendix was that that you were looking at? Pardon me. Which appendix was that that you were? You were appendix referring? six, the value-based uh, appendix. So, Tom, he's, he said he's going to get back to you with that okay. answer. So, okay, you, that that would be fine. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Next, we're going to turn to board member Maureen Yusufer. Maureen. Hi, thanks. I only have a couple of questions. Um, just touching on the uh, NPR and, and looking at it from your projection. So your projection of 227 million for the for 2021 growing to 251 million is about an 11 percent increase. And if we back out the six million request for rate, um, that 18 million left is an eight percent increase. So kind of tagging along to where you know Jess was going on the growth, but you know, can you bridge that increase um, year over year from the projection to the um, to what your current forecast is to your 22 budget? Sorry. Yeah, so I think some of that uh, mooring will be the same um, as what we, we're seeing across all our hospitals. So the 21 projection does include some lower volumes at the beginning of the year. Um, that um, in the fall, when we had the, the the COVID surge and even the cyber attack had an impact on CDMC as well, not to the extent that it did um, at the medical center. Um, that the volumes in that period of time, which was in the Projection is a lower number than it than it, than it typically uh, would be, um, which is why that's a pretty big increase from the, the projected to the. Okay, it's just the same concern as if you don't hit the number and your expenses are at that level, um, it would be a hit to the bottom line. So that's kind of where Jess was going to. So. And that's why when I think Al might have covered it in his, um, in his uh, section is that we do try to be um, conservative in our volume estimates because of that very reason. Because once you once you build your budgets and our budgets, our expense budgets are, you know, they're in line with what we're um, projecting for revenue. Once that number gets in somebody's head in terms of, you know, I can hire this staff person or I can go up to this number, it's hard to kind of pull back from that. So we are in general fairly conservative in our in our volume estimates, um, again, because our expense uh, numbers essentially fluctuate up and down with what we uh, would project it. So um, if anything, you know, we're probably as, a, as an organization, we're more on the conservative side. We 
we budget what we see in front of us today um, and we look ahead, but we don't certainly don't go out on a limb um, in terms of projecting volumes and revenues. And, and Maureen, if I could just jump in and it really my comment would be the same on all three budgets. The reason I showed the green, yellow and red volume charts is because that's what we are using to try to figure out if our estimates are right. Because um, we've been very clear with our team and with our board that we have to match expenses to volume. And so if those volumes in any of our affiliate hospitals are overstated, then we will have to take action to reduce expenses in a meaningful way. And so we're trying to use them to see if on September 30th, you know, there's nothing magic about the next day, but it happens to be the next fiscal year. Like, are they gonna run into that and work right? So if you looked at UVMMC right now, you'd say, wow, they're running hot. They may be over your, your budget forecast, but that's just through June. We now have July. So as we get closer, we'll know better if, where we think we are if they're over. With CVMC, they're slightly under in the aggregate. Are they gonna keep going up? And are they gonna hook up? Or are we gonna have to take actions with expenses? And so this, these are, this is literally the management tool that we use to do exactly what you're trying to get at, because I completely agree with you. If, if, we, if we miss low, we've got to adjust expenses. If we miss high, we, we're gonna have a lot of expenses to go with that volume. And the question is, what is the volume? Who is the payer? And is there any margin? And are you um, just frequently updating your forecasts with that, like on a rolling basis or for the year to adjust for those? Yeah, yes. And so, so what we've been doing is having monthly meetings with each affiliate to review these volume projections, expense, what is realized of expenses in the prior month and what we project for the next fiscal year. And so that's how we're trying to get everyone on firm financial footing across the network. Okay. The other place that this comes in in a very concrete way, uh, Maureen, is the position management groups that we have at each affiliate and the network. That, that is the, That's a key variable that we're looking at when we're approving those positions is, are we at our budgeted number and somebody's coming before us and in looking to, re to replace a position, if we're not at those volume numbers, even though it was a budgeted position, we're not going to be filling that. So the volume um, and the expenses, again, throughout the year, we're constantly you know, measuring and keeping those in sync to try to achieve our, our budgeted uh, margin. And, and as late as April, we were still in the red <laughs> and because we're looking back to really, really February. So, you know, we were we were thinking, was this ever going to come back? And then, wow, did it come back? Then we wrote aftershock in the narrative. Bad choice of word because an aftershock, while severe, is, is short lived. This has been continuing. So now we're not sure if it will if it will slow down at all as we enter the new fiscal year. OK. Um, and then just one last question on the um, ACO. Uh, risk reserve that you have. Um, do you know what your maximum risk level is? Um, it looks like you're going to be carrying a $5 million reserve in 22 against a $45 million FPP. So that should be larger than what you would have in any given year for for um, requirements based on you know the, the, the corridor. So I'm just, just trying to reconcile um, that $5 million number. Yeah, so I'm just pulling up uh, our narrative where we included that uh, that number. So the maximum downside risk for all of the, all three of the, the or actually, actually all four of the ACO programs is eight and a half million for uh, CBMC. So eight and a half million, and you're carrying five million um, for 2022. Um, I mean, that I, I guess you know, what is your process to go through to determine what you put on the books for a risk reserve? Because we, we've seen many hospitals take different 
approaches to this. Yeah, I mean, we look at historical performance in making that determination, and um, you know, each hospital has a little bit different um, performance over the years in those ACO programs. Um, that's really the only solid piece of data that we can go on is is seeing how we've done in the past, and you know, make a projection for where where we think we will uh, will land uh, in next year's budget. And then on top of this number, you potentially will be getting money back. Is that right for the 2020 settlements or? Uh, we will, but that's going to be that's already been accrued for in 21. Um, so it's it's reflected in the, the FY 21 financial statements. And so it won't um, we recruit it so that when it does come in, it's not going to it's not going to impact the uh, the profit loss statement in uh, FY22. I'm sorry, it's not going to impact the what? Uh, the profit and loss statement in FY22. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Um, it seems strange being at a UVM uh, budget hearing and not uh, having Todd Keating here to uh, say or do something that puts a smile on everybody's face. And I think back a couple years ago where Todd was um, intimating that he had some strong ideas on what could change the financial picture at CVMC. And if you look back the last quarter of a century, um, most people looking from the outside have said, you know, CVMC should be doing better on its financial sustainability. And Anna, you've now been there for a few years. Um, are you confident that you know, anything that Todd may have figured out or things that you have implemented in your time there or are about to implement? Do you, do you think that past history is behind you? Well, that's the goal. Um, we're working hard to achieve, you know, the margin that we're targeted for. I think the challenges are, um, you know, this is, these are, it's a razor thin operation here. Um, we, with the, If you look at our payer mix and you look at the type of patients we have, we don't have a large surgical base. Our, our base systems we've put in place. Here um, and the support of the network that will turn that around. Uh, it's it's not a single thing. It's multiple things that we've had to shift over time in my tenure alone. And some of it is just operational improvements, um, trying to find the efficiencies in the systems, making sure that um, the staff, um, the, the amount of staff we have uh, is matches our volumes. That's a struggle. I think the struggle that's ahead of all of us um, in the network is without doubt, we've said it repeatedly, is workforce. Um, we're paying three to four times the amount for staff and it doesn't matter if they're LNAs or RNs or techs and that's nothing that we had anticipated. So again, we're going to rely on these other um, talent pipeline development programs to help us out and being really creative in that space. But, um, you know, it is it is a challenge. There's no question. Well, everyone's Kevin, rooting Kevin, for the town Barry girl. Thank Kevin, you. Kevin, ahead, if, I could, if I could just give you um, three things that I, I'd want to leave you with to your question, to your very good question. Um, first is CVMC has an old age of physical plant, but but has not borrowed a lot of money. And so, you know, that's that's a strategic mistake over a really long time that we're gonna have to deal with. And we'll do that some of that through the pick, but we have other work that we'll need to do and we'll need your partnership on that. The second point I'd make is that I joke that we're a pharmaceutical company that enjoys running hospitals, but it's not really that funny in that we really rely on our pharmaceutical revenue to make up for payers that don't pay cost and, and for volumes that don't always uh, produce the payer mix we need to cover cost. CVMC has not grown their pharmacy program, and that's why I want to meet with Patrick and member Holmes to talk about the history of where they've been, why it's grown rapidly recently, and where they need to get to um, to be at a better place in terms of specialty pharmacy and contract pharmacy. The third point I'd make is we really need to work on productivity within CVMC as an affiliate. 
And that doesn't mean that somebody isn't working a full day. It means that because we haven't invested in the physical plant and we don't have clinics um, basically built the way we need to for the modern world, we just don't have the productivity we need. So that you know that you know that's sort of the the you know that's sort of the strategic thinking. But happy to talk about it at any time, Kevin. Great, thanks, Al. And I was I was kind of looking at that seventeen hundred employees for the revenue that's generated there, and and wondering the same thing. So I'm glad you've highlighted that as something you're looking into. Absolutely. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Healthcare Advocates Office, Mike or Sam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, just one question from us uh, for CVMC. Uh, I just uh, uh, I appreciate your written answer on the bad debt and free care um, that you don't uh, uh, aren't aware of any access to care access to free care challenges. Um, I just want to note that the the numbers are just a little bit different for CVMC than than they are for uh, UVM in that you. Um, your free care was really took a, a pretty tremendous dip. Um, those are my words um, from 2019 actual to 2020 actual. You know, 1.08 percent of your gross patient care revenue to 0.66. And uh, and while it ticks up some for your projected 21, um, I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and if you have no uh, uh, insights as to exactly whether something different is happening at you at CVMC. Uh, that's fine. I I, I just want to note it that it it was a, a bit glaring as I looked at your numbers. Yeah, I think for the 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 um, the causes of that at uh, CVMC, uh, Mike, I think are, are uh, actually I know are very similar to what they were at UVM. Um, it's definitely a combination of um, lower um, um, elective surgeries during that period of time, and just like um, UVM, both CVMC and Porter suspended their um, their self pay collection activities um, for a period of time during the peak of the pandemic. Um, and I don't, I'm not aware of any other um, things that might have driven the uh, that drop in the, in the rate. Yeah, it, thanks, Rick. And, and I'm not asking the same, not asking for the same answer again. I, I, I was asking sort of what what might be different. And if you don't have any clarity on that, that that's just fine. I just noted a difference between what happened to CVMC and what happened at, at UVMC. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mike. I'm assuming no questions from Sam. Yeah, that's correct. We okay. That's, that's it from us. So, on the CVMC budget, is there anyone from the public who wishes to offer comment at this time? If so, either um, raise your hand in the Teams function or just begin speaking. Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment? Seeing none, we're going to move to Porter. Um, last but certainly not least, and we'll start that uh, questioning off. Um, I believe we're with Robin, correct? That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation earlier. Um, I had just had a couple of questions. Um, I noticed in the narrative on page 27 that you indicated at Porter that you had started an LNA program in 2021. It sounds like you're sharing lessons learned across the network. And I wondered if you could speak to that in a little more detail. Sure, I would be glad to. And thank you, Robin, for the question. Um, so we partnered with the Hannaford Career Center uh, here in Middlebury on a, to start with a, a pilot program to train LNAs in an almost an identical model as what Anna has at CVMC, where folks would work for us half time and go to school half time, and we would underwrite that cost. Um, and so that the we those folks proceeded through that program. Um, we were successful only in retaining a few of those folks. We've been we've been. Uh, going through some changes in management there and some folks found some opportunities that they thought were going to be more beneficial for their career. We actually did uh, retain some of them in the hospital. 
Um, I think we'll be going back to that program here in the uh, in the fall and doing another cohort. Um, our new chief nursing officer, uh, Tiffany Love, also has connected with Vermont Technical College about similar LNA to LPN to RN training. Uh, we we still tend to keep the Hannaford program for folks who just want to stop at the uh, LNA level. So I think uh, you know we clearly are shifting to the grow your own approach to our workforce uh, here in the future. Great, thank you. Um, could you also speak to 340B assumptions in your budget? Sure, Rick would love to. Or staff. <laughs> Yeah, I think like CBMC, the um, actually all three of our organizations, we've been very conservative in terms of our um, in those uh, programs because of the you know, the activities with the pharmaceutical companies. Obviously, putting a lot of pressure um, uh, to try to limit um, the ability for us to generate revenue in those areas. Um, so we have been conservative. We're hoping that the tide will start to turn there um, and that we'll be able to begin to to grow those programs. Uh, even with the pharmaceutical companies pushing back on this, there still is opportunities to to grow um, uh, even with that that you know that major hurdle that we have uh, in front of us. But um, we've been fairly conservative in what we've built into all three of the. Uh, all three of the budgets. Yeah, it se certainly seems to be a volatile area, and this year's you know drawbacks on that program have been you know very substantial for us. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to to um, go back to one of one of your slides where you're talking about challenges for Porter, including capital needs and funding, and I did notice in comparison to the other critical access hospitals in Vermont, you actually have the third lowest age of plants. So could you speak a little bit more to what you're thinking about in terms of capital or capital needs? Are these routine sort of things, big ticket items? At 15 years average age of plant, that would suggest we're in a, we're in a challenging place in Vermont um, with our facilities, if, if the others are worse. Um, yes, we in 2018, crafted a really well done um, uh, master facilities plan that looked at how the, the whole campus regenerates over time, uh, working with an outside group um, and a, really a, a strong plan in that it, it took us through incremental changes that allowed you to go to different paths depending on what happened within the uh, operating environment. It, our biggest priority out of that plan um, was our emergency department which is um, not built for modern care, lack of completely mixes public and patient spaces, uh, has no safe rooms, um, has no sheltered for emergency vehicles. Um, so it, it, it is our top priority uh, we all, uh, for the hospital at this time. Um, and uh, the other piece in that, and so that was a, that was a multi-million dollar project uh, in that plan. Uh, we are intent right now, and Scott is working with this on our end, is to re-engage that consultant uh, who is doing some work with the medical center also at that time, which makes it convenient um, to refresh that plan, refresh the data, refresh the assumptions, ensure that the, the uh, intent uh, that was concluded in 2018 still holds today, and then set forth the implementation plan. Thanks. Um, and then I had a question about um, the volume, the the volume chart that uh, Al provided for Middlebury, and whether um, it it actually looks like your volumes were fairly steady um, in a lot of areas in Middlebury. And I was just curious if there were any impacts from Middlebury College uh, moving to remote learning, or or how that the college kind of interacts with. Um, your volumes. All right, great question. Um, you know, so the college was highly conservative and highly successful through the entire pandemic. I mean, better than maybe anybody in the country or among the best in the country. Um, and so when they, they essentially vacated the, the, the vacated the place and um, I know Jessica can probably speak there much, much better than I can. 
uh, together between us, Middlebury College, and this and the, uh, the the town of Middlebury, we met weekly on managing through the pandemic. Um, that so I, I think um, relative to the college, we probably didn't see any any uh, uh, impact during the COVID from college uh, from the college presence. I will say that we were fairly stable through the uh, midst of the pandemic on the inpatient side, uh, obviously on the procedural side, on the uh, cases that could be uh, elective or would be considered elective, that was obviously a significant impact. Um, but we uh, stayed fairly stable on the medical and inpatient side and emerged earlier out of that process. Um, and still, even with that, we used a variety of methods to project the volumes that are in this budget because we were still far from stable or predictive. Thank you. Um, and I think that may be all of my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. Next, we're going to go to board member Pelham. Tom? Hi there. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping questions. Um, uh, the first is just to make sure that I understand the math associated with the hospital's operating margin. Um, you're looking at a net operating income of 5.16 million. Um, and then there's 2.1 million associated with the, a loss associated with the Helen Porter facility. So that leaves you with 3.16 million, which is about a um, operating margin of 3.2% aligned with the hospital. Correct. Concur, Correct. Sir. Yes. OK, thank you. And then the other is, is I'm sure it's just a, um, you know, a, uh, <clears throat> not an issue, but um, in a, your on the income st uh, um, statement page, there's that stats, which profiles staffing. Um, and it, there for 20, 22B, you uh, uh, there's 6.3 travelers on that um, for 2022B. But then on your income statement for the line item that says um, services travelers, it's zero. So I'm just, you know, I, I'm assuming, you know, the right hand and the left hand got a little stray here, but um, uh, that uh, um, those, those travelers then must be in the salaries line item. Tom, I can speak to that if you'd like. Please. Hey, that's exactly what it is, Tom. It's it is a nuance between the reporting and a, an adaptive. They're being reported under purchase services, and and all of our travelers are under salary. So if you put the dollars there, but the FTEs are in salaries, there's going to be a mixed match. And we're working with Patrick and his team on what we can do about that. But that's exactly what it is. Yep. Okay. So there is 6.3 worth of travelers in the 22 budget for them. And and the same thing is happening for all three of the health network hospitals, by the way. Um, and that's all for me. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. Next, we're going to go to board member Yusuf or Maureen. Hi, Maureen. Uh, thanks. I just have a couple questions as well. On um, For the ACO reserves, can you tell me what your risk reserve plan is for 22 budget? I mean, I'm one of the backups I'm seeing zero, but I it was 2.5 and 21, I think. So just where will your reserve be for the ACO projection in 22 budget? I'm going to look to one of my experts on that one, Maureen. I'm sure. I mean, if it's zero on that right. schedule, Maureen, uh, then it's, 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 that's, what zero. that's what we might for the reserve in 22. Okay. I think we've always been adequately reserved. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I think I, the I, I just said, I think we've always had a history of being adequately reserved. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, and then Porter for the past, out of the past five years, and including the budget projection, four out of the five years, your um, the highest or the second highest operating margin. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of that's come with the consolidation with UVM, which has certainly improved the financials. But 
you know, just trying to really reconcile um, the 5.1% operating margin, and I'm sure some of it's going to be related to Helen Porter, but, you know, how, how do we reconcile that and, and the high rate requests um, versus having a lower commercial rate and lower margin, which still would put you above um, your targets that you put out there for operating margins and most of the other margins for this hospital, most of the other metrics. I mean. So I can just touch on a couple of those. So the, the rate request um, for quarter that we went through is, um, as we've talked about, is, is purely based on inflation and it's only based on the inflation of Porter Hospital. So it doesn't include Helen Porter. Um, in terms of the targets that we have as a network and how we, um, that chart that we reviewed on um, page 25, that targets that we have there is the combined um, combined entity, um, and so um, uh, the number there, for example, at Porter um, Hospital um, that we've got of that 5.9 is the that's the target just for the hospital. Um, I think uh, on the target on page 23, you have 2.2 to 2.6 for operating margin. And you're at 5.1, you know, 5.2, 4.1, 4.5, 2.6, 5.1 for the past five years. Yeah, that so that target there that we have the two point, uh, the 2.2 to 2.6 is the the target that we have for the combined entity. Yeah, Maureen, I think you know the only thing I'd add to that comment is you know I think it's incumbent upon us. And you've seen it in my comments uh, about Porter. We have organized around and are implementing plans to operate as an integrated model. And I appreciate that we're presenting as a hospital to the to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, I just think about what the cost of care would be like without having uh, the skilled nursing facility, as post, particularly the po particularly the post acute setting, as a disposition site for our hospital, for Porter, and for the net, and for the medical center particularly. Um, I think it's going to be important for us to be able to demonstrate what that savings is as a result of that. Because um, I, I mean, we we make this argument, we need to be able to show that. Um, all I know operationally is that we are organizing and are deploying plans to be able to do that. Okay. Oh. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Maureen. I have no questions at this time, so I'll turn it over to the Healthcare Advocates Office. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just we just have one question, is the, and and uh, yes. I'll ask it in a bit of a different way um, about <clears throat> Porter's bad debt and free care. Um, indeed, Porter has a similar trend about uh, reductions in both categories. But I, I just want to note that um, Porter's free care is particularly small percent of your gross patient care revenue and a, and your bad debt is a particularly large, compared to the hospitals across the hospital system, uh, particularly large percent of gross patient care revenue. And if um, <clears throat> Porter sees that as something that you would like to work on, um, uh, I, I would offer to engage with you in thinking through things that can be done to find a right balance between those two categories of uncompensated care. Thank you, um, sir. I, I think that would be great. I think that there's an opportunity to educate the community on um, what's available. So I think that partnership would be certainly uh, welcomed because I noticed that as well, that I think there's an opportunity to provide the care and also uh, not have it be a, a negative factor for those who need, the, who need that uh, extra assistance. Thank you very much. Mike, um, I, I would like to go back to, if I could, to volunteer something from Sam's original question earlier that I didn't chip in on, mm -hmm. um, just to let you know that we are awaiting feedback on a very substantial grant to support uh, enhancement to our interpreter services. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, we've, we've done a lot here with signage, mm -hmm. multilingual signage and pursuing Press Gamey to see if they would do something on being multilingual in our surveys, but we're awaiting some feedback on a substantial grant request for 
translation services for our non-English speaking patients to build upon the uh, program we already have today. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, at this point in time, I'll turn it over to the public for any public comment on the Porter Medical's um, budget. Is there any member of the public who wishes to offer public comment, either raise your hand through Teams or just begin speaking? Hearing none, many of you probably think that we're through. But as you recall, um, before lunch, I mentioned that um, at the end, uh, if people had some general questions, they could ask them. And I've already um, heard from member Lunch that she has a couple. So we'll start with Robin. And if anybody else has any follow that, um, feel free. Robin. Thank you. Um, so I was struck by the population estimates um, and the comments on slides 40 and 64 around the long-term projections, both in terms of the aging population and Medicare, um, as well as um, on slide 64, you reference uh, predicting the population growth of Medicare uh, to more than double Medicaid by 12% and privately insured population by 16%. And I wanted to contrast that with the approach that you took in your commercial rate ask, which I appreciate highlighting the impacts of the cost shift, but I think it does raise a significant issue um, in terms of the future of healthcare in Vermont. Specifically, I don't believe that we can continue to rely on the commercial population um, to pay for uh, the public payers, even just the incremental inflation expense. And I know that you uh, have a plan to, you know, talk to legislators and AHS about this, but I, I would really, this is really more a comment than a question, although I welcome your thoughts. I just don't see how we can continue. And I, and I hearken back to um, Al Gobey's, one of his favorite slides of the Vermont family at the median income and how, um, how it just the median income families in Vermont can't bear the burden of supporting our entire health care system. So uh, that's really more a comment than a question, but if, if anyone would like to comment, I'd love uh, your thoughts. I, I'd love I'd love to. Um, John, is it all right if I go first? Sure. You want to go? Um, I would just make the comment now, you and I have talked about this, that um, uh, the aging of the population has not been a surprise at all. We've talked about that over and over again. Um, and I'm not going to go past over it, but the negative compounding uh, effect of subinflationary increases really put us behind the eight ball and make what otherwise would be uh, smaller jumps um, uh, required. What really is an eye-opener that I certainly didn't uh, see that, um, you know, the uh, discourse in Vermont has been, oh my God, we're shrinking, we're shrinking, we're shrinking. Um, and all of a sudden, at least in our catchment area, we're not. And so, the aging of the population is more of us aging, which is is really a problem. I'll pitch it to Al because he really has uh, has uh, been working hard on on figuring all this out. Thanks, John. I uh, so the chart you're talking about, the the family of four chart, um, the whole theory behind that was that because it was done in 2014 and started in 2015 through 2025 was something's going to break something's got to happen and in fact it did when the biden administration came in there's been huge changes and i mike fisher it's good to see you and i, I you know I, I none of us would have predicted when i produced that chart that we would split the small group market and from the individual market and that we would all be for it you know i mean things change and people adjust and so um when i think of this chart i think this is as important of a moment Robin, to your good point, because if we're going to rely on government payers, they've got to be able to fund the quality and access that we need as communities. And they haven't always done a good job of that, 
reference skilled nursing facilities today, for example. And so, you know, I put this out there just in the spirit of partnership with the Green Mountain Care Board um, and with the healthcare advocate that we have got to get ready for what's coming um, because uh, it's coming and we just need to know that. So thank you for your comment, Robin. I'm you're sorry, Robin, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, my next general question was um, about the partnership that uh, you've taken with MVP to create a Medicare Advantage plan. And I wonder if you could give us an update on that. And also, um, I have to admit, I don't actually see it being entirely consistent with the goals of the all pair model. So if you could clarify that for me, that would be very helpful. Um, uh, sure. The update is that um, um, what we've put out in our press releases uh, and uh, what you started to see this Monday in some uh, initial um, uh, information sharing, um, CMS uh, is very, very, very prescriptive uh, on what you can share about those plans. It's verboten to talk about uh, benefits or anything uh, uh, related to that until um, uh, open enrollment, which begins October 15th. And of course, we'll uh, be uh, actively uh, uh, in, uh, in the marketplace talking about uh, uh, those aspects of the partnership as soon as we can. It's it, in our view, in my view, um, the all payer model is um, uh, an example of uh, providers moving to uh, a value based business model, which incentivizes and is supported by a population health approach, keep people healthier. And so, um, uh, from our perspective, um, uh, finding a partnership to launch a Medicare Advantage plan where over time uh, the UVM Health Network and other participating providers will be absolutely held accountable for the per beneficiary cost and the quality of those services because that's how Medicare uh, judges the uh, providers in those plans, that's totally in lockstep with the core um, strategy that UVM Health Network has had since before we were called the UVM Health Network, that we would move towards value-based reimbursements and have our delivery of health care um, um, uh, fit into that model and that we as provider organization will be accountable for the quality of care, uh, access to services uh, and the cost of care. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's why uh, we think it's uh, in alignment with any other effort uh, to move, uh, move in that direction and that's why to uh, um, uh, Tom Pelham's uh, excellent question, I said we're all in. If any commercial payer wants to come to us with uh, an opportunity that's in that construct, I would hope it would come through the ACO, but if it comes directly to the UVM Health Network, um, uh, we'll take that. Um, uh, obviously, um, uh, it depends on uh, the details, but you know, if it's actually derived total cost of care target and um, uh, we on the provider side can be held accountable for how the care is uh, delivered, um, that's what we're all about and that's our core strategy. You're muted again, Robin. Sorry, I'm trying to keep my noise at a minimum. Um, I can certainly see how uh, at the high level that makes sense, but certainly folks who then join the MA plan are not allowed, aren't able to be attributed to the ACO. So it, 
potentially is pulling away attribution from the ACO program. So I, I think that's perhaps where I was not seeing a, a total alignment. Well, I, I could be corrected, but I believe they're attributed to the ACO, but in the commercial bucket. But again, I, I might have that uh, that wrong. Um, but again, you know, the goals of the healthcare reform, in my mind, aren't to meet scale targets of CMS or anybody else. The goal of the all-payer model is to move away from fee-for-service and Sorry. to have the provider community take accountability uh, for cost and, and quality. Um, and so, uh, you know, and again, it's it's your perspective, uh, I, I get it, but, you know, uh, I'm too simple, I guess, you know. No, I just, no, that's, you, that's helpful. I appreciate that, I appreciate the discussion. It's it's helpful to see your perspective. Um, and then I just had one clarifying question, which was in the narrative on page 17, there's an indication that you're expecting approximately a 7.5 increase in value-based payment over year-to-date actual experience. Um, could you speak a little bit to that? Is that increased attribution? What do you see as driving that? A piece of that is a little bit of increased attribution, but very little, Robin. Um, we also have assumed that based on historical performance that we will have, uh, and this is different for um, each hospital based on historical performance, but we are, we did budget um, uh, assuming that we would generate some shared savings um, in 22 um, as well. So the combination of those two things are what um, is driving that. Uh, that budget assumption. Great. Thank you. That's all I had. Appreciate it. Is it. Does any other board member have any general questions as follow up? I just have one. Go ahead, Jess. OK, thanks. Um, as some of you may have heard, uh, I've talked about it in a couple of the other budget hearings, uh, but it's about Mathematica doing some analysis of potentially avoidable utilization. They did it for rural hospitals across the country, and then they shared some of their results of, with the board a few weeks ago. So I've been asking some questions about it, and I wanted to actually just recognize that both Porter and CVMC on most, if not all of the measures actually for preventable or potentially avoidable utilization, just looking at Medicare fee for service, both those hospitals were below the state median on most of those measures. Um, they didn't do it for UVM, so we don't know there. So I know there's still more work to be done, but being obviously on the low side of the state deserves some recognition, um, particularly you know, building on Robin's point as we move towards more value-based payments. So I guess I'm wondering, my question simply is, do you think part of your relative success relative in the state has anything to do with your early and full participation in all of the ACO programs, particularly the Medicare program, which really this is looking at Medicare um, experience? It's a great question. Uh, being able to uh, draw cause and effect to that, I think, is really, really tough. As you know, as an economist, uh, your science do, tries to do that all the time. Um, and we need to get more distance um, uh, through the uh, all-payer model to, to figure that out. I would say, um, and this goes back to my experience uh, as a, a provider and the multiple hats I've worn, and Anna Noonan can certainly weigh in on this, and Steve Leffler as a formal, former uh, chief quality officer and CMO, is that our Vermont-wide, but particularly in our organizations, um, our standards of care are as conservative as anywhere in the country. And you see that when you look at our utilization statistics relative to others and steve mentioned you know our use of uh, advanced imaging uh, on a, a population uh, denominator is incredibly low and that's been a real focus throughout my career to make sure that uh, utilization is appropriate and it's been made uh, um, a uh, more approachable because of the early integration of all of the faculty practice uh, with the teaching hospital and the employment uh, of uh, providers and now the UVM medical group. So uh, Jessica, I think that that more is a long-term 
trend, and I'm incredibly interested um, just professionally on what we're going to see when we get 18, 24 months out from the end of the all pair model where we will have the run out and CMS has that time frame for really evaluating the five year demonstration project. And I'm going to be really interested to see if there's any kind of inflection uh, in the utilization and the cost of care uh, as that uh, that plays out. Just as a brief follow up, do you think that using potentially avoidable utilization, asking hospitals to track that um, would be a good measure of understanding population health improvement. And is that is that a good metric to use? And is that something that we should be asking all hospitals to track and measure and report I, on over time? I believe that it is. Um, and um, I think more and more um, there are uh, databases that uh, allow you to do things like find uh, sentinel utilization measures and track those on a population basis. It gets really difficult when you start getting the small uh, ends that we have in the hospital uh, service areas uh, in Vermont, but at a state level, we certainly can track that. Uh, and then we, we have uh, things like the Commonwealth Fund um, uh, and the Dartmouth Atlas. We have the uh, uh, all-payer uh, claims database. Um, so we have some uh, tools and I, I think it's um, uh, all of us to keep our eye on that. But, you know, we're really conservative a state and it, it plays out in all sorts of ways, like being the lowest cost state uh, per beneficiary for Medicare. Um, but I think that is a, a very useful measure. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, uh, we can uh, work with the Green Mountain Care Board for our organizations and continue to uh, to track that. Okay, thanks. That's it. That's all I have, Kevin. Does anyone else have any follow up questions? Ge general in nature. Mike, does the healthcare advocate have any general follow up questions? Yes, I, I have just one. Um, <clears throat> I, as a follow up to Robin's question about the uh, MVP partnership for a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, I, I wonder whether you have any prediction or whether you're able to say whether you have any prediction about how this partnership will impact your budget in the next year, positive or negative? Um, uh, that um, it, I don't believe it's going to impact uh, our budget uh, significantly because it's the first year of what will be out of the starting blocks, uh, a relatively small program. Um, so uh, I don't think it's going to have any impacts. Uh, Rick's nodding his head back and forth, so I think I'm actually on firm footing for a change with my finance guy. Let, let me poke just a bit further because you said for the first year, I, over time, do you expect uh, it to have an impact on your budget? Over time, I would uh, expect that, um, um, like uh, many Medicare Advantage plans uh, and other value-based reimbursements that we would be able to, through good care management and working with the population, uh, come in under the total cost of care targets and that we would, uh, would be uh, financially beneficial to us. That's my only question. Thank you. Thank you so much. With that, I'm going to call the, this hearing um, to an end. Um, thank everyone who participated today. Thank you to the, the court reporters. You guys uh, tag teamed and did a great job, and um, we appreciate that. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? I don't think I can make that motion. Don't so move. <laughs> a second. I was beginning to think the board members wanted to stay around for dinner. <laughs> Um, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you. And Al, I'm, I'm really proud of my members for not taking that softball that you threw about SNFs because I could just see the follow-up question being as the former secretary of AHS, why isn't there better funding? <laughs> <laughs> because I failed, but we can't. <laughs> but we can't. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for your time. It's been a marathon. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.